Section 20 of the 18th Century by Kashimir Strienska, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 14. Choiseul, 1764 to 1770. A heavy task was awaiting the successor to this careless and indolent monarch, who, though not lacking in intelligence, interested himself only in what was foolish and futile. A diplomat, the Baron Le Chambrier, for many years Frederick's chargé d'affaires at the court of Versailles, has left a remarkable description of Louis XV. He shows us the king not daring to trust himself in the affairs of government, persuaded that he knows nothing about them, and that his ministers, if they are to do their duty properly, must not be hampered by his opinions, nor contradicted in any of their resolutions. This was written in 1751, and what was true then was much more so twenty years later, when a woman with complete confidence in herself governed France, and had the satisfaction of seeing foreign courts apply to her for support and protection. It was supposed that if Madame de Pompadour disappeared, the ever-dependent Louis would submit to some nobler yoke. In March 1764 business was suspended, ministers and courtiers were agitated, and nothing was thought of but the illness of the Marquise. Which was to win, the Queen's party or the King's? Would the Dauphin, aided by his mother, gain some influence? Would the King return to his family? On April 15th, Madame de Pompadour died, fully conscious and with admirable courage. General de Fontenay, the King of Poland's ambassador, has given a very graphic account of her last day. This lady never made the slightest movement of anger or impatience during her illness. Two hours before her death, her waiting women wished to change her clothes. She said to them, I know that you are very skillful, but I am so weak that you could not help making me suffer, and it is not worth while for the short time I have to live. The same day she dictated to Colin, her steward, a document four pages long, which is said to be very well composed. Seeing that he was much affected as he wrote, she begged him not to grieve. Many people whose fortune she made naturally mourned her death, but she was above all respected by all the poor of Paris, Versailles, and her own domains, and generally in every place where she has dwelt. The king was greatly distressed. It was believed that he was quite unmoved, while all the time he restrained himself before the world and hid his grief under a mask. He pretended to be callous, said the Duc de Coye. Did Louis say the often quoted words, The Marquise will have very bad weather? when he was watching from his windows the coach that bore the remains of Madame de Pompadour from Versailles to Paris? If the story be true, it does not prove the king's indifference. It shows him still concealing his grief under this frivolous remark, while following with his eyes to the last her who had for nearly twenty years monopolized his existence. The religious party hoped that the Marquise's death would help them to gain ground. But a blow long foreseen was struck at them when the Jesuits were definitely expelled in November 1764. For some time past, the order had been attacked by the Jansenists. Under Louis XIV, they had detractors in Pascal, Saint-Simon, and Noailles. They were accused of ruling the majority of the Catholic countries behind the scenes, the education of the young was almost entirely in their hands, since the numerous colleges they had founded were superior to all others. They had made their way into the courts as confessors to the royal families, and they had had a great influence in important diplomatic negotiations. Their power extended even to America and the Far East, where they made their religious, political, and commercial conquests with as much zeal as ability. They laid themselves open to legal attacks. Père Lavalette, the superior of the Martinique Jesuits, had been a victim of English piracy 
in 1755 before the declaration of war. His ships were captured and the industrial settlement that he directed was ruined. He failed for three million francs. Some merchants of Marseille were among his creditors. The missionary was tried and condemned. He appealed to his colleagues, but they refused to assist him and reproved his proceedings on the grounds that they were forbidden by the statutes of the order. The Parliament of Paris interfered and ordered the general of the Jesuits, Père de Sassy, to pay what was owing to the Marseille creditors, amounting to over a million livres. Not satisfied with this victory, the magistrates who had Jansenist leanings took action against the society itself, and after an examination of its rules, decided that these contained principles which were inconsistent with monarchical laws and even with Christian morality. By a preliminary decree of 1761, Loyola's doctrines were condemned, and the colleges of the fathers were ordered to be closed. The next year, in spite of the efforts of powerful champions, all the personal property of the Jesuits was sequestrated, and in 1764 the suppression was complete. Louis was for a long time undecided, but at last he gave way to Choiseul. According to the Bachemont report, the joy of the bourgeoisie and people at this suppression was excessive and almost indecent. The Jesuits themselves confessed that the people were stoning them with the stones of Port Royal, the destruction of which had been their work. The Queen, the Dauphine, the Dauphin, and the royal princesses were dismayed. They now had to choose the directors of their consciences from among the secular clergy. As for the king, he tried to make a joke of it, and speaking of his confessor, he said, laughing, I shall not be sorry to see Père des Marais an abbey. This frivolity was one of the most remarkable features of Louis's character, apparent even on the gravest occasions. The Dauphin took an active part in the defense of the Jesuits, but he could do nothing against the minister whom he irritated by his importunity. Choiseul once said to him in the heat of argument, Perhaps, Monseigneur, I shall one day be unfortunate enough to be your subject, but certainly I shall never serve you. This was reported to Louis, who said to the Dauphin, My son, you have so offended Monsieur de Choiseul that you must forgive him everything. From this conversation, it is easy to gather what an abyss separated the king from the son he was to lose so prematurely. The last years of the reign were to be saddened by a succession of deaths. First, the Dauphin died at Fontainebleau on December 20th, 1765, in the 37th year of his age. He lingered six months with pulmonary tuberculosis, and during that time his faithful companion, Marie-Joseph of Saxony, mother of the three last Bourbons, nursed him continually. The Dauphin was little known, but after a life of retirement, he was obliged to be ill in public. Every evening he received the first gentlemen of the chamber, the great officers and the young noblemen attached to his person. He conversed with them and seemed quite cheerful. In the morning after Mass, he allowed everyone to see him, even the ambassadors, he asked their pardon for the inconvenience he was causing them by obliging them to remain at Fontainebleau. His words, actions, and sentiments all proved how solid were the qualities of his heart and mind. He was extremely considerate of all who tended him. To the queen's first physician, who sat up with him one night, he said, Ah, my poor la son, I am distressed at the bad night I have given you. Go and lie down, you must be very tired. He excused himself in amusing ways. To the Duke d'Orléans he declared, I must be tiresome, as from time to time I entertain you with a little agony. It was necessary for the Dauphin to die to be appreciated, and the public without exception expressed sincere regret. Philosophers enlarged on his liberal ideas and summed up his policy in his favorite phrase, we must not persecute. They loved to repeat this maxim, forgetting that they never acted up to it, but only relied on it for themselves. Diderot delighted in recalling the fact 
that the dauphin had disapproved of the expulsion of rousseau saying that the author of emile was a man to be pitied not to be persecuted voltaire liked to think that the dauphin read Locke during his last illness and knew the tragedy of mahomet by heart if this age he concluded is not that of great talents at least it is that of cultivated minds it is well known that the prince used to say in speaking of what he intended to do later if i ever have the misfortune to ascend the throne he would say also that the people would be his family and himself their head nine days after the death of her husband the dauphine wrote to her brother xavier september twenty ninth seventeen sixty five god has willed that i should survive him for whom i would have given a thousand lives i hope that he will grant me the grace to spend the rest of my pilgrimage in preparing myself by sincere penitence to rejoin his soul in heaven where i do not doubt he is asking that same grace for me the poor wife lived only a year after her husband she was the victim of her devotion and succumbed to the same malady she left three sons who were all destined to reign and two daughters clotilde who became queen of sardinia and elizabeth the unfortunate sister of louis the sixteenth during her widowhood she took charge of the education of these children and wrote instructions for the dauphin her chief preoccupation was to prepare him for his future and she told him to meditate on this phrase from the memoir of louis the fourteenth nothing is so dangerous as weakness of whatever kind it be did marie joseph foresee how much need her son would have of such advice the dauphine's constancy gained the affection of her father-in-law louis admired in others the virtues he did not possess himself in the year seventeen sixty six he was under the beneficent influence of the dauphine the princess could have had the power of the marquise and have brought back the king to his family had she consented to a reconciliation with choiseul but on this point she was inflexible she would sacrifice everything rather than insult the memory of her husband she was able however to obtain some favours amongst other things her confessor nicolet bishop of verdun was promised the succession to cardinal de luynes archbishop of sens though his attitude to choiseul's policy was definitely hostile little by little the dauphine would have gained more power she would have won the heart of the king he would have allowed himself to be ruled by this new egeria but marie joseph died on may thirteenth seventeen sixty seven and choiseul immediately regained all the favour he had lost louis no longer had any one in his family capable of guiding him his daughters were not clever enough to take up marie joseph's part and the queen who had never counted for much was now relegated to her oratory preparing to die as virtuously as she had lived to the great grief of marie lishtenska her father died in february seventeen sixty six stanislav was really the only being in the world who truly loved the queen his letters to his dear daughter are almost masterpieces of paternal affection to quote one of these short notes would be to quote them all for the subject is always the same though the expressions differ a little they come straight from the heart and sing the praises of the incomparable marineshka the same refrain recurs all through in phrases such as the following you are my alter ego and my thoughts are as near yours as my heart since i live only for you in the name of god keep your dear health it is all i care for in the world i am not young yet i would fain be three months older to make myself younger by the pleasure of seeing you i kiss the tears that you are shedding those little pearls which are jewels of infinite value to me it is thus that poetry is unconsciously created stanislas would have been very much astonished if he had been told that these pages yellowed with age were the most sincere and harmonious things in his life the death of her father on february twenty third seventeen sixty six following on that of her son was a cruel grief to the queen as for me wrote marie i am sad and i shall be so all my life 
my only consolation is the thought that those i mourn would not wish to return to this vale of tears as the salway calls it soon after this the queen began to languish she was ill for months and fell into a pitiable decline like a forsaken flower she died on june twenty fourth seventeen sixty eight this estimable princess says the duke de coye had harmed no creature and deserved the regrets of the nation the goodness of her character could be seen in her most gracious countenance here we recognize the model of latour whose delightful portrait in the louvre perpetuates her calm smile and reveals the resignation she showed both as woman and as wife at this time the king encouraged his daughters to believe that he would for the future submit to no new yoke for two years he gave proofs of a certain consideration for the queen and showed some signs of remorse when la sun came to tell him that marie was no more he went to the death chamber approached the bed and kissed the forehead of his hapless and forsaken wife but he soon forgot the lesson he had learnt in the advent of madame du barry blind to the seriousness of the revolts which were threatening the royal power he entrenched himself in his divine right and never realized how that right was discredited as an example of his folly he allowed the duc d'aiguillon the governor of brittany to receive incoherent orders and to get himself into the most difficult position he annoyed the magistrates of rennes by the unjustifiable arrest of la chalote the attorney-general who was famous for his struggle against the jesuits and for his opposition to the vacillating policy adopted with reference to breton affairs from province to province the various states claimed their prerogatives and clamoured for the liberty of the people the parliament of paris unanimously declared itself in favour of the breton cause with a sudden assumption of authority louis commanded the parliament to be silent saying that he could not tolerate the formation of an imaginary body which believed itself the mouthpiece of the country and the guardian of principles but the duc d'aiguillon was obliged to retire when the parlementaire of brittany refused to deliberate and the judges refused to try la chalote he came to court in april seventeen seventy to vindicate himself and to solicit the judgment of his peers louis ordered his trial there was considerable curiosity to see whether the evidence given would justify the accused and show the contradictory nature of the instructions he had received the parliament sat in the king's presence at versailles itself but there were only two sittings after which louis stopped the proceedings removed and destroyed the documents and declared the duc d'aiguillon immune from all further charges the parliament returned to paris and declared the duke deprived of his rights and privileges as a peer until he should be purged of the suspicions which stained his honour the king quashed this decree and at the instigation of chancellor maupou he issued an edict fulminating against the parliaments their insolence and their illegal claims he asserted that he held his crown from god alone that the legislative power belonged only to him supreme and undivided that there were limits to the right of remonstrance and that the magistrates could set no limits to his authority this edict was issued on september seventh seventeen seventy it was duly registered but the parliament refused to reassume its functions consequently it was sent into exile the provinces made common cause with paris and everywhere the agitation was extreme all heads were turned wrote besenval and even in the streets one heard cries about injustice and tyranny the councillors of state and the masters of requests replaced the former magistrates and represented the former parliament maupou the author of the edict was little concerned at the public excitement the animosity aroused by this coup d'etat and the opposition of the princes of the blood orleans chartres and conti elated by his victory he took no heed of the fact that he was the object of public contumely and that the king his accomplice had become extremely unpopular in themselves his ideas are defensible 
but they owed their existence rather to a hatred of the parliamentaire than to a true love of justice, and this is a sufficient justification for the strictures of history. Such was the origin of the new parliament, which was supported by the celebrated triumvirate, Mopu, Abbe Touré, Controller General, and the Duke d'Aiguillon, who soon replaced Choiseul. All three were staunch supporters of Madame du Barry. Choiseul had succeeded Bernice owing to his support of Madame de Pompadour. He was overthrown because he did not seriously take into account the favorite who replaced her. He could not believe that a woman of such humble origin would succeed in having herself presented at court and would establish herself both in the court and in the council. Madame de Barry, aware of the contempt with which Choiseul and his friends treated her, resolved to overthrow him with the assistance of Aiguillon. The cabal easily found grievances against the minister. The ground of the accusation was an unsuccessful attempt he had made to found a settlement in Guiana. He had spent thirty million livres in sending out twelve thousand people from Alsace and Lorraine, but practically all of them had died of fever. He had taken the loss of the French colonies to heart and had hoped to retrieve it, for the result he was only partially to blame. Choiseul was responsible for the successful conquest of Corsica, which became French in 1769, though it must be admitted that the undertaking was costly and was naturally resented at the time when there were loud cries of poverty. His enemies did not lose the opportunity of making this a grievance against him, hiding the fact that but for Choiseul's prompt action, England would have deprived France of that valuable Mediterranean island. They also disregarded the twelve years in which the minister had successfully maintained the new Austro-French policy, his attempts to strengthen the army and navy, his defense of Poland against the menace of a Russian invasion, and his schemes to avenge the Seven Years' War. At least he had commanded the respect of the neighbors across the Channel. With this object, always an important one to him, he had decided in June of 1770 on his own initiative to encourage Spain to provoke England in a dispute which had arisen between the English governor of the Falkland Islands and the commander of two Spanish frigates who had come to protest against the illegal occupation of the archipelago. A war of such importance would have created a diversion. Choiseul would have been indispensable and would have escaped his enemies. But Spain hesitated to support him, and he was obliged to reveal part of his secret and come to the council with a request for credits. Terre granted what he required, wishing to drive him into a corner and force him to throw off all concealment. Choiseul declared that while he hoped that peace would be maintained, he was prepared for all eventualities. Terre had no intention of paying the promised eight millions, and in consequence, the embarrassment of Choiseul was assured. The cabal was triumphant and accused the minister of being responsible not only for the war which was then imminent, but for the inexcusable resistance of the parliament. He defended himself against these accusations less easily in the case of the first than in that of the second, and this made Louis waver. The king did not know whether to support Choiseul, who asserted that the exile of Maupou and Touré would make the parlementaire quite amenable, or Maupou, who assured him that he would deliver the kingdom forever from their remonstrances. But the complaints of the favorite, supported by her partisans, became louder at the critical moment. Louis yielded to the solicitations of the Dame, as she was called in diplomatic dispatches, but he hesitated for a considerable time. He kept the lettre de cachet intended for Choiseul on his person for three days, fearing it should be prematurely delivered. He knew of what his circle was capable. On Christmas Eve, December 24, 1770, in the morning, the Duc de la Vrière, who, under the title of the Comte de Saint-Florentin, had frequently discharged similar missions during the past forty years, entered the Duc de Choiseul's apartments and handed him the king's note. I order my cousin, the Duc de Choiseul, to place his resignation of his office of Secretary of State and Superintendent of Posts 
in the hands of the Duc de la Vrière, and to retire to Chanteloup until the receipt of further orders from me. The instructions given to La Vrière included the following. But for Madame de Choiseul, I would have sent her husband to some other place, because his estate is in his own governorship. But he will behave as though he were not there, and he will only see his family and any others I permit to visit him. This was a delicate concession. The event caused a sensation in Paris and abroad. The Duke accepted his disgrace with courage and without affectation. His numerous friends hastened to his side, and there was soon a large number of coaches at the door of his house in the Rue de Richelieu. Many people came to write their names as a last proof of their esteem and affection for the great minister whom France was losing. Never did disgrace do more honor to the victim. His fall decided Charles III of Spain to make the sacrifices demanded by England to secure the maintenance of peace, but the Parliament was sacrificed. Mopu was master of the situation. End of section 20. Section 21 of the 18th Century by Kashi Mirstrienska, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 15, The Death of the King, 1770-1774. In the last year of his ministry, Choiseul had witnessed the consummation of a marriage for which he was chiefly responsible. On May 15, 1770, the Dauphin married Marie Antoinette, Archduchess of Austria, the former being sixteen and the latter fourteen and a half years old. An English prose writer, Edmund Burke, in his Reflections on the Revolution in France, perhaps best conveys to us the poetic impression produced on the court by this charming princess. It is now sixteen or seventeen years since I saw the Queen of France, then the Dauphiness at Versailles, and surely never lighted on this orb, which she hardly seemed to touch, a more delightful vision. I saw her just above the horizon, decorating and cheering the elevated sphere she had just begun to move in. Burke only saw the surface. A courtier, the Duc de Coya, who was extremely well informed as to all that happened at Versailles, describes the clouds which came to disturb the brightness of the heavens. Madame la Dauphine, he wrote in his journal, is more and more of a success. Her face was the fairer for her graciousness. She had charming words for everyone, and her curtsies were so delightful that in a short time all were pleased. All said that she must be counseled to remain as she was and listen to nothing which would change her. But it was feared that it might be said that she overdid it, and that if she changed it would be the fault of those around her. These fears so awkwardly expressed by de Quaye, who was not so good a stylist as he was a psychologist, were only too well founded. It would have been natural that the Dauphin, in spite of his youth, should act as mentor. But he received Marie Antoinette coldly, he was heavy and ungainly, morally and physically awkward. Caraccioli, the Neapolitan ambassador, wrote to his court, where Marie Caroline, the Dauphine's sister, was reigning, that the prince was not handsome, nor had he any of the fine deportment of his grandfather, and that he showed himself boorish and rustic in such a degree that he seemed to have been born and educated in a wood. Selvaggio e rozzo, a segno che sembranato ed educato in un bosco. His judgment is echoed by well-informed contemporaries. However, Caraccioli did not fail to do justice to the Dauphin's moral qualities. He described him as simple and natural in his conversation, hating lying and flattery, without vanity or pride, austere from principle, both as regards himself and as regards others, the friend of justice, and with an excellent heart in spite of his rough and harsh exterior. In this also the diplomat was not deceived. All that remained was to know if there were in Louis the makings of a king and of a statesman. Marie Antoinette 
did not find the support she required, and she complained that her husband had only one ruling taste, hunting, and to this he sacrificed both his private and his public life. He was not a lovable husband, and he did not prepare himself to reign. Louis received his granddaughter graciously. Marie Antoinette replied to his affectionate sentiments with a formal respect. She did not love her grandfather. She was hurt to see a du Barry occupying the first place at the court and exacting its prerogatives. Mesdames, her aunts, naturally persuaded the young Dauphine to humiliate the king's friend by not condescending to speak to her. Maria Theresa, according to Merci Argento, the Austrian ambassador at Paris, entreated the Dauphine to be less uncompromising and to make some concessions. This was politically expedient at this time when the fate of Poland was about to be decided with the utmost secrecy and Maria Theresa was about to betray her friend and ally, the King of France. But this queen of unassailable virtue could not have grasped the extent of the scandal at Versailles. It might also be questioned whether she really understood her daughter. Marie Antoinette did not hesitate between the two councils, but she followed neither to the letter. Both from pride and modesty, she adopted a line of conduct which could satisfy no one but herself. On one or two occasions, she made some trivial remark in the favorite's presence, but she did not directly address her, and she did not encourage a reply. The Dauphine had plenty of character, and she showed it in these delicate circumstances. Her attitude towards Madame du Barry proves her virtue and candor. She did what was demanded of her by her mother and Louis, but no mud stained her ermine robe, no defilement polluted it. Marie Antoinette became more or less isolated, sorely though her warm heart needed affection. Unhappily, she could find no consolation in her mother's letters. The stern and imperious Maria Theresa estranged her daughter with her unreasonable demands and ceaseless scoldings, admonishing her to read and engage in intellectual studies little suited to the life at a court where balls, plays, excursions, the chase, and riding were indispensable distractions to the young princess in her isolation. Marie Antoinette soon conceived a warm attachment for Madame de Lamballe, widow of the son of the Duc de Penthievre. In the society of this charming woman, she forgot the tyranny of etiquette and the already growing cares of politics, for which she had little taste. There were many complaints that she would not abandon herself with more complacence to the parties who fought over her. At this time, her aunts gave her the name of the Austrian. That campaign of calumny which pursued her to the foot of the scaffold soon began. The first attacks came from her family circle. Maria Theresa was obliged to resign herself to her daughter's willfulness in refusing to allow herself to be led. The empress found consolation in congratulating herself that the incompetence of the new minister, the Duc d'Aiguillon, who was incapable of grasping or deciding matters of business, would allow the court of Vienna to pursue secret negotiations with Russia and Prussia without fear of interruption. Louis had always been interested in Poland, and it was thought that now her fate was to be decided he would defend her, but he remained indifferent. For a long time the king had had his secret. He had been carrying on a private correspondence with the object of checking the encroachments of the czars. These proceedings, which were unknown to all, even the favorites, had captivated and amused him, but he eventually gave up the pastime like a wearied gambler. He had pursued this policy for nearly twenty years, taking pleasure in countermanding the official instructions of his ministers. He sent money to his Polish dependents, often considerable amounts, with the object of influencing the royal elections, originally in favor of the Prince de Conti, and then, when the latter quarreled with Madame de Pompadour, in favor of the Saxon succession. Ultimately, he came to wish simply for the freedom of the Poles and a return to national kings. 
but he did not allow himself to be disturbed by the schemes which were nullifying all his monetary sacrifices and his often skilful manoeuvres as one of those who were in his confidence wrote we cannot but admit that the partition of poland could not have taken place but for our negligence in preventing its inception and the insufficiency of the means we adopted to arrest its course the original idea of this spoliation came from frederick at the instigation of france the turks had declared war on russia in seventeen sixty nine hereupon frederick who was disturbed by the progress of russia made proposals for an alliance with joseph the second to maintain the neutrality of germany austria on her side was alarmed when the russian armies invaded moldavia and wallachia and she prepared at once to assist the turks this would have meant a general war in the north for the prussian king who was tacitly bound to the czarina asserted that he could not abandon his ally a conference was held between frederick and joseph at neustadt on september third seventeen seventy where it was decided that it was time for mediation and that the intermediaries between russia and the port should be themselves france was entirely disregarded maria theresa at first disapproved of her son's policy but in the end she gave way in spite of the treaties which bound her to louis the fifteenth in the meantime france was sending poland money and even some adventurous officers like du Maurier and viomenil the latter were handicapped by the undisciplined troops placed under their command with such support it was difficult to resist the russians for under pretext of protecting the members of the orthodox church catherine had invaded polish territory and was already treating it as a conquered country at this junction choiseul who was favourable to the polish cause was dismissed and his successor the duc d'aiguillon made a point of not following his predecessor's line of policy aiguillon essayed a reconciliation with prussia and prussia made pretence of listening in order to put him off the scent he became the laughing stock of european diplomatists and was considered to be blundering along in the dark the negotiations between the three powers progressed though maria theresa still hesitated seeing this frederick sent one of his confidants to vienna to win over the empress's confessor she allowed herself to be persuaded that she ought to yield for the good of her soul thereupon wrote the king of prussia she began to weep terribly meanwhile the troops of the three powers entered poland and took possession of their shares the empress weeping all the while but of a sudden we discovered to our great surprise that she had taken far more than the portion allotted to her for she wept and took the while and we had much difficulty in persuading her to be contented with her share of the cake that is what she is the french ambassador at vienna prince louis de rohan who was later to play a part so fatal to marie antoinette in the affair of the necklace confirms this description of the empress's attitude i have seen he said maria theresa weep over the misfortunes of oppressed poland but this princess who is an adept at the art of not allowing her real feelings to be known seems to have her tears under control with one hand she holds her kerchief to wipe them away with the other she seizes the sword with which to carve her third share this letter was confided by aiguillon to madame du barry who had it read to her during a supper as though it were addressed to herself marie antoinette could never forgive rohan for having ridiculed her mother and for having chosen the favourite as she thought for such a confidence the actual partition treaty was signed on august fifth seventeen seventy two when each of the spoilers had already taken possession of the polish provinces allotted to them the event was received at the court of versailles with indifference its significance was not understood in spite of the remonstrances of the comte de breuil head of the secret diplomatic service who said the position of poland as regards france and all the other powers of europe 
is that of a member cut off from society, a citizen deprived of his natural rights, reduced to slavery, civilly dead, and in consequence no longer possessing either property or personality in the social order. Such in the political order is the fate of a nation once called illustrious, which has had the son of its king proclaimed Tsar at Moscow, received the homage of Prussia at Warsaw, and delivered a proud and humbled Austria under the walls of Vienna. Louis replied, From the distance of five hundred leagues it is difficult to aid Poland. I could have preferred that it should remain intact, but I can give it little more than my good wishes. Through all he adhered to the Austrian alliance and did not want war. I must not speak of Polish affairs before you, he said to the Dauphin, for your relatives are not of the same opinion as ourselves. With this astonishing levity, the king allowed French influence to be destroyed by this unjust dismemberment, where the strong triumphed in defiance of the law of nations. The decadence of Turkey and the anarchy of Poland had excited the covetousness of the powers, but they preferred to agree rather than fight with one another. Their rivalry, says Sorel, was the cause of their alliance, but the alliance did not make the causes of their rivalry disappear. On the contrary, it gave them a new stimulus, and the only effect of the treaties of St. Petersburg and Warsaw was to add to the eastern question another which was more urgent, more serious, and more menacing still, the question of Poland. If it had been possible to stop at the treaties of 1772, the partition would have ranked not only as a lucrative, but as a skillful and politic stroke but history does not stop. Facts once established bring their inevitable consequences, and as a lasting revenge of right against might, wrongful deeds and immoral treaties find their echo in the inextricable embarrassment which results from them. The dismemberment of Poland mattered little to Louis. The internal affairs which troubled the end of his reign left him equally unmoved. The Mopu Parliament excited contempt and ridicule and alienated many who were faithful to the ancient liberties of the parliaments. The king, in the midst of his own court, said a diplomat, the Chevalier Deon, with some justice, had less power than an advocate at the Châtelet. The great evil was that the ministers of the time, such as the Abbe Terray, the Duc d'Aiguillon, and the Duc de la Vrière, found the heavy task laid on them beyond their powers. Mopu established superior councils or purely judicial tribunals in Paris and certain provincial towns. Litigants were able in this way to find judges in other places besides the capital and to save a great deal of expense. The chancellor also decreed the abolition of the sale of offices and the gifts to the judges, but these reforms produced fresh abuses. If offices could no longer be bought, they were too often obtained by arrangement. Meanwhile, Mopu was overwhelmed with satires, but nothing did so much damage to his authority as the attacks of Beaumarchais in his famous quarrels with Gutzmann, a councillor of the new parliament. The latter was accused of having yielded to offers of bribes in a suit brought by the future author of the Barbier de Seville against the Comte de la Blache, heir of Paris du Vernay. Madame Gutzmann had accepted a sum of money and when the action was lost had refused to return it in full. In four brilliant documents full of wit and spirit, but also unfortunately of bad taste, Beaumarchais brought his cause before the bar of public opinion. He secured the condemnation of Gutzmann and his wife, but he himself was censured by the court and on the day on which judgment was delivered, February 26th, 1774, princes, gentlemen, and ladies of quality came to write their names at the house of the brilliant controversialist. The affair caused general indignation. A play upon words found popularity and was passed round Paris. Louis XV has established the new parliament. Fifteen Louis, the sum in question in the suit, will destroy it. The king himself in the end was amused by the incident. 
according to his custom he spoke of this scandal as though some one else were governing and he was an enlightened dilettante the conversation he had with the chancellor was reported everywhere well well your parliament is getting itself talked about it seems that this goodsman is a bad character who must be got rid of sire that must not be attributed to me he came from m le duc d'aiguillon yes but they say there are others that may be so sire it must be so even the new parliament is a youth sowing his wild oats it will behave wonderfully later they said that this parliament would not take it is taking well it is taking with both hands louis was trying to remedy the harm by making jokes he retained Mopu, who showed himself so skilful in frustrating attacks but a very serious thing occurred to decide the chancellor's fate toward the end of april the king who was taking a holiday at trianon felt himself troubled with pains in the head shivering and lumbago either his fear of declaring himself ill or the hope that exercise might do him good led him to refrain from altering the arrangements that he had made the evening before he went to the hunt returned in the evening to the trianon and placed himself in the hands of madame du barry and la borde his body servant he had a bad night le moine the first physician in ordinary thought that louis who was always inclined to fear death was exaggerating his sufferings the first surgeon la martiniere abruptly ordered the king to return to versailles and had the royal family warned they were at last permitted to see the invalid for a short time suddenly he became worse he was bled twice a third bleeding was proposed and it was certain that madame du barry would be sent away the young woman tried to postpone the evil moment and was supported by her ministers the palace was full of intrigues those in power tried to keep their places by hiding the truth louis now thought only of himself and the fourteen representatives of the faculty he would have liked said the duc de liancourt to augment their number he made all fourteen feel his pulse six times an hour and when any of this numerous faculty were not in the room he called for them so as always to be surrounded by them as though he hoped that with such satellites illness would not dare to attack his majesty on april twenty ninth the doctors noticed red marks on the king's face and diagnosed smallpox the dauphin and his brothers were forbidden to come near the king the king's daughters refused to leave their father thus defeating the intriguers by their filial piety though their devotion was foolishly ridiculed the duc de liancourt as grand master of the wardrobe witnessed the king's last days and has left an uncompromising account of them he gives a grim reason for the little effect the conduct of mesdames which was so worthy of respect had on the court and paris he said in very plain words that the object of their sacrifice did not deserve such abnegation forgetting that he was speaking of a father the king was so debased and so despised especially the latter that nothing that could be done for him could possibly interest the public what a lesson for kings they must know that though we are obliged to give them marks of outward respect and submission if we are forced to judge their actions we avenge ourselves for their power over us by despising them profoundly when the object of their conduct is not our welfare and does not deserve our admiration indeed we did but judge the king as he was judged by all his kingdom the next day there was a crowd at versailles on may first the archbishop of paris himself very ill went to the king and found there madame du barry who immediately retired louis who did not know from what he was suffering told the prelate to withdraw for the next few days there was considerable difficulty in preventing the archbishop who had taken up his abode in versailles from entering the palace the king seemed better he was in full possession of his senses and spoke in his ordinary tone of voice he was so well that it seemed very much as though he would have a wonderful recovery and that there would be no change to the great dismay of paris 
Madame du Barry's circle was triumphant. But they were soon to lose all hope. Besenval tells us that the crowd of rogues, intriguers, and spies with which the king's courtiers had peopled Versailles began to be filled with great alarm. It was impossible to hide from Louis any longer that he had smallpox. He had to realize that this was serious for a man of sixty-four. At last he spoke to his favorite. Now that I know my condition, I must not have a repetition of the mess scandal. If I had known what I know now, you would never have entered. I owe myself to God and my people. Therefore, you must go away tomorrow. Tell de Guillon to come and speak to me tomorrow at ten. The king arranged with the minister for her departure, and in the afternoon of May 4th, Madame du Barry went to Rouet, accompanied by the Duchesse de Guillon, who had offered her hospitality in her country house. About six o'clock, the following conversation took place between Louis and Laborde. Go and find Madame du Barry. She is gone. Where has she gone? To Rouet, sire. Ah, already. In lucid moments he thought only of this woman. He had meant, said the Duc de Coyer, to put her safely somewhere where he could find her again if he wanted her, to spare her the insults which had been offered to Madame de Chateauroux at Metz, and if he should come to the last sacrament, to have no obstacle. He forgot to summon his confessor, who was waiting in an adjoining room, and waited there for two days more. The Archbishop of Paris and the Cardinal de la roche the Grand Almoner, were also watching. On May 6th, they were able to say a few words to the king, who answered, I cannot at present. I am unable to put two ideas together. Mesdames were in a cruel position. They were afraid of alarming their father and did not dare to interfere. At last, in the night between the 7th and 8th, Louis asked for his confessor, the Abbe Modou, and had several conversations with him. Then he summoned his grandchildren and made all arrangements for the Eucharistic ceremony. Mesdames were to remain at the door of the room, the Dauphine and her sisters-in-law in the council chamber, the Dauphin and his brothers at the bottom of the staircase. The servants alone were to approach the dying man with the clergy. The cardinal delivered an exhortation, and the king communicated. Then, going to the door of the room, the Grand Almoner addressed the court which was assembled in the various apartments. Messieurs, His Majesty charges me to tell you that he asks God to pardon his offenses and the scandal he has caused his people. If God gives him back his health, he will spend his time in penitence, in supporting religion, and in relieving his people. On which Louis said, I should have liked to have had the strength to speak myself. There was a slight rally, and immediately Madame du Barry's protégés hastened to Rouet to give her the news and to assure themselves of her favor. But suddenly the king's sufferings came on again with renewed force, and he had difficulty in breathing. Abbe Modou now never left his side and exhorted him to be patient. Offer your sufferings to God as expiation, he said, and Louis answered, Ah, if that were enough, it would be very little. I would suffer more than that. How totally he had forgotten such sentiments. They returned to his dying lips like an echo of the words he had spoken at the beginning of his reign. Between these two periods, Louis had stifled conscience in pleasure, trying to escape the boredom which enveloped him like the shirt of Nessus, and neglecting all his duties, especially those expected of the most Christian king. Extreme unction was administered on Monday, May 9th, with great pomp. The room and the little camp bed with its curtains drawn back were lighted by candles held by surpliced priests. The king was heard to say amen in a firm voice. In the midst of these bright lights, Louis, exhausted with pain, looked as though he had an enormous copper mask on his face. It was like a death's head. Some of those present affected more self-possession than was necessary. Practically no one wept, and in general there was more etiquette than sentiment. In the marble court which led to the royal chamber, people passed the night waiting for the proclamation. The weather was fine. On the next day the park was filled with people walking about as usual, and the cabarets were busy. 
In Paris there was, if possible, even greater indifference. Louis was still able to speak on the 10th. Then, at three in the afternoon, the death agony began. Sixteen large state coaches, harnessed with eight horses, immediately took the royal family to Choisy in accordance with the protocol. In the Avenue de Paris there was a large crowd acclaiming the new king. This formed a contrast which made those who had watched the sad spectacle understand the vanity of greatness. It was impossible to expose the body at Versailles or in the Louvre, as was the custom. In the night between the 12th and 13th, another procession composed of three hunting coaches accompanied by guards and pages with torches set out for Saint-Denis. One of these funeral carriages bore the mortal remains of Louis the Fifteenth, surrounded with quicklime and encased in three coffins, so great was the fear of infection. This funeral procession, said Bezonval, was more like the transport of a burden of which men were anxious to be rid than the last duties rendered to a monarch. On the way, drunkards sang and made indecent remarks. Louis was his own judge. He said in his will, I have governed and administered badly, because I have little talent and I have been badly advised. What could be added to so frank an admission? End of section 21. Section 22 of the 18th Century by Kashimish Strienska, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Fourth Part. Louis the Sixteenth, Chapter 16, The Coronation, 1774 to June 11th, 1775. Louis the Sixteenth was received as a savior. Everything seemed to smile on this twenty-year-old monarch, whose honesty was well known. He was simple and charitable, ready to reform abuses, to look into the finances, and reduce the sinecures. Up to this time he had had no part in the government, and his tastes had not lain that way. The announcement of his grandfather's death caused him to utter a cry of despair, for he feared for his youth and inexperience. It seems that the universe is falling on me, he said. I am the most unfortunate of men. God, what a burden is mine at my age, and they have taught me nothing. However, though he was unknown, much was said in his favor, even outside his own kingdom. You have a very good king, my dear d'Alembert, wrote Frederick II, and I congratulate you with all my heart. A king who is wise and virtuous is more to be feared by his rivals than a prince who has only courage. The philosopher replied, He loves goodness, justice, economy, and peace. He is just what we ought to desire as our king, if a propitious fate had not given him to us. It became known that on May 20th he had received one of the most important dignitaries of the old court unfavorably. Who are you? he said to this individual. Sire, I am called La Ferté. What do you want? Sire, I came to receive your orders. Why? It is because, because I am steward of the menu. What are the menu? Sire, they are your majesty's menu plaisir, amusements. My menu plaisir are a walk in the park. I have no need of you. Whereupon Louis turned his back. The new king sent two hundred thousand livres to the poor of Paris and renounced the joyeux avènement. Footnote joyful accession, a grant given to the king at his accession, which had cost twenty million francs under Louis the Fifteenth, He thought only of the public welfare and nothing of his private interest. In the preamble to the first ordinance of his reign, he said, there are necessary expenses which may be consistent with the safety of our states. There are others connected with the royal bounty which may be susceptible of moderation, but which from long usage have become the subjects of prescriptive right, and therefore can only be subjected to a gradual retrenchment. Finally, there are expenses which concern our person and the ostentation of our court. In this case, we can promptly follow the dictates of our heart. The Queen also renounced the droit de ceinture, the right of the girdle, that is, purse, though this, it is true, 
was much less important than the joyeux abonnement. This due was levied in Paris every third year, and originally consisted of three deniers on each hogshead of wine. It was afterwards increased and extended to other commodities such as coal. Louis and Marie Antoinette were cheered as soon as they were seen. They took up their residence at the Meute, La Mouette, and walked daily in the Bois de Boulogne, whither all Paris came in crowds to see them. One day the Queen, fair as the day and full of grace, went there on horseback. She met the King on foot, in the midst of his people, without escort. She dismounted, and Louis ran up to her and kissed her on the forehead. The crowd clapped their hands, and the king, thus encouraged, gave her two sound kisses. The applause was redoubled. They assure me, said the Duc de Quay, that it is one of the most touching episodes that has ever been seen, the more so since it is long since the nation has been able to give vent to its tender feelings. The enthusiasm was loyal and sincere. Louis the Sixteenth tried to deserve it in all good faith. He barricaded himself with honest folk and surrounded himself with men who would have the courage to remind him of his duties. The same idea guided him when he came to choose his ministers. He thought of Machot, whom Louis the Fifteenth had always regretted, after sacrificing him to Madame de Pompadour. But he was not free, and others thought for him. Irreproachable as his intentions were, they had little stability. At this serious trial he was caught in a trap. The Comte de Maurepas returned to power. Maurepas had been disgraced in 1749 for having written some insolent verses about the Marquise. He was born in 1701 and had occupied the position of secretary of the king's household since 1718, so was said to have been a minister since childhood. He did not lack wit. In fact, he had too much of it. Nor did he lack intelligence. But he used these gifts to settle even the most serious questions with bon mots and epigrams. His chief pleasure was to ridicule others. He had considerable experience of court life, but that was not enough to fit him to direct the affairs of the monarchy. He was deceptive. Louis thought he had found the honest man he sought, when in reality he had laid his hand on one destined to be disastrous to the state. There was perhaps no reason why this old man should have been appointed, save indeed the persistence of the Duc de Richelieu and the Duc d'Aiguillon, to whom he was related. These latter, with the assistance of the Abbe de Radonvilliers, a former Jesuit and under tutor to the Dauphin, secured Madame de Narbonne, lady in waiting to Madame Adelaide, for their cause. Madame Adelaide, as favorite daughter of the late king and aunt of the new monarch, was in a position of influence in the early stages. She joyfully undertook the intrigue and probably dictated the following letter which her nephew wrote to Maurepas. In the just grief which overwhelms me with all the nation, I have great duties to fulfill. I am the king. The name imposes many obligations, but I am only twenty years old, and I have not the experience I need. The certainty I have of your probity and of your profound experience of affairs induces me to beg you to assist me with your counsel. Come, then, as soon as possible. The existing ministers who had assisted at the last moments of Louis the Fifteenth were as a matter of precaution in quarantine, and the intrigues were thus made all the easier. Maurepas returned from exile at Pontchartrain and was received at Choisy on May 13th. He was content to have the title of Minister of State without a portfolio and to play the part of mentor. The Duc d'Orléans, and with him Monsieur, the Comte de Provence, the Comte d'Artois, and all the princes of the blood thought they would be admitted to the council, but they were disappointed. This ostracism annoyed the king's brothers, and for a while it was feared that the Duc d'Aiguillon would remain in power. But the queen desired the fall of the minister, and in spite of Maurepas, he was compelled to send in his resignation on June 2nd. Marie Antoinette was begged by Merci to overcome her antipathy, but she refused. The Austrian ambassador would have liked to see d'Aiguillon in charge of foreign affairs until the definite conclusion of the Turkish hostilities. 
fears were also expressed at vienna as to the possibility of choiseul's recall for his supporters were active about the queen he would it was thought have interfered with the new austrian policy his restless and turbulent head said joseph the second might have thrown the kingdom into the utmost difficulties marie antoinette failed to secure his reinstatement but consoled herself by receiving choiseul at court with all the grace and charm of which contemporaries speak monsieur de choiseul she said i am charmed to see you here you made my happiness and it is right that you should witness it the king who was somewhat embarrassed found nothing to say but you have got fatter you have lost your hair you have become bald he could not pardon the minister for having intrigued against his father the dauphin choiseul understood that he was not likely to regain favour he soon returned to chanteloup after having experienced indications of his continued popularity he received thousands of visits during the three days he spent at versailles and paris with reference to these two events in which the queen had played a part maria theresa said I have noticed that in spite of the deference that she seems to show to your counsels, she goes her own way in matters on which she is prejudiced. I was struck by her attitude in the Deguillon and Choiseul affairs, and especially by the revengeful spirit she displayed to the former. The Duc d'Aiguillon was replaced in the control of foreign affairs by the Comte de Vergennes, who had distinguished himself as ambassador at Constantinople and was then at Stockholm. It seemed a good appointment, since Vergennes was prudent and safe, and had a respect for sound traditions. He was known to be slow in making up his mind, but full of zeal and devotion. The Comte de Vergennes, said Choiseul some years previously, always finds arguments against anything which anyone proposes to him, but never has any difficulty in carrying it out. If we asked him for the Grand Vizier's head tomorrow, he would write that it would be a dangerous business, but he would send it to us. Morpa congratulated himself on this choice, which was inspired by Mopou. Every change in the ministry was anxiously watched by the latter in his own interest. The appointment of the Comte de Mouy to take d'Aiguillon's place at the head of the War Department was also satisfactory to the Chancellor. The Comte de Mouy had been a friend of Louis's father, and was one of the heads of the religious party who supported the new parliament. Mopou also had the satisfaction of knowing that Turgot, the new naval minister, had always been opposed to the old parlementaire. It now only remained to replace La Vrière and Bertin, who had no influence, and Terre, although the latter was ready enough to support any party. But Mopou had to fight the Palais Royal party, the Duc d'Orléans, and his son, the Duc de Chartres, later Philippe Egalité, who offered him a strenuous opposition. These princes had refused to be present at the ceremony of the catafalque at Saint-Denis and to listen to the funeral oration of Louis XV, giving as their reason that they did not wish to meet the new parliament. Consequently, they were exiled from court. The news of their disgrace excited much feeling among Parisians, with whom the old magistrates had always been popular. On the evening of July 26th, the king and queen, accompanied by Monsieur, Madame, and the Comtesse d'Artois, passed through Paris on their way back from Saint-Denis, where they had been to visit their aunt, Madame Louise. They were very coldly received, a fact which they felt deeply. Morpah was vigilant, and on this occasion he gave evidence of his powers of intrigue. Although Louis believed in Mopou, Morpah succeeded in persuading the king that to retain the chancellor and his tribunals would cost him the love of his subjects. The queen, at Morpah's instigation, put in her word. He told her that Mopou was the principal author of the calumnies which had been spread about her with the object of causing a quarrel between her and the king. She used all her power, which was already considerable, and Mopou was exiled on August 24th, 1774. The Chancellor said when he left, The king wishes to lose his crown, well, it is his to lose. Therese was dismissed on the same day. Everywhere it was said, 
it is the St. Bartholomew of ministers. And the Spanish ambassador is reported to have answered, yes, but it is not the massacre of the innocents. The next day was the festival of St. Louis, and there was great rejoicing in Paris. Maurepas was able to tell his master that the people had never celebrated August 25th so loyally. The manifestations were continued on the 26th. The new parlementaires were hooted when they left the royal audience, and in the evening, effigies of Maupou and Thérèse were hung at the gallows of St. Genevieve. End of section 22. Section 23 of the 18th Century by Kashimir Strienska, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 16, The Coronation, 1774 to June 11, 1775, Part 2. Eau de Miromenil, chief president of the Rouen Parliament, was made keeper of the seals, Turgot was transferred to the Controller Generalship, resigning his former office to Sartine. Lenoir accepted the post of Lieutenant of Police. In spite of the opposition of the clergy and nearly all the ministry except Maurepas and Miromenil, the recall of the old magistrates was decided. On October 21st, the King signed the letters of recall and the old Parliament was summoned for November 9th. Three days after, Louis held a lit de justice in Paris. Gentlemen, he said, the king, my most honored lord and grandfather, forced by your resistance to his repeated orders, did what his wisdom dictated in order to maintain his authority and to fulfill his duty of giving justice to his subjects. Today I am recalling you to those functions that you ought never to have abandoned. Realize the value of my kindness and never forget it. I wish to bury all that has passed in oblivion, and I shall be much displeased if I see internal dissensions trouble the order and tranquillity of my Parliament. At this sitting, the Advocate General pronounced the words, States General. The King gave him an angry look. The Parliament treated the grace they were supposed to have received with arrogance and disdain. They retained the right of remonstrance, but lost some of their other privileges. As the king and queen left the assembly, however, they were frantically applauded by the crowd, which was bitter against Maupou. The young sovereigns had need of popular applause, and they took it as a proof of gratitude, not foreseeing that gratitude would be short-lived, and that by making concession after concession they would lose their kingdom. The recall of the parliament was an act of weakness but the king was persuaded to it by interested advisers and by the supplications of the queen, who wished to regain the goodwill of Paris. The whole policy of Louis's reign was to please either one party or another. Louis had some of the ideas of a statesman, but could never carry them out. He always gave way to Marie Antoinette, and by degrees regular coteries formed around her, eager to take advantage of the inexperience of the young princess and the weak character of her husband. Contemporaries, and amongst them even royalists, deplored the situation. The worst, said Coye, is that it was seen that with a thousand things in his favor, with much good sense and a just mind, the king would allow himself to be led and would not learn to govern or act on his own responsibility, and that in many respects things would be exactly as they were in the times of the late king. From Vienna, where these events were followed with much anxiety and interest, Maria Theresa wrote that it is incomprehensible that the king and his ministers should destroy Maupu's work, and an Austrian diplomat added, certainly nothing is more desirable than to re-establish order in the administration of justice, but the empress seems persuaded that the king of France could have arrived at this salutary end without re-establishing the old authority of the parliaments, which has so often shaken that of the most Christian kings. From the monarchic point of view, Louis's error was great. If the king had taken the firm resolution of maintaining the work of his grandfather, says the Duc de Lévis, 
that resolution alone would have been sufficient to consolidate it. The tribunals would have been purified, and would have shown with their old luster. The nation would in time have given them its complete confidence, and the government would have freed itself finally from a recurring cause of trouble that in fact increased instead of diminishing, and ended by dragging down the government in its own overthrow. When Louis recalled the old magistrates, he created the new force which made the revolution, and by degrees gained control of France. Beaumarchais foresaw it. He wrote to Sertine on November 14, 1774, It is scarcely credible that a king, twenty years of age, who might be supposed to have a great love for his new authority, should have loved his people to such an extent that he should give them satisfaction on so essential a point. The brilliant controversialist realized the double consequence of this recall of the parliamentaires, the loss of royal power, and the birth of a new supreme authority. Turgot, honest Turgot, disapproved of the backward step, fearing the opposition of the Parliament to the useful and healthy reforms he intended to propose. Fear nothing, said Louis to him, I shall always support you. The king was sincere, and he thought he was master. He had the greatest confidence in Turgot. In vain people tried to warn him against the ex-intendant of Limoges and his dealings with the philosophers and economists. Louis took his inspiration from his father, the Dauphin, who said, Duties of state and religious duties should not be mixed. He also remembered his father's reflection on Madame de Maintenon's animosity toward Catina. If Monsieur de Catina did not know God, he was to be pitied, but as he knew his own business, an army should have been entrusted to him. Trugo is an honest man, Louis had said in the same spirit, that is enough. And he made him controller of the finances in the place of Abbe Terre. A letter from Mademoiselle de Lespinas to Guibert, written on August 29, 1774, tells of the king's first meeting with Turgot. Then you do not wish to be controller general? Sire, I confess I would rather have remained naval minister. But it is not to the king that I give my services, it is to the honest man. You shall not be deceived, replied the king, taking him by both hands. Sire, I must impress upon your majesty the necessity for economy, and that you must be the first to give the example. Monsieur l'Abbé Terre has no doubt already told your majesty the same. Yes, he has told me, but he has not told me as you have done. Turgot represented the moral energy that Louis lacked, but his energy was not supplemented by power of action or any sense of moderation. Like all his contemporaries, Turgot voluntarily withdrew himself into the desert of generous ideas without taking any human contingencies into account. He was thought to be contemptuous of public opinion. He had no knowledge of men and reckoned neither with their passions nor with their vanities. He wished to do good, but he seemed determined to see it in his own system alone. His friends who defended him made certain statements which justify some of the criticisms. He was thought to be susceptible to prejudice, said Condorcet, because he formed all his judgments by himself and public opinion had no influence over him. Dupont de Nemours also shows the weak side of Turgot's character. He asserts that he was at his ease only with his intimate friends, and seemed cold and reserved to all other men. Between these and Turgot there was always a feeling of mutual discomfort, which did him harm on more than one occasion. Turgot felt that the task he had undertaken was a heavy one. In the celebrated letter he wrote on leaving the king's cabinet at Compiègne, he declared that he wished to avoid bankruptcy, increase of taxation, and loans. This first official document of the controller is the keynote of the new administration. The problem that the minister set himself to solve was to find a remedy for the poverty of the people. Sire, he said, you must arm yourself against your own kindness with that kindness itself. Consider from whence comes this money that you are able to distribute to your courtiers, 
and compare the misery of those from whom this money must be extorted, sometimes by the harshest of means, with the position of those persons who have the greatest claims on your liberality. Turgot seems to have had more knowledge of men than he was given credit for when he said, I shall have to struggle against the generosity of your majesty and those who are dearest to you. I shall be feared and even hated by the greater part of the court, by all who look for favors. The people for whom I am going to sacrifice myself are so easily deceived that perhaps I shall incur their hatred. I shall be slandered and perhaps with enough appearance of truth to deprive me of your majesty's confidence. It was the league against abuses which was to cause his downfall. Yet he was confident, for he was a staunch royalist and trusted to Louis' intentions. He threw himself into his work with great energy. Among the events which give the best insight into the new controller's methods are the Corn War, which reveals him as an economist, and the King's coronation, which shows his political side. On September 13th, the council signed a decree ordaining the removal of internal restrictions on the sale of corn. A law to this effect had existed since Machaut's administration in 1749, but it had not been put into force. Up to this time, a peasant had had to sell his corn at a market. He was not allowed to deal directly with his neighbor or his landlord, and was forced to go to the needless expense of transport, market dues, and warehousing. These exactions offended the people's sense of justice. It was only profitable to the middlemen and monopolists, and made the government the arbiters of poverty or wealth. The grievance was not to be remedied without difficulty. Abuses still persisted, but gratitude is due to the monarchy which showed the way to reform. The decree was immensely popular. The examples of Sully and Colbert were recalled, and it was said of Turgot, ton homme vole avec eux vers l'immortalité. Your name takes flight with them in immortality. The words property and liberty lent particular eloquence to this edict. However, there were critics. Turgot was made a subject for ridicule to the ironic refrain of chanson, chanson. Le grand ministre de notre France, doué d'esprit, d'intelligence et de raison, en reformant notre finance, répondra pourtant l'abondance, chanson, chanson. The great minister of our France, endowed with wit, intelligence, and reason, whilst reforming our finances, will spread plenty around, songs, songs. The controller needed support, but which amongst the different estates could come to his aid? He could not ask such a sacrifice from nobility, clergy, parliament, or financiers. He only had the people and the king on his side. Soon even the people were deceived by the minister's enemies, and they abandoned him. In April and May, 1775, the dearness of corn provoked riots which were known as the Corn War. Turgo was the victim of the monopolists, who reduced the agricultural interest to poverty and then excited it to revolt. The first disturbances took place at Dijon. Immediately, the controller removed other restrictions on the sale of corn and increased the facilities for importation in spite of his economic principles. This, to a certain extent, relieved the public distress. However, riots continued to be organized and spread from Pontoise to Versailles. It was obvious that someone was behind them, and the keeper of the seals had reason to say to the Parliament, The march of the brigands seems to have been organized. Their approach is announced. Public rumors state the day, time, and place where their acts of violence will be committed. It would seem that a plan has been formed to devastate the country, to intercept navigation, and to prevent the transport of corn on the high roads, in order to reduce the great towns, and especially Paris, to a state of famine. The rioters sacked the granaries and threw the corn into the streets and rivers, but on their way from place to place they behaved quietly, as if they were under orders. Many of them had gold and silver in their pockets. According to a contemporary account, they were evidently creating a fictitious misery in the midst of plenty. On May 2nd, 
the army of John Barleycorn, Jean Farine, was at the gates and even in the court of the Chateau of Versailles. The king, protected by his military household, ordered that there was to be no firing and no violent measures. The captain of the guard suggested that he should retreat to Choisy or Fontainebleau, but Louis wished to remain. From his windows he watched a hostile crowd for the first time. He appeared on the balcony and tried vainly to speak. Then he went indoors in extreme dejection, shedding tears. Yielding to the cries of the populace, he proclaimed that bread should be two sous the pound. Thus he disowned Turgot and his reforms. Seeing the king's grief, the courtiers seemed also to be affected. But beneath the surface, it was obvious that many of them were not displeased at the event. The next day, Louis intimated to Turgot that he was afraid he had made a political mistake and he wished to remedy it. A police order forbade the sale of bread above the market price. On the following day, the organizers came to Paris and similar scenes were renewed there. Some of the squares might have been those of a town taken by assault. About eleven o'clock in the morning, all was calm again. There was a revival of confidence in Turgot's efforts and in his cooperation with the king. But it is said that both of them were unskilled in the wiles of courts, and it was feared that Louis had not the courage of his virtues. It was necessary to make an example. The judges of the Châtelet examined the persons arrested on the morning of May 3rd and condemned a gauze worker and a master hairdresser to be hanged in the Place de Greve for having taken part in the sedition. The blow would have fallen with more justice in higher quarters if the organizers of the Corn War had been handed over to the tribunal. But the king refused to disclose their names, and the affair was hushed up by order. Perhaps the most violent of these organizers was the Prince de Conti, a personal enemy of Turgot. According to Marmontel, he would have been well pleased to ruin this troublesome minister from whom he expected nothing in the king's opinion. The name of Terre was also mentioned, and with him the Jesuits, the clergy, the financiers, and the English. But the immediate cause of the revolt is still doubtful. One thing was well known namely that Turgot was accused by powerful adversaries of wishing to cut down their prerogatives. However, the king was victorious, understanding, and supporting his minister. Strong in this support, Turgot tried to make some alteration in the costly coronation ceremony which was to take place at Reims on June eleventh, 1775. He was frightened at the expense and made some suggestions, as, for instance, that the coronation should take place in Paris, since Henry the Fourth had been crowned at Chartres, but it was decided that Reims should not be deprived of its traditional fetes. Turgot wished to modify the following phrase in the royal oath, I swear to exterminate entirely in my states all heretics expressly condemned by the church. Louis the Thirteenth and even Louis the Fourteenth had eluded this formula by declaring that they did not include Calvinists among the heretics. The revocation of the Edict of Nantes, it is true, still existed in the National Archives, but it was very much impaired by the difference of the Regent and Louis the Fifteenth, in spite of having been enforced on rare occasions. For a time, Louis the Sixteenth seemed attracted to this spirit of toleration, but eventually he gave way to Maurepas and the clergy. At Reims, nevertheless, he mumbled some inaudible words when it came to this part of the oath. Some of the formulae, however, were abolished, but from motives very different from those of Turgot. The patriots were annoyed at the suppression of that part of the ceremony in which the monarch seems to ask the consent of the people. However vain this ridiculous formula may appear, it was considered a mistake a very great mistake on the part of the clergy, for whom this pious spectacle seems to be made, to cut the other part entirely out of the ceremony and retain only that which primarily concerned themselves. Here again, the eternal struggle between the political and the clerical power came into play. In his Essay sur la Tolérance, Turgot insists that these two powers should not be confused and should each remain in its own sphere. 
he deplored the fact that the same doctrine could have produced the St. Bartholomew and the League, alternately putting the dagger into the king's hands to kill the people and into the people's hands to assassinate the king. These details are necessary to a correct understanding of the philosophic movement and the forerunners of the revolution. But it must not be supposed that the nation had forgotten its loyalty to the monarchy, for that loyalty was still strong and vigorous, except in the case of certain reformers such as Voltaire and D'Alembert. All the love which the people felt for their king was shown at the coronation. It had lately become the custom to greet the king, whether in the theatre or on the street, with cheers and applause, and now at the time of the enthronement, near the end of the long ceremony, when the great door was thrown open, and even the people without were able to see the king ascend a throne placed in the centre of the screen, loud cheers were heard in the close outside, and even in the interior of the cathedral itself. The people thronged in, birds were set free, singing as they soared harmonies which were soon drowned by the trumpets, the firing of muskets, and the joyful peals of the bells in the town. Louis had been wearied by the interminable ceremony and had found his crown heavy and uncomfortable, but when he heard the shouts and the noise he began to share the general emotion. He was now robed in all his royal splendor. He wore the great violet mantle, ornamented with fleur-de-lis and lined with ermine, and he held the scepter and hand of justice. The cathedral glittered with gold and jewels beneath the light of countless candles. Majesty was present, both in symbol and in reality, at the moment when its representative was thus acclaimed. I know, said the Duc de Quayet, that I have never felt such enthusiasm. I was astonished to find tears in my eyes. The Queen was so overcome with pleasure that her tears flowed in torrents. Marie Antoinette tells of this day in a letter to her mother, in which she speaks of her emotion and of the enthusiasm of their subjects, both great and small, at the sublime moment when Louis the Sixteenth ascended the throne of his ancestors. End of section 23section twenty four of the eighteenth century by kashimir Shtrienska, translated by henry neville dickinson this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter seventeen the queen's surroundings seventeen seventy five to seventeen seventy six part one the queen tried to bring choiseul back into power at the time of the coronation she congratulated herself on having obtained permission from the king to interview the ex-minister as she confided to the comte de rosenberg you will perhaps have heard of the audience i granted choiseul at rheims it was so much talked about that i do not doubt that old morpa was afraid to go home and rest you will of course guess that i did not see him without speaking to the king about it first but you cannot imagine what skill i employed so as not to appear to be asking permission. I told him that I wished to see Monsieur de Choiseul, and that I could not think which day would be most convenient. I was so successful that the poor man himself arranged the most convenient time for the interview. I think I used a woman's power at that moment. This celebrated letter came into the hands of Maria Theresa, who sent a copy of it to Merci with this comment, What a style! what an attitude of mind this only confirms my anxiety she my daughter is running straight to ruin and she will be lucky in her downfall if she is able to keep the virtues proper to her rank if choiseul becomes minister she is lost he will take less heed of her than of pompadour to whom he owed everything marie antoinette's brother the emperor joseph the second sent her so violent a rebuke on this subject that Maria Theresa had it stopped, but the document has been preserved. His bitter reproaches refer to facts which must be noted. It was decided that the Duc de la Vrière was to retire. This minister, an object of general contempt, was only supported by his sister, the Comtesse de Morpa. He was the last representative of the court of Louis the Fifteenth 
and had been in office for fifty-five years. The Queen had pressed Louis to send him away, since she wished to put Sartine in his place, but much to her displeasure, Malzerbe, a friend of Turgot, was made governor of the king's household. The queen, however, was satisfied on other points. At her instigation, the Duc d'Aiguillon was definitely exiled to Gascony. This departure was entirely my work, she wrote to Rosenberg. The measure was full to overflowing. This dreadful man indulged in all sorts of espionage and evil talk. She extricated the Comte de Guine, a protege of Choiseul, who was French ambassador in London, from a grave scandal. Guine was accused of using state secrets in order to gamble on the stock exchange and of disowning his creditors to avoid paying his debts. To clear himself, he asked to be allowed to insert in his defense certain passages from his official correspondence. Vergen and all the ministers opposed this demand saying that if they were to allow it, no foreign minister would ever dare make confidential communications to the government. But the Queen supported Guin against Desguillons, who desired his ruin. In spite of the vote of the Council, the King yielded to repeated requests, and gave the ambassador the permission he desired. Here, as on more serious occasions, Louis allowed himself to be led. He was sometimes obstinate, but never strong-willed. Guine won his case, which was tried by the Parliament in June of 1775. The Queen gained another victory by reviving the extravagant post of superintendent of her household in favour of the Princesse de Lamballe, just when Turgot was finding extreme difficulty in restoring order to the finances. The public grumbled, all these intrigues exaggerated and willfully misconstrued greatly alarmed the emperor. Consequently, Joseph resorted to threats. Why do you interfere, my dear sister, he wrote, dismissing ministers, sending one back to his estates, giving office to this or that one, helping another to win his case and creating a new expensive post at your court? Have you ever asked yourself, by what right you thus intervene in the affairs of the French government and monarchy? You, a charming young girl thinking only of frivolity, your toilet and your amusements all the day long, who do not read or listen to sense for one quarter of an hour in a month, who I am sure neither reflect nor meditate nor try to weigh the consequence of what you do or say. The impulse of the moment is the only reason for your actions. The statements and arguments of your favorites win your credence and are your only guides. The emperor in this respect touched the true source of the evil. People took advantage of the queen, her inexperience, her kindness, and her desire to please. The question of persons was the primary consideration in all the intrigues in which Marie Antoinette imprudently took part. She thus established a party at court which used her as its tool. A secret ministry, whose only principle was to secure places, sinecures, and reversions to the detriment of those who might have been of use to the state. Marie Antoinette should never have allowed herself to play so dangerous a part. Marie Antoinette's position as queen was, until 1778, as difficult as it had been as Dauphiness, and for the same reasons. The king, as always, was shy and undemonstrative. Merci complains that Marie Antoinette formed too poor an idea of the character and moral powers of her husband, but she was really an excellent judge. Tired of his coldness, she tried to spend her youth agreeably and to seek distractions. The husband and wife really only agreed on the subject of ceremony. They both did their best to avoid it. Except for this single affinity, their tastes were opposite. The queen loved dress and social pleasures which she could enjoy with her intimates, cards and amusements which were not spoiled by careful preparation. She spent happy days far from the court, at the Trianon, which had been a gift to her on the accession, she imagined herself a private individual whose mission it was to receive her friends, 
to do the honours to them and to prepare charming and rustic surprises for their entertainment she forgot that she had royal duties also an error which her husband encouraged she was pleasant and gracious with all the dignity of a queen louis was brusque and awkward his natural clumsiness had caused his grandfather considerable disappointment marie antoinette sat up far into the night and got up late the king worked with his ministers but the pastimes which appealed to him were hunting and manual labour tired out by violent exercise he became silent and taciturn and by no means an evening man they both tried to hide their little weaknesses louis was rather ashamed of his locksmith's work and marie antoinette of her passion for gambling sometimes she would put the clock forward so as to hasten the time when the sleepy king would go to bed and the faro table could be brought out she secretly bought diamonds not satisfied with the jewels with which she was already loaded her mother reproved her for it and told her her freshness was her chief ornament but her taste for jewels was irresistible and later it will be seen that her adversaries turned it into a deadly weapon against her such was their daily life nevertheless louis was captivated by his wife he loved her as much as he was capable of loving any one but according to merci he feared as much as he loved her maria theresa deeply regretted the situation at versailles the king's kindness to her the queen on every occasion ought to make her respond with a perfect return by giving up her dissipated life which is so opposed to the king's character and tastes i see with regret that although your remonstrances and those of abbe vermont the queen's reader make some impression on my daughter they are soon effaced by the suggestions of those around her and her own thoughtlessness louis as king had no more influence than he had had as dauphin nor were his brothers in better case the comte de provence was gracious learned and clever but he was also conceited and crafty and the queen had been warned against this court tartuffe in the depths of his heart he congratulated himself that there was no heir to the crown and he built his hopes for the future on this circumstance he was no more innocent than were his aunts of the scandal which was talked about the queen the comte d'artois was feather-brained and brilliant and thus agreed better with his sister-in-law whose tastes partook of the frivolity natural to her age the future charles x at this time but lately married was far from serious and only thought of amusing himself in a princely fashion throwing money away and satisfying his most extravagant whims while scarcely attempting to pay his creditors he was the enfant terrible of the family sure of herself marie antoinette had an instinctive hatred for vice as she had proved on her first arrival while louis the fifteenth was still living but she thoughtlessly allowed herself to be led by her brother-in-law into unfortunate amusements the balls at the opera and the little theatres and although all that could be said against this was that the king took no part in it even that was too much the wives of the two princes were of the house of savoy and were very jealous of their sister-in-law's charm they held themselves aloof their italian character was not trusted the queen who longed to assure the dynastic succession was naturally envious of the comtesse d'artois happy in the possession of sons and she suffered a good deal in consequence mesdames the royal aunts had little heads and it was impossible to put anything reasonable into them they did not love marie antoinette because her marriage was choiseul's work they had wanted a princess of saxony for the dauphin their advice met with no attention and tired of useless intrigue mesdames went into a retreat whence they only appeared on rare occasions to make disagreeable remarks which were of no effect the real intimates of marie antoinette were found elsewhere the queen had made certain ladies her friends and confidantes 
sometimes with little consideration, as might be expected from a girl only twenty years old. Her chief desire was to escape the moral solitude which overcame her even in the midst of pleasures and fetes. Her graciousness, which was even more marked than her beauty, made her seek and evoke the sympathy which she could not find in her family circle. She chose her friends because they were charming and attached them to her because they were unhappy. She wished to make them happy, but unfortunately in so doing she worked her own ruin. The Princesse de Lamballe, her first friend, was a Carignan and cousin to Madame and the Comtesse d'Artois. She married in 1767 the Prince de Lamballe, son of the Duc de Pontievre and a princess of Modena, but she was abandoned by her husband after five months and became a widow in 1768. She had a position at court when the Dauphine came to France. Marie Antoinette made friends with this lovable creature, with the melancholy, delicate face and the childlike air. A poet represents her as embodying the three graces and adds, Il n'est qu'un point où vous et vos modèles, douce beauté, ne vous ressemblez pas. La volupté marche toujours près d'elle. C'est la vertu qui conduit vos pas. There is only one point in which you and your models, gentle beauty, are unlike. Voluptuousness walks away near them. It is virtue that guides your steps. When she became queen, Marie Antoinette wanted to create a post for Madame Lamballe. She soon excited the jealousy of her ladies-in-waiting when they heard that the young widow was to be made superintendent of her household. Her father-in-law, aided by Maurepas, who wished to gain the queen's favor, carried this affair through and obtained for the lady a salary of fifty thousand crowns, although originally it had only been intended to make it a third of that amount, fifty thousand livres. The Duc de Pontievre, who was a champion of etiquette and had an eye to the main chance, insisted that the privileges of the post should be the same as they were for Mademoiselle de Clermont, superintendent to Marie Lestenska, and last holder of the position which had been suppressed in 1740. Louis and Turgot yielded in October 1775 to the Queen's great joy. She had confided her hopes to Rosenberg. The Maréchal de Mouchy is going to leave, so they say. I do not know whom I shall have in her place, but I shall ask the king to take advantage of the changes to make Madame de Lamballe superintendent. Judge of my happiness. I shall make my great friend happy, and I shall have even more pleasure from this than will she. When we remember the sums expended by Marie de Medici on the Marchal d'Ancre, the astounding liberality of Louis the Fourteenth to Madame de Montespan and her descendants, and to Madame de Fontange, who had a stipend of three hundred thousand livres a month, Marie Antoinette seems moderate in the exercise of her power. The revenues of France amounted to two hundred million livres. It does not seem unpardonable to have revived the post of superintendent, especially as the motive was goodness of heart and not vanity. But the court never made the slightest allowances for any of the queen's actions. There were, however, other instances of the queen's liberality which laid themselves more open to the bitter attacks made against them. It was surely unnecessary to expend six hundred louis in paying the debts of the Comte d'Esterhazy, an Austrian by birth, who was domiciled in Paris. It was equally unnecessary to grant a widow's pension to the Comtesse de la Marche, when that lady was only separated from her husband, and to give the Prince Eugène de Carignan, Madame de Lamballe's brother, a yearly salary of thirty thousand livres and the command of an infantry regiment, especially since it caused complaints among the French officers. Not content with the favor which had been conferred on her, the Princesse de Lamballe continued to make requests and finally tired even the Queen. She aroused protests from all quarters and was soon the center of quarrels and dissensions. She complained to the Queen, who was irritated, and said she was badly served. The Princesse de Lamballe, who is nearly always wrong, wrote Merci, is gradually losing ground with the Queen, 
and I see the moment coming when Her Majesty will be filled with regret and find herself embarrassed at having re-established a useless post in her household. Even before the appointment of the Princesse de Lamballe had been signed, Marie Antoinette had found a new friend for whom she conceived a great affection, an event which brought jealousy into the field. This friend was Gabrielle Yolande de Polestan, Comtesse Jules de Polignac. The family to which she had allied herself was much impoverished, but had counted among its representatives a celebrated cardinal who had been a faithful servant of the House of France and the Catholic cause. The Comtesse, of whom there is a pleasing portrait by Madame Vigée Lebrun, was a charming woman. She had, said the Duc de Lévy, the kind of head in which Raphael could combine intelligent expression with infinite gentleness. Others might excite more surprise or admiration, but one could never tire of looking at her. In our modern eyes, Raphael's heads, though they are full of sweetness, perhaps lack intelligence of expression. The Comte de Lamarque says practically the same thing as the Duc de Lévy, and adds, never did anyone's demeanor express more modesty, reserve, and propriety than did hers. The Queen had noticed Madame de Polignac at one of the summer balls about June 1775, and a close intimacy had sprung up between the two young women. When I am with her, said Marie Antoinette, I am no longer a queen, I am myself. Henry IV had said practically the same thing. This intimacy, which lasted more than fifteen years, had greater influence than anything else on the Queen's future. Madame de Polignac had neither the wit, judgment, nor character to justify the speed with which she won the position of confidant to the exclusion of all others at the court. Yet she was the depository of all the thoughts of Marie Antoinette. The Austrian ambassador was alarmed and foresaw the worst consequences from this boundless confidence. Political aspirants did not neglect this open door, the queen was at the mercy of innumerable intriguers. The superintendent had the support of the Comte d'Artois, the Duc de Chartres, the future Philippe Égalité, and all those who composed the disaffected society of the Palais Royal. Madame de Polignac's partisans were the Baron de Besenval, an indiscreet friend of the queen, a man of wit who loved intrigue for intrigue's sake, even though it brought him nothing and with him ambitious members of the Jeunesse Dorée, the Comte d'Ademar, a pleasant singer, an excellent actor, a composer of elegant couplets, and Vaudreuil, the most important man of the group behind whom Choiseul was concealed. This brilliant society met together at the house of the Princesse de Guémenet. The latter was a daughter of the Maréchal de Soubise, and was later to become the governess of the children of France until her husband's failure caused her downfall. Outwardly, these evenings were easy social functions, but those present did not hesitate to interfere in affairs of state, to give the queen interested advice, and in short, to exploit her. They spoke with absolute freedom of all that was happening at court. They ridiculed those they wished to injure, laid traps for them, and practiced every form of intrigue, both small and great. It was at one of these evenings that Morpa introduced himself to Madame de Polignac and told her of his desire to become prime minister, hoping that she would repeat his remarks to the queen. Morpa, who was always seeking his own advancement, was ready to sacrifice everything, even his most trustworthy colleagues, to his own ambition. The three leaders of this party, Besenval, Ademar, and Vaudreuil, had been severely criticized by Lamarck. None of them, he said, had any depth of judgment or exalted views. They were people who were skilled in the artifices of the court and nothing more. They did not possess that power of observation which enables its possessor to grasp the events that are likely to have an important bearing on the future. This Polignac society was harmful not only to Marie Antoinette, but to the interests of the monarchy itself. The wit, gaiety, distinction, and cleverness of the trio was deceptive, and cleverer people than the Queen might have been misled by them. Vaudreuil, in particular, gained a complete ascendancy over Madame de Polignac, 
and found opportunity to satisfy his greed for favours. The fair Comtesse was very susceptible to the handsome face and agreeable manners of Vaudreuil. To find an excuse for the scandal that began to be whispered, she declared that she was above prejudices. Her attitude toward religion was as doubtful as her moral standard. La Sonne, the doctor, said one day to the Abbe de Vermont that he feared this intimacy might in the end affect the piety of the queen. At first, Madame de Polignac asked nothing for herself, though later she had her reward and became a duchess. But her relatives, one after another, were benefited by reversions and offices to the great disgust of those whose rank led them to count on reaping some of the harvest. The Rouen, Tessé, Noailles, Montmorency, and Sivrac felt themselves aggrieved. In a few years, the Polignac had an income of nearly 500,000 livres. Two examples will suffice. Comte Jules de Polignac's father was well known for his stupidity, yet he was given the Swiss embassy because it was lucrative and got him away from court, where his presence embarrassed his children. The Comtesse Diane de Polignac, sister of Comte Jules, was made lady-in-waiting to Madame Elizabeth, although the freedom of her conduct was likely to cause scandals. End of section 24《セクション25of the 18th Century》by Kashi Mirstrienska, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 17: The Queen's Surroundings, 1775 to 1776, Part 2. The Queen's intimacy with her friend had the effect of increasing her aversion from ceremony and this caused new subjects for complaint. It was said that the court only existed for a small and exclusive circle, that it was like a private house, where sympathy alone assured a favorable reception. A queen of France owes herself to her subjects. She is bound to keep up the traditions, said the most indulgent of Marie Antoinette's enemies. The most audacious songs, calumnies, and satires fell like rain on Paris, the provinces, and foreign countries. That the queen did not spare her husband as a subject for her wit was well known. Some of the satires touched on this. La reine dit imprudemment à Besenval son confident, mon mari est un pauvre sire. L'autre répond d'un ton léger, chacun le pense sans le dire, vous le dites sans y penser. The queen said imprudently to her confidant, Bezonval, My husband is a poor fellow. The other answered lightly, Everyone thinks so without saying it. You say it without thinking. Lamarque, who knew the court intimately and always spoke of the queen with respect, deplored this tendency, though he tried to palliate it. It was, he said, a mistake for a person in her position, since those around her knew her weakness and sought to amuse her at the expense of others. There came a time when she knew how she had been deceived and at last gave up Madame de Polignac. When people expressed astonishment at seeing her seek refuge amongst foreigners, she said, You are right, but at least they do not ask me for anything. She lived as in a dream with absolute unconsciousness and refused to believe the warnings of her mother or her fears for the future. Yet in the midst of her life of diversions, she must have found little amusement. In her fear of ennui, she made continual efforts to avert it, but with small success. Her brother, Joseph II, in other respects too hard a critic, at least understood the psychology of Marie Antoinette on this point. He wrote to Merci with reference to her mania for gambling, which caused Fontainebleau to be compared to Spa, her craving for pleasure and her anxiety to find those who can procure it for her, happy, contented people, is the only cause of these disorders. For at heart, my sister does not like gambling. All Marie Antoinette received from her circle was the basest ingratitude. The king, the only person who was really faithful to her, by his indulgence and loving weakness, encouraged her tastes and extravagance. 
Louis by degrees awoke from his torpor and fell a victim to her charm. But he did not rightly understand his duties. He admired the queen in passive silence. The niceties of this situation formed the main problem of the royal household, as Marie Antoinette shows in a confidential letter. If I needed a vindication, she wrote to the Comte de Rosenberg, I could safely rely on you. As a matter of fact, I am ready to admit more than you would allow. For instance, my pursuits are not the same as the king's, for his are only hunting and mechanical pursuits. You will agree that I should scarcely look my best at a forge. I would not be Vulcan, and the part of Venus would displease him far more than my present tastes, of which he does not disapprove. Marie Antoinette needed firm guidance. All she found was a husband anxious to please her and abashed before the attractions of her triumphant youth. Another foreigner, Horace Walpole, gives us an idea of her irresistible charm. His words are well known and are the more valuable in that they are disinterested. It was impossible to see anything but the queen. Hebes and Floras and Helens and Graces are streetwalkers to her. She is a statue of beauty when standing or sitting, grace itself when she moves. They say she does not dance in time, but if so, it is certainly the time which is at fault. This is how Marie Antoinette appeared at a ball given on August 22, 1775, on the occasion of the marriage of her sister-in-law, Madame Clotilde, to the Prince of Piedmont. A second portrait by a Frenchman, this time the Comte de Tilly, is less enthusiastic, yet it gives an impression of the same charm. The Queen was then, about 1777, at her best. I have often heard her beauty spoken of, and I confess I have never absolutely shared that opinion. But she had that which is more valuable than perfect beauty on the throne, the look of a queen of France. Even at moments when she tried most to seem nothing but a pretty woman. She had two kinds of walk, the one firm, slightly hurried, but always noble, the other softer and more rhythmical, almost languorous, yet never encouraging people to forget their respect. Never have curtsies been made with such grace. At a single inclination she greeted ten people, yet with head and glance she gave to each his due. In short, if I am not deceived, just as one offers a chair to other women, so one would almost always have wished to bring her a throne. It is a pleasure to quote so delightful an account more especially since it bears the stamp of truth. In going on to speak of the Queen's character, Tilly brings us back to our subject and illustrates it in convincing terms. He laments the disgust Marie Antoinette showed for the forms surrounding royalty, which are more necessary in France than in any place I know, and her incurable prejudice, though in general her nature was uncertain and hesitating, for or against those who were pointed out for her favors or her hatred, or whom she had herself classified, as she often did, without any reflection. The critic especially refers to the dismissal of Tuago, the gravest fault of the early days of the reign and the work of the queen's intimates. Tuago was marked out as a victim to be sacrificed to the extravagance and intrigues of the court, a combination formed of the Polignacs, the Duchesse de Gramont, Choiseul's sister, and the Duc de Douagny, had no difficulty in persuading Marie Antoinette and even the king that the minister had become the most unpopular of all controllers general. Turgot was a man of the strictest integrity, but he was too abrupt and unbending. He imposed his principles without a trace of compromise, and it has been said of him in contrast to Thérèse, he did the right thing in the wrong way while the abbé did the wrong thing in the right way. Senac de Meillon exaggerates in his effort to make himself clear, but there is a certain amount of truth in the following judgment. He did not know how to make allowances for the weakness of men, still less for their vices. Monsieur Turgot acted like a surgeon operating on a corpse, and forgot that he was operating on living beings. Turgot was a convinced royalist, and he was perhaps the only minister who could have saved the monarchy, as is proved by the consequences of his retirement. 
some of those who followed him, men devoid both of talent and probity, showed the extent of the loss that France had suffered. A month before the controller's disgrace, Louis had said, Only Monsieur Turgot and I love the people. Turgot's schemes were soon abandoned, but among them were some of the reforms which the revolution claimed as its own. For instance, he proposed the abolition of the corvée to be replaced by a tax paid by all proprietors, whether privileged or not, the suppression of wardens, freedoms, and guilds, which superficial observers at that time saw only as hindrances to commerce and industry, without understanding the profound reasons for which centuries of experience had imposed them on Western Europe. These proposals increased the number of Turgot's enemies. Courtiers, financiers, parliamentarians, and high dignitaries of the church were all jealous of their prerogatives, and there was now also a bourgeoise aristocracy which swelled the ranks of those who were interested in preserving the traditional forms of society. A great lady summed up the whole question, saying, Why make innovations? Is not all well with us? Was this remark malice or naivete? The opinion of the Parliament was similar, and it wished to suppress Turgot's edicts. Louis disregarded it, and the edicts were registered by order on March 13, 1776. But the controller's isolation became more pronounced. His enemies were uniting, and they even went so far as to forge letters purporting to come from Turgot, and containing sarcasms against the Queen, and jests and offensive words about the King. All this correspondence, said Dupont of Nemur, was brought to Louis the Sixteenth. He communicated it to Maurepas, who, one may well suppose, failed to express any strong doubts as to its authenticity. Other letters were also intercepted, whether genuine or not, in which the most violent accusations were made against the Controller General. His dismissal was decided. Tormented by her intimates, who used as their weapon Turgot's recall of the Comte de Guine from his embassy, the Queen yielded and obtained the desired orders from the King. Louis, compromised by his contradictions, in the end listened to his wife. Merci, who saw more clearly, declared that her influence would one day draw upon the Queen the just reproaches of the King, her husband, and even of all the nation. These prophetic words alarmed Maria Theresa, but the Empress understated her terror in writing to her daughter for fear of revealing the confidences of Merci. The public, she wrote, no longer speaks of you with the same enthusiasm. It thinks you occupied with small conspiracies unworthy of your position. Marie Antoinette replied, My conduct and my intentions are well known, and they are far removed from conspiracy and intrigue. There may be people who are disturbed about what is said between the king and myself, but I will not renounce the confidence which rightly exists between my husband and myself to satisfy them. Moreover, I trust that the general opinion is not so opposed to me as someone has informed my dear mother. Marie Antoinette denied having had any share in Turgot's dismissal. She dissimulated, blindly following the advice of her intimates. She was beginning to use subterfuges in order to give a false color to her actions, as Maria Theresa wrote to Merci. Turgot quitted his ministry with dignity. In a letter to the king, he said, My greatest hope is that you may come to know that I am wrong, and that I have warned you of chimerical dangers. I trust that time may not justify me. Malzerbe, who supported Turgot's principles and wished with him to reform the extravagance of the court, was obliged to send in his resignation. The same combination overthrew both the reforming ministers who had come before their time. As Walpole said, since their plans tend to serve the public, you may be sure they do not please interested individuals. Designing persons who have no weapon but ridicule to use against good men already employ it to make a trifling nation laugh at its benefactors, and if it is the fashion to laugh, the laws of fashion will be executed preferably to those of common sense. According to the President de Bachemont, Louis said to Malzerbe on the day of his departure, May 12, 1776, 
how fortunate you are would that i could retire the comte de mouy died on october tenth seventeen seventy five and the department of war was entrusted to the comte de saint germain a gifted officer though of an advanced age who had performed most of his service abroad in austria bavaria and denmark his appointment astonished every one since he was little known maurepas had brought him from retirement in alsace as minister he was allowed to issue decree after decree he suppressed a part of the king's military household and increased the army by forty thousand men without extra cost to the treasury he prohibited luxury in gaming attacked the sale of offices and made the famous strokes with the flat of the sword a substitute for imprisonment for light offences this last innovation was considered an insult and a soldier said strike with the point it hurts less saint germain remained in power after turgot's fall until september seventeen seventy seven then he became very unpopular and yielded his post to his assistant m de montbarret amelo succeeded malzerbe maurepas who made light of everything prepared the way for the new arrival by saying they must be tired of men of genius let us see if they will like a fool better amelo was faithful to his reputation cluny who became controller general died a few months later but he had time to re-establish the corvee and the wardens and to institute a public lottery his successor was one of the conspicuous personalities of the reign necker the country was in the throes of a crisis brought about by shallow intrigues the queen's youth the king's lack of energy maurepas levity were so many playthings for the courtiers who were anxious for change and eager to clear the way for their own advancement the duc de Coyer said the young king who did not shine in bearing or manner was always good-natured well-intentioned and clear-sighted but he feared the embarrassment of making a choice or a decision always a difficult thing so that he avoided inquiry or discussion with any one except on rare occasions with m de maurepas whose good nature did not incline him towards argument the queen was always pleasure-seeking she did nothing but run about to the shows in paris the balls at the opera and at versailles and always in a flutter hoping to escape boredom by perpetual motion at this time the comtesse de la marque wrote to gustavus the third king of sweden everything here is as god wills good sense sound judgment a regard whether for public or private interests are unknown a king who wishes to do good but has neither the power nor the ability to compass it a minister maurepas who was unstable and weak at forty and is further enervated by age who does the strangest things and makes light of public opinion the queen goes continually to paris incurs debts invites lawsuits decks herself in feathers and fripperies and laughs at everything the monarchy was waning it sought assistance from necker a foreigner the queen needed advice and the emperor came to give it her but it was already too late End of section twenty five Section 26 of the 18th Century by Kashimir Strienska, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 18 The Emperor's Visit, 1777. Necker was the real successor of Turgot. He came from Geneva, from a school of skilled and honest bankers. He commenced his career in Paris in the house of a compatriot, bringing with him the solemn formal spirit which flourished on the banks of Lake Le Mans, though it was modified and softened by his desire to attain a high position. He was greatly assisted by his wife Suzanne Courchot, a Protestant minister's daughter whom Gibbon had wanted to marry. Since 1765, Madame Necker had had a salon at which men of letters aspiring to the academy appeared side by side with great nobles and most of the foreign diplomats she shone more by her intelligence than by her grace the baron d'auberkirch said of her that god when creating her 
dipped her in a bucket of starch. She remained of Odoise in the heart of Paris, and always had a trace of the provincial. Madame de Stal, to whom she bequeathed her wit, though not her beauty, similarly failed to become absolutely French. But Madame Necker at least commanded respect by her virtue. One might say of her what Madame de Defon said of the Duchesse de Choiseul, another virtuous woman. She wished to be perfect, it was her only fault, and the only one she could have. If Madame Necker was not the woman she hoped to be, she at least set a fine example of philanthropy by the foundation of her hospital, with which she occupied ten years of her life. One of the innovations introduced in this hospital was that they nursed the sick in single beds, with every attention of tenderness and humanity, and without exceeding a fixed fee. The foregoing extract from a contemporary report testifies to the greatness of the service rendered by this worthy deaconess. Necker at first mixed unobtrusively with the society with which his wife liked to surround herself. He adopted the attitude of a spectator. On occasions, however, he jested and called attention to some eccentricity or humorous incident. He lacked an essentially French characteristic, as Madame de Defon observed to Walpole, which consists in a certain ability to bring out the intelligence of those with whom one speaks. He gives no assistance to the development of one's thoughts, and one is consequently more stupid with him than when by oneself or with others. According to Marmontel, except for a few subtle phrases dropped here and there, he left his wife to maintain and enliven the conversation. When Necker married Mademoiselle Courchot, the following remark was made, They will be so bored with one another that it will give them an occupation. However, they did not bore one another, rather did they bore others by their adoration and the incense they burnt to one another. Although Necker was not anxious to speak, he could write. As soon as his fortune was made, he left the bank, and in 1773 published an Eloge de Colbert, which was crowned by the French Academy. He then got himself appointed representative of the Genevan Republic at the court of Versailles, and thus received congratulations for two honors at once. In his Eloge he made use of Colbert to paint a portrait of an ideal finance minister, such as Colbert perhaps was, and such especially as M. Necker aspired to become, as Saint Beuve maliciously observes. Two years later appeared his work Sur la législation de la commerce des blés, on legislation and the corn trade, an attack on the theories and even the character of Turgot. In Necker's opinion, an administrator ought to have a suave and pliant mind, an ardent soul, and a calm judgment. He was obviously thinking of himself. Necker delighted in compliments. He used to fish for compliments, to use the picturesque English expression. He was vainglorious, and in his effort to excite flattering comparisons, his public acts were tainted with charlatanism. Thus, at the time of his first loan, as it was fully subscribed in advance, he need not have made the public come to the royal treasury only to see an imposing guard. But it is only fair to say with Droz that his pride made him glory above all in services rendered to the state. If Turgot thought too much of theory, Necker was purely practical and had no abstract ideas. His work on the corn trade proves this. The future minister did not pronounce for or against freedom in this trade, but he said enough to injure his predecessor's reputation. He came to no conclusions, and his policy was rather destructive than constructive. His style was pompous, verbose, and not easy to understand. Society called his work a breakneck, casse-cou treatise, and Voltaire with some malice said, Great application was necessary to understand Necker, and deep knowledge to answer him. Turgot might have taken the able financier's advice with advantage, but a great gulf separated the two men in spite of their ardent desire for the public welfare. The quarrels of their friends never ceased to embitter them, 
and make them antagonistic to one another. At Cluny's death in October 1776, the king applied to Necker, believing that he had found a savior. There was a difficulty to overcome in the fact that Necker was a Protestant. Louis, to his honor be it said, was inspired by that spirit of toleration which his father, the Dauphin, and Turgot had shown. He made Tabarot de Roe controller of finance and gave the direction of this department to the Genevan banker, though without a voice in the council of ministers. A bishop called attention to the fact that the laws of the kingdom excluded Protestants from all official positions. We will give him up for your sake, said Morpa, if the clergy will pay the national debts. When Necker demanded the suppression of six intendants of finance, Tabarro sent in his resignation, his objection being that he did not wish to injure men whom he esteemed. Necker became director general on June 29, 1777, and remained in power for five years until May 19, 1781. As he was rich, he refused the salary attached to his office, a self-denial which made him very popular. But the flattery which was lavished upon him turned his head, and prevented him from seeing how serious were the times. He was no statesman. One of his colleagues, the Comte de Vergennes, a man of considerable ability, showed he had more grasp of the situation than Necker when he said in a confidential communication to Louis, There is no longer clergy, nobility, or third estate in France. The distinction is fictitious, purely representative, and without any real significance. The monarch speaks, all the rest are the people, and all obey. One of the director's first actions was to have recourse to a loan, which was justified by rumors of an approaching war with England, then at war with her American colonies. This financial coup was a triumph for Necker. Nevertheless, he was criticized for not having given any guarantee to the lenders, nor introduced taxes to consolidate the loans. He answered that he was procuring the money at a lower rate of interest than ever before, and that this economic difference allowed him to ensure the satisfaction of all the liabilities he had contracted. Such a guarantee from an embarrassed treasury was somewhat illusory. In 1777, the successive loans amounted to 148 million livres, and in the same year, Necker resolved to reduce the number of posts in the Department of Finance, in spite of the opposition of the holders of these offices who defended themselves like devils. He established a commission with the object of reforming the hospitals, creating government pawnshops, mont de piete, to compete with the money lenders and pawnbrokers, who were very numerous among the office holders. An opposition was formed against him. It is because he interferes with the interests of the rich and powerful that he meets with continual obstacles, it was said. If he had attacked the poor only, all would go as he wishes. Nonetheless, he had more supporters than adversaries. When the Emperor Joseph II came to France at this period, he had an interview with the celebrated director and formed the most favorable idea of his intellect and of his character, about which there is only one opinion. This visit of the Queen's brother takes an important place in the history of 1777. Joseph II traveled incognito under the name of the Count of Falkenstein. He took care to keep strictly to his role, and whether he was in Paris or Versailles would only stay at an hotel. He endeavored to escape the ovations inevitably showered on a prince whose liberal ideas and horror of prejudice were well known. Another brother of Marie Antoinette, the Archduke Maximilian, had visited Versailles in 1775, but had not been a success. When Buffon offered him his works, he said, Sir, I should be very sorry to deprive you of them. He was very young. This foolish speech was duly retailed by the Queen's enemies. There were other grounds of complaint against Maximilian, because under the assumed name of the Count of Burgau, he had insisted that the Duc d'Orléans and de Chartres and the Prince de Condé and de Conti should visit him first. The princes of the blood refused and retired to their estates during the Archduke's visit. 
but the visit of Joseph II, who was very popular, caused these unfortunate impressions to be forgotten. He saw Buffon and asked him for the books which his young brother had forgotten, thus redeeming his brother's folly by his wit. The emperor was a grandson by marriage of Louis XV. He had lost his wife, the Infanta Isabella, daughter of Don Philip, Duke of Parma, and of Louise Elizabeth of France. It was thought that he had come to marry his wife's first cousin, Madame Elizabeth, sister of Louis XVI. But he did not succumb to the charms of the princess, who later paid so dearly for her devotion to the king, Marie Antoinette, and their children. For some time Joseph had renounced marriage, as much from an affected austerity as from natural coldness. In 1772 he wrote to his brother Leopold, As for me, I am becoming rapidly less gallant, and once more I am moping like an owl. The company of women becomes insupportable to a reasonable man after a time, and I may say that often the smartest and wittiest remarks turn my stomach. We have already seen something of his contempt for women in the famous intercepted letter, and we shall find it again in his conversations with the Queen. Marie Antoinette had reason to be disturbed by the imperial visit. It was said that Joseph had a political object, that he had come to ask Vergennes to abandon Turkey and to consent to divide that kingdom between France, Russia, and Austria. But the emperor's real object was to introduce harmony in the royal household. The choice of the mentor was not a happy one. The queen refused to be governed and showed herself stubborn when anyone tried to treat her with severity. Maria Theresa, as Marie Antoinette herself, once owned to Merci, might say anything to her. From my mother, she said, I will take everything with respect. But as for my brother, I shall know how to answer him. The queen's intimates had much to do with these declarations of revolt. The Austrian ambassador told Maria Theresa that Marie Antoinette had been prejudiced against her brother. People had contrived, he said, to fill her mind with fears and suspicions, and to prevent her from having any confidence in His Majesty the Emperor. Joseph caused some offence by his rather caustic remarks. He thought it extraordinary that the king and queen did not know Paris better. The following conversation took place between Louis and his guest. You possess the most beautiful buildings in Europe. What is that? Les Invalides. So they say. What? Have you never visited the building? Ma foi, no. Nor have I, said the queen. Ah, said Joseph, smiling. I am not surprised in your case, sister. You are too busy. Another time Marie Antoinette asked her brother to admire one of the enormous structures of hair, feathers, ribbons, and flowers which was then in fashion, and were called poufs au sentiment. Is not my hair charmingly arranged? she asked. Yes. But that yes is very curt. Does not the style suit me? Ma foi, if you wish me to speak frankly, madame, I think it is very light to bear a crown. Thus far his criticisms were just, and had been made with some wit. But he exceeded all bounds when he advised the king to make a visit to some part of his kingdom, and told the queen not to accompany her husband, because she would be useless. This insult was followed by others even more violent. Joseph objected to the queen's free and easy manner with her husband, to her disrespectful language and her want of submission. There were continual misunderstandings and serious quarrels between brother and sister. Marie Antoinette displeased Joseph by defending Choiseul, for she remained constant to the ex-minister, readily listening to her friends, the Duc de Coigny and the Comte Esterhazy, both devoted to the exile of Chanteloup. Merci records another scene between the Queen and the Emperor. They went together to the Théâtre of Versailles. When they were returning, the Queen spoke of going to the Italian theatre in Paris the next day. The Emperor observed that it was a fast day, that the King did not dine, and that it would be wrong to make him wait too long for his supper. The Emperor also added other reasons which displeased the Queen, 
because they were given in the presence of two of the ladies of the palace. On their return to the chateau, the queen quarrelled with the emperor in the presence of the Comtesse de Polignac. Merci took it upon himself to ask Joseph to be less harsh, and after that the quarrels came to an end. But the impression remained. Neither the king nor the queen was pleased. Louis was jealous of the popularity of Joseph, his affability, education, and his desire to see and understand new things. Marie Antoinette retained some ill feeling against her harsh mentor. The empress had foreseen the result of this visit, and before it took place, she said to Merci, I am hardly counting upon the good effect of this journey. If I am not mistaken, one of two things will result from it. Either my daughter will win the emperor by her affection and charm, or he will irritate her by trying continually to teach her. In either case, we cannot hope for a happy result from the presence of the emperor. Maria Theresa had expressed strong hopes that her son would not go to France. Joseph's criticism of the court are interesting. According to the chancelleries, he declared, I have three miserable brothers-in-law. The one at Versailles is an imbecile, the one at Naples a madman, and the one at Parma an idiot. All the same, the emperor wrote on July 9th, 1777, to his brother Leopold, This man, Louis XVI, is a little weak, but not an imbecile. He has ideas and a sound judgment, but his body and mind are apathetic. He converses reasonably, but he has no wish to learn and no curiosity. In fact, the fiat lux has not yet come. The matter is still without form. The emperor liked gaiety and animation in others, and had a favorable opinion of the Comte d'Artois. Merci was afraid this might encourage the queen to submit to the influence of her young brother-in-law. Joseph was well aware that Monsieur d'Artois was a coxcomb in every sense of the word, but he was amused by him. He could not, on the other hand, get used to the extreme coldness of the Comte de Provence, and spoke of the two Piedmontese princesses in brief but unflattering terms. He was also very harsh in his criticisms when he went to a party given by the Princesse de Guémenet, and was shocked at the ill-breeding of the guests and the air of license in this lady's house. He said plainly to the Queen that it was like a house of ill fame. As for the Comtesse de Polignac, Joseph considered her too young and not sufficiently intelligent to be a useful adviser to the queen, but he treated her indulgently, realizing that it would be inadvisable to cross his sister on this point. The emperor in his turn found a not-too-gentle critic in Monsieur, who wrote to Gustavus III, He is very insidious and makes many protestations and vows of friendship. His mind is adorned by the knowledge of many useful subjects, that is what one sees at the first glance. His protestations and his open appearance hide his intent to do what is called tirer les vers du nez, extract information, and to conceal his own sentiments. But he is maladroit, for by means of a little flattery to which he is very susceptible, far from his being able to see through anyone, it is very easy to see through him, and he then throws all caution to the winds. He talks a great deal, and not in an attractive manner, but it amuses him, and he repeats his stories mercilessly. The description receives some confirmation from Maria Theresa's criticism of her son. He likes to please and to shine, and from the judgment pronounced by Frederick II, the emperor, though anxious for knowledge, had not the patience to learn. His importance makes him superficial. Joseph made enemies, especially the Choiseuls and their faction. The Duke still had some hope of returning to office, and he thought that there could be no better occasion to make an attempt than the visit of Maria Theresa's son, whom he had known at Vienna. Choiseul counted on the services he had formerly rendered to the imperial court. Everything was prepared magnificently at Chanteloup to receive the emperor, who was to cross Touraine on his way to visit the ports on the west of France. From the first days after his arrival, Joseph was expected there. He met the Duchesse de Gramont, Choiseul's sister, at Madame de Brionne's, and asked her which was the most fertile province of France. 
It is Turenne, she said. My brother has a cottage there. He would be the happiest of men if he might receive your majesty. The emperor did not answer and changed the conversation. Maria Theresa was mortified at her son's attitude. She regretted that he had disdained Choiseul, who was not the man to provoke beyond endurance, as it was uncertain whether sooner or later he would not return to power. The empress was no better pleased with her son's want of tact on another occasion. He went to Lucienne and asked to see Madame du Barry. He was charmed with her. He met her in the garden, offered her his arm, and chatted with her very agreeably for a quarter of an hour. Maria Theresa found consolation in the fact that on his return the emperor had passed without stopping at Ferney, where, as may be imagined, he was awaited with much impatience. Such are some of the incidents of Joseph's visit, but it would not be fair to omit his final expression of opinion on the subject of his sister, which to some extent atones for the severity of the criticisms mentioned above. He wrote to his brother Leopold from Brest on June ninth. She is a good and lovable woman, a little young and thoughtless, but she has a depth of goodness and virtue which, considering her position, is worthy of the utmost respect. With it all, she unites an intelligence and a soundness of perception which has often surprised me. Her first impulse is always correct. If she would follow it up, think a little more, and listen a little less to the hosts of people of all sorts who advise her, she would be perfect. Her desire for pleasure is very strong, and as her taste is known, people take advantage of this weakness, and those who provide her with the most amusement find both hearing and favor. His French style is very Germanic, but it was a true portrait, and we recognize in all respects Marie Antoinette as she is described by the most trustworthy accounts, and as it may be hoped, she has appeared in the preceding pages. Joseph left very minute written instructions to his sister. One passage from them will show the emperor's foresight. You are made to be happy, virtuous, and perfect. But it is time and more than time to reflect, to set up a rule of life, and to act upon it. You are getting older and have no longer the excuse of extreme youth. What will you become if you wait longer? an unhappy woman, and a still more unhappy princess. Acquire a reputation worthy of your virtues, your charms, and your character. But be true and firm. Yes, it is necessary to be inflexibly stubborn in the cause of right, and to oppose all seducers with courage and strength. This was excellent and wise advice, but it was difficult to follow, like all advice, and as usual was given too late. It dealt with evils that were ineradicable, and a character already formed, and no longer susceptible of modification from without. But a change was about to occur in the Queen's life which for the time being was to have more influence than all the moral lectures in the world. End of section 26《セクション27 of the 18th Century》by Kashir Mishtrienska, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 19: Birth of Madame Royale. On July 4th, 1776, the English flag floating in the ocean breezes of America was replaced by the flag with the thirteen stars and thirteen stripes which symbolized the independence of the thirteen United States. The insurgents, as they were called, found in Jefferson an able orator, in Franklin a wise counselor, and in Washington an incomparable administrator and general. They won France to their cause, for the latter had the courage to ally herself to them in the hope of avenging the disasters of the Seven Years' War. The resulting operations were one of the brighter pages in the reign of Louis the Sixteenth. The king was ably assisted by Vergennes, who took charge of the more important diplomatic negotiations, among others those with Charles the Third of Spain, who interfered by right of the family compact, and by the Marquis de Lafayette and a large staff of French officers who crossed over to the New World 
and fought bravely side by side with the American colonists. The Congress of Philadelphia sent ambassadors over to Europe to plead the American cause and to bring about a reaction against England, who refused to allow herself to be beaten. Franklin was sent to France. His pleasant manners and dignity helped to conciliate the scientists, the men of letters, the philosophers, the great nobles, the court, and the king. In February 1778, he secured the signature of a treaty with the United States, a treaty which was to become an alliance in case England should declare war on France. Each party pledged itself to conclude neither peace nor truce without the consent of the other. The independence was thus officially recognized, though even before, help had been secretly dispatched by Louis's order under the auspices of Beaumarchais, a clever man of business as well as a brilliant author. Franklin was presented at Versailles on March 20th. The handsome old man made a picturesque figure with his spectacles, his bald head, and his patriarchal appearance. People pressed about his path as though he were some strange novelty. It was not usual at the courtly ceremonies to see the homely honesty, the simple dress, and the absence of luxury characteristic of Franklin. The worthy American wore a brown coat and carried a stick in place of a sword. He was accompanied by two deputies, Silas Dean and Arthur Lee. The king was the first to speak and spoke with more graciousness than usual. Assure the Congress of my friendship, he said. I hope that this will benefit both nations. Your Majesty, replied Franklin, may count on the gratitude of the Congress and on its fidelity to its engagements. It is certain, added Virgin, that nothing could be wiser or more circumspect than the conduct of these gentlemen when they were here. The Duke de Quaye, who records these remarks, makes the following commentary. It was a treaty between nation and nation. The Congress was formally recognized, and with it, the independence, by France before all others. To what thoughts does this great event give rise? First, if successful, it was a cruel blow struck at England and highly advantageous to French commerce. Secondly, it meant an implacable war, and perhaps the creation of a country vaster than France, which might one day subdue Europe. It was, in fact, a declaration of war. Lord Stormont, his Britannic Majesty's ambassador, was recalled. The year 1778 was marked by French successes on the sea, such as the exploits of the Belle Poule against the English frigate Arethusa off Brest, and the engagement of Huisson on July 27th, where the Comte d'Orvilliers and with him Du Chaffaut, Guichon, and Le Motte Piquet distinguished themselves by their victory over Admiral Keppel. Destin, however, was beaten on the sea off Rhode Island and off Santa Lucia in August, and the English took Pondicherry in October. At the same time, another war seemed imminent in Germany over the succession of Maximilian Joseph of Bavaria, who had died on December 30, 1777. Joseph II, in his anxiety to establish ancient though shadowy claims and to increase his territories, aroused the susceptibilities of Frederick by occupying all lower Bavaria and treating it as a fief of the empire. The king of Prussia replied by putting two armies into the field and threatening to enter Bohemia. Maria Theresa, who did not approve of her son's warlike humor, believed the unhappy days of 1741 were about to recur and that she would lose Bohemia as she had lost her dear Silesia. But all that happened was a few skirmishes. There were no sieges or pitched battles. However, Austria demanded of France the 24,000 troops stipulated by the Treaty of 1756, or in default, 15 million livres. The French ministers were fully occupied with the events in America and turned a deaf ear to this appeal. Marie Antoinette received message after message from Vienna. At first she resisted, fearing that her brother might be playing his own game, but the Empress declared that the rupture of the Franco-Austrian alliance would be her death. The Queen, in great distress, took the interests of her family in hand, saying that she was serving both their countries. 
but she did not understand the exigencies of the new French policy. She failed in her efforts. The policy of Louis and Vergen remained constant and wise and was extremely creditable to them. The ambition of your relations, said the king to Marie Antoinette, will ruin all. They have begun with Poland, and now Bavaria is to be the second chapter. I am sorry for your sake. We are going to order the French ministers to inform all the courts that this dismemberment of Bavaria is being done against our wishes and that we disapprove of it. Neither the king nor his minister wavered from this line of conduct, and the queen's tears had no effect on their resolution. Both did the right thing when at the time of the Peace of Teschen, May 13, 1779, which put an end to the emperor's ambitions, they acted as mediators between Prussia and Austria. The latter only secured some insignificant portions of Bavarian territory. Thus a continental war was avoided. Vergen honorably refused the advantageous offers of Joseph, who suggested that France should provoke Prussia and Holland by occupying the Netherlands. He thus guaranteed peace on land and was able to concentrate his attention on national and profitable schemes, which he conceived and carried out in a statesmanlike manner. At this crisis, on December 20th, 1778, the Queen gave birth to a daughter, Marie-Thérèse Charlotte, Madame Royale, afterwards Duchesse d'Angoulême, and the only one of Louis XVI's family who survived the Revolution. Footnote. She lived until 1851. The crowd which invaded the young mother's chamber on the announcement of the event was so great that Marie Antoinette was almost suffocated by the human flood. The queen suddenly grew pale, her mouth was convulsed, and they thought her dead. The king himself opened the windows and ordered warm water for the bleeding, but in the press and confusion he could not get it. The surgeon lanced her foot dry, the blood spurted out, and the queen opened her eyes. Fresh disturbance was caused when they sent the people out. The princess de Lamballe was carried away fainting. The men servants and the ushers took the indiscreet sightseers by the collars and pushed them out. In the future, this cruel etiquette was abolished, and only the princes, the chancellor, and the ministers were admitted in like circumstances. When the young princess was presented to the queen, she pressed her to her heart and said to her, Poor little one, you were not wanted, but you will be none the less dear to me. A son would have belonged to the state. You will be mine. You will be all my own. You will share my happiness and soften my sorrows. The court and the town were, in fact, extremely disappointed. They had hoped for a dauphin. The projected fetes did not take place. The king placed at the queen's disposal 100,000 livres, which she used to provide dowries for poor girls, to free some that were in prison for debt, and to distribute alms to the hospitals. The town council ordered the customary popular rejoicings, illuminations, fireworks, fountains of wine, distributions of bread and saveloys, and free spectacles at the theatres. But the joy was only half-hearted. When the king and queen went to Paris on February 8, 1779, there were few cheers, and it was remarked that the main instinct of the populace was one of curiosity. An innovation was made at the birth of Madame Royale due to the fact that the return to nature and simplicity of manners as preached by Rousseau were the fashion. All signs of pomp were kept from the princess's sight at the request of Marie Antoinette herself. Maria Theresa, when she heard of this reform, condemned it. She already saw her granddaughter transformed into a peasant girl, and she clung to the claims of rank even in the cradle. It is an essential point, she wrote to Merci, especially with the French nation as ardent as it is fickle. The empress thought that the sovereign and his family should differentiate themselves from private persons by means of ceremony. However, the infant's household, though reduced, still numbered eighty persons entirely devoted to her service. The queen occupied herself with her daughter. Her life became more serious and a new era commenced. The truth of this was shown by a confession she made to Maria Theresa, six months after the birth. 
If I have done wrong, it was through childishness and lightness. But now my head is more steady, and she, the Empress, may rest assured that I fully realize my duties on this point. Besides, I owe it to the king for his tenderness, and I may be permitted to say his trust in me, on which I can only congratulate myself more and more. She spoke much of the little princess. To quote one charming instance, she wrote in March 1780, They are soon going to take her out of bed. She is big and strong. One would think her a child of two years old. She walks alone, stoops and straightens herself again without being held. But she hardly speaks at all. I am going to confide to my dear mother's tender heart a happiness that I had four days ago. I was with several other people in my daughter's room, so I told someone to ask her where her mother was. The little one, without anyone saying a word to her, smiled at me and came and held out her arms to me. It is the first time that she has deigned to recognize me. I confess that it gave me great pleasure, and I think I have loved her much more ever since. If Marie Antoinette had known earlier the happiness of being a mother, she would not have sought distraction from her want of occupation and ennui in futile amusements. She would not have had time to listen to flatterers and selfish advisers, nor to take part in intrigues and cabals. Calumny would have been disarmed, rendered powerless over an existence in which the smiles and tears of her children are the mother's only joys and sorrows. Marie Antoinette loved her daughter and her sons tenderly, one might almost say intelligently, as is shown in her letters to Madame de Tourzel, General Jaget, and especially in her beautiful letter to Madame Elisabeth, which one cannot read but through a mist of tears. It is dated October 16th, 1793, at half-past four in the morning. I am writing to you, my sister, for the last time. I have just been condemned, not to a shameful death, for it is only shameful for criminals, but to rejoin your brother. I am deeply grieved at having to leave my poor children. Footnote. Madame Royale and the Duc de Normandie, who was born in 1785 and became Dauphin at the death of his elder brother in 1789. He was the child of the temple. You know that I exist for them and you alone, my kind and loving sister. And may my daughter realize that at her age she should always help her brother with the advice with which her wider experience and her love may inspire her. May my son never forget his father's last words, which I repeat to this end. Let him never seek to avenge our death. Adieu, my kind and loving sister. I hope this letter will reach you. Think of me always. I embrace you with all my heart, you and my poor dear children. Ah, God, how heartrending it is to leave them forever. End of section 27. Section 28 of the 18th Century by Kashimir Stryenska, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 20, The End of the American War, 1779-1783. to While the war lasted, there was a complete renewal of confidence in the French armies and the policy of Louis and Vergennes. Economy was strictly imposed. The journeys of the court were abandoned to purchase ships. Private individuals made public subscriptions to assist the treasury to defray the enormous expenses which burdened the state. Necker taxed his ingenuity and effected numerous retrenchments in the budget. He abolished 406 posts in the king's household and reduced the number of farmers of taxes and receivers general. His economies extended over the royal candle sellers, and in allusion to this, the minister was accused of wishing to burn the short ends. He was overwhelmed with pamphlets. The financial relief caused by these reforms enabled the king to forego the rights of serfdom and mainmort. Footnote. Mainmort, a feudal custom by which serfs were not allowed to make a will, 
and if they died without heirs, the Lord succeeded. Louis had desired to go still further and abolish these harsh relics of feudalism altogether, but the resources of the state were not yet sufficient to enable him to buy the rights of the nobles. He at least hoped to see his example followed and be in time a witness of the complete enfranchisement of his subjects, who, as he asserted in his edict of August 1779, whatever the state in which Providence has ordained their birth, have equal rights to his protection and favor. Necker, in dictating these words to the king, remembered Turgot, and Louis, in signing them, won the just admiration of all the friends of philosophy. But these measures, though they gave an example to certain of the nobility, were not approved by either the higher clergy or the parliament. Private interests superseded everything in this assembly composed of the owners of estates. In consequence, the edict was only registered with the addition of express restrictions. The king's brothers, the Duc d'Orléans, and the Prince de Condé were among the malcontents. They asserted that the innovations injured their privileges, and that they debased the crown by depriving it of its prestige. The liberal movement had commenced. Necker, profiting by this favorable tendency, prepared the way for other reforms, which affected him more nearly. He demanded that Protestants should be allowed a civil status, and later that they should be eligible for public offices. However, this reform was not realized until 1788. But the new ideas took definite shape in acts of a humanitarian nature. The preliminary torture, question préparatoire, which was applied to the accused person to extort a confession of the crime imputed to him, was suppressed at this time, though judicial torture was not altogether abolished until 1788. Thus royalty foreshadowed the reforms of the revolution. The patriotic fervor of the nation was upheld by the conduct of Lafayette, who returned from the New World in February 1779 to urge the dispatch of troops to help the insurgents. He secured 4,000 soldiers under the command of Rochambeau and personally formed the project of an invasion of England. This expedition was to be supported by Spain. The preparations were extremely slow. France's allies made her wait for them at the rendezvous, and so the project failed. The Comte d'Orvilliers, who had greatly distinguished himself in the engagement at Wesson, returned to Brest in October 1779, having lost 50,000 men by disease. He was forced to send in his resignation. It was reported that Destin had captured Grenada in the Antilles on July 16th, and that Saint-Louis in Senegal, Gorilla, and St. Vincent had been taken. A small consolation for Destin himself was defeated at Savannah in Georgia, and returned like Dorvilliers, the object of general condemnation. Hostilities were continued outside France by Spain on her own account. The sailors of Charles III thought only of themselves. Spain had not been mistress of Gibraltar since 1704, and she believed the moment had arrived to retake the fortress from the English. Vergennes promised the Spanish not to sign a peace until the desired capture had been effected, but the enterprise could not contend against the hardihood of Rodney. In spite of the valor of Don Juan de Langara, it failed in January 1780. The Spaniards and French found themselves confronted by the same Rodney off the Antilles in June, but the engagements were negative and there was no revenge as yet. At the time of these events, Necker was occupied with the delicate task of appointing two new ministers for the navy and war. Sartine had occupied the former post since 1776. On his accession to power, he had said that he knew nothing of a ship and that he had very vague notions as to the four quarters of the world but practice makes perfect, and it was recognized that never had minister built so many vessels or supplied the ports better. Necker, however, had to complain of the finances of his department and secured Sartine's disgrace. He was succeeded by the Marquis de Castries, father-in-law of the Comte, now Duc de Guine. 
the appointment was made by favour but was justified by the services rendered by this able officer the victor of klosterkampfen he was devoted to his new task his intervention in the anglo-american conflict was successful and he published certain salutary ordinances in 1787 he gave up his place with honour to montmorin montbarre sartine's colleague at the war department was notoriously incapable the marquis de segur took the office in hand and he also distinguished himself by excellent reforms owing to him the monarchy bequeathed an army to the revolution an army which by its discipline and devotion to duty was to serve the republican cause in justice it must be remembered that it is to him that the soldiers of valmy and jemap owed their prowess it is true that segur has been reproached for his support of caste and his uncompromising decision of may twenty second seventeen eighty one to exclude the bourgeoisie and many of the lesser nobility from military command thenceforward no one was eligible for the rank of officer unless he could prove his nobility for four generations nevertheless with the assistance of montalembert who introduced a new system of fortification and gribeauval who improved the efficiency of the artillery segur organized great technical improvements his successor the comte de brienne the cardinal's brother continued his work and provided for the mobilization of the army in seventeen eighty eight by dividing all the forces into twenty-one divisions and the divisions into brigades the queen still under the influence of the polignacs had a direct share in the appointment of castre and segur with which no fault could be found marie antoinette began to interest herself in affairs of state but it was her intimates who reaped the advantage there was little doubt that merci was right when he wrote to kaunitz in june seventeen eighty three the queen's influence so widespread and beneficent in all other matters is much less so in those which touch on politics for the queen has given her august husband only too much reason to presume that she knows little of affairs of state and is unable to estimate their importance merci was now free and dared to say here what he would not have said while maria theresa was living the empress had died on november twenty ninth seventeen eighty since seventeen seventy four she had urged her daughter to take part in the government though on the whole her pupil responded badly to her lessons marie antoinette acted only by caprice and without reflection she remained too much of a woman for it to be safe to entrust her with any serious undertaking she had heart and feeling but in politics these are not enough the queen's ascendancy had always to be reckoned with after seventeen eighty and everything tended to increase it louis's affection could refuse nothing to marie antoinette and his hopes of the birth of a dauphin increased his tenderness for her there seemed to be the happiest auspices for this event france was cheered by the news of brilliant victories in america lafayette rochambeau guichon and the marquis de saint simon served with success in washington's cause during the year seventeen eighty which culminated in the defence of chesapeake bay and the capitulation of yorktown on october nineteenth here seven thousand men forming the flower of the english troops in america surrendered the independence of the united states was assured but to save her pride england would not own herself defeated french arms and diplomacy triumphed in face of these great events the cabals which overthrew necker seem paltry it was commonly said that a battle lost would have been better for france than the minister's resignation but it was not seriously meant however his fall was a disaster in january seventeen eighty one necker made a great innovation which was his ruin he issued his famous compte rendu which for the first time enabled the public to read in black and white the situation of the finances copies of it were greedily devoured and it was said that this admirable document would mark an ever-glorious epoch in the annals of the monarchy but there were no lack of detractors 
Some declared that the Contrandu was the work of a conceited minister, infatuated with his own importance, others that it was the work of a charlatan. The sudden light thrown on abuses alarmed the numerous and avaricious birds of prey who existed to the detriment of the treasury, and Necker had to be sacrificed. In 1778 he had presented to the king and to the king alone a memorandum on provincial administration. Relying on strict secrecy, he allowed himself to use strong expressions against the intendants, and still more against the parliaments, with the object of awakening Louis from his apathy. But the document was divulged, and copies came before the notice of those concerned. A violent criticism appeared entitled Lettre d'un bon Francais. Morpas should have saved Necker, but he, in fact, helped to injure him with the king. As usual, while outwardly approving the director's system, he was chiefly instrumental in preventing its success. On May 20th, Necker's resignation was accepted, in spite of the queen who supported him to the end as a man who had become so useful to France. Louis declared, however, that though he had changed his minister, he had not changed his principles. Jolie de Fleury, Necker's successor, reversed his reforms and brought about a complete reaction. He re-established the receivers general, treasurers, farmers of taxes, and officers of the king's household. This retrograde step advertised the uncertainty and contradictions of the government. But at this time the much-desired Dauphin was born on October 22, 1781. Ephemeral heir to a tottering throne, he only lived until 1789. The infant was greeted by magnificent and costly festivities, in which the people joined with sincere rejoicings. Yet there were murmurings of hostility in Paris, and the police were vigilant and took extraordinary precautions for fear of trouble. Threatening placards appeared on the walls of the capital, in one of which it was said that the king and queen should be conducted to the Place de Greve under a strong escort, that they should go to the Hôtel de Ville and confess their crimes, and that then they should ascend a scaffold and be burnt alive. These grim words were posted on January 21st, 1782, the day fixed for the festivities, and exactly eleven years before Louis's death. At Versailles, the arts and crafts of Paris came in a body to defile in picturesque procession before the chateau, with bands at their head. The sweeps bedecked like players had a chimney at the top of which was perched one of the smallest of their companions. The chairman brought a nurse and a dolphin, dauphin, and the butchers a fat ox. The locksmiths beat an anvil. The shoemakers were making a pair of boots for the royal child, and the tailors the uniform of his regiment. Finally came the grave diggers with the implements of their craft, a pleasantry which might almost have been inspired by the authors of the threatening placards. This element was quickly suppressed. The Queen's influence increased, as has been already noted, but on occasion this influence was controlled. Thus, when Morpa, old and broken in health, though witty still, died on November 21, 1781, Marie Antoinette's circle in vain made an assault on the vacant ministry. Louis XVI, as the Duc de Quay informs us, remained impenetrable, and would not allow any notion to get about as to the probable successor to this important post. It was, he says, one of the great crises of the reign, and everyone waited for him. Since there was not on his part the slightest suggestion or sign which could show what he intended to do, it was amusing for a philosophical spectator to see the astonishment of the intriguers and their stupefaction. The court was transformed. Vergen, as became a skilled diplomat, gave evasive answers to the importunate place-hunters, who, not knowing to whom they should apply, found the door shut in their faces. Their overtures, smiles, and bows were wasted on air. To understand the general paralysis at Versailles, says de Quayet, with some subtlety, it must be remembered that courtiers seemed to find it absolutely incumbent on them to know on whom they should fawn. 
whether it be the chief minister, his confessor, his body servant, or his friends, it is essential to fawn on some one. Judge then of their astonishment. They no longer knew whither to turn. Maurepas was not replaced. Louis was stronger than people thought. He managed to be firm on this occasion, and he had an argument in his favor. The war and a perfect adviser, Vergen. It must be mentioned that the court had just received a severe and most disconcerting lesson. The Prince de Rouen, Guimenet, was declared bankrupt with liabilities of 33 million livres. The extravagant living and undisciplined luxury of this family, whose head was the unfortunate Maréchal de Soubise of the Seven Years' War, had excited too much envy for their failure to awaken much sympathy. The Prince de Guémenet's fall left open the reversions of the offices of Grand Chamberlain and Captain of the Gendarme of the Guard. His wife, who was governess to the children of France, was obliged to resign her functions, which were then offered to the Duchesse de Polignac. The scandal was immense. There was a general outcry among the people. The men of the Revolution bore in mind this fall of one of the most important of the princely houses. In the meantime, progress was being made toward peace. England had defeated the French and Spanish fleets off the Leeward Islands in February 1782, and being thus able to treat with honor, the British cabinet was ready to open negotiations. But Charles III wished to have the last word at Gibraltar, and tired of the siege, he tried to blockade the impregnable rock. The Allied forces were unable to cut off the food supply of the English, so the result of their action was negative. Colonel d'Arson's floating batteries were used during this campaign, but without success. The Comte d'Artois went as a volunteer to the army and camped at saint roch He made a triumphal progress from Paris to the court of the King of Spain at San Ildefonso. Then he joined in the military maneuvers without undue haste. But he had the good taste to be modest on his return. A flatterer, says the Baron d'Auberkirch, spoke to him of the dangers he had incurred. There was no glory there, he answered, and I hold it very cheap. Of all my batteries, the one that did most harm during the siege was my batterie de cuisine. For the Spaniards, who are used to living on raw onions, a crayfish jelly was deadly poison. Happily, Souffron performed marvels in India, he won three splendid victories and assured some Asiatic possessions to France, thus putting her in a good position on the eve of the peace, which was signed on September 9, 1783. The treaties of Paris and Versailles were the first treaties which had been profitable to France since 1738. The chancelleries, and particularly that of Vienna, praised Vergen's wisdom in stopping in time and showing himself satisfied with modest advantages. Dunkirk was freed from the presence of the English commissioner, who was there to inspect the French ships. France gained Senegal, Saint-Pierre, and Miquelon, Santa Lucia, Tobago, and five factories in India. These possessions, limited as they were in 1783, nonetheless paved the way for fresh conquests, and later it was seen that they were valuable open doors to new enterprises. End of section 28. Section 29 of the 18th century by Kashimir Strienska, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 21 The Queen's First Cavalry, 1785. After the American War, there was a short period of calm marked by numerous manifestations of social activity. The peace seemed to give a new life to France. It was at this time that Beaumarchais succeeded in getting his Mariage de Figaro produced. The court and the town were amused and attracted by his wit, without suspecting the profound lesson concealed in the history of the Comtesse Almaviva and the lively Suzanne. They did not realize that the boastful barber is the mouthpiece of the small and weak, and that his words are formulae which a few years later were to become proverbial and serve the cause of the malcontents. 
those malcontents who were ready to rise from their place behind the scenes where they were fostering the revolt against the aristocracy of birth. The success of the piece was extraordinary. Applause marked every hit and sally. Noblemen laughed at their own expense and made others in the audience laugh with them. Beaumarchais showed the nobility a caricature of themselves and they replied, Yes, indeed, it is very like us. Strange unconsciousness. The significance of the work became evident as time went on, but it practically escaped its first audience. Beaumarchais had no idea of causing a revolution. He amused himself as much as his hearers. However, the king had foreseen the danger and said, It is detestable. It must never be performed. The Bastille will have to be destroyed if we are to save ourselves from inconsistency in allowing this play to be acted. This man makes a jest of everything which should be respected in a government. But Louis had to yield to the Polignac group. To obtain their end, these latter had said with Figaro, It is only little minds that fear little writings. After delay, the piece was performed at the Comédie Française sixty-eight times in succession, a rare event in the eighteenth century. Thus it became more and more general for people to say what they thought. President Tabasha Mons chroniclers record an interesting conversation between Louis and Richelieu. The marshal had just been ill, and the king congratulated him on regaining his health. For you are not young, you have seen three centuries. Not quite, sire, but three reigns. Yes, and what do you think of it all? Sire, under Louis the Fourteenth, no one dared to say anything. Under Louis the Fifteenth, they spoke in whispers. Under your majesty, they speak out loud. His toleration was one of his good characteristics. It was not in vain that Mirabeau published his Lettre de Cachet, an eloquent attack on the system of arbitrary imprisonment without trial. The prison of Vincennes was evacuated, and all Paris went to see in this fortress the relics of ancient barbarism. A few years before, the executioner would have publicly burned a book in which the author dared to show that despotism in a state does not depend on the individual character of the sovereign, but on the insufficiency of the laws. That there is no mean between the absolute reign of despotism and the absolute reign of law. Minds, said Ségur, are, as it were, drunk with philanthropy. The institutions of the Abbé de l'Épée and Valentine Aouy were patronized. The severe winter of 1784 aroused charitable feelings in everyone. The king gave three million livres for the relief of the distressed. The queen caused two hundred thousand livres to be distributed. Their example was generally followed. Public rewards, gold medals, and sums of money were instituted to encourage work. Prizes are given for all virtues we read in the records of Bachemont. Remarkable inventions were recorded. Did not they think in 1784 that they had conquered the air by means of balloons? Blanchard crossed the channel in a balloon and enabled the French flag to wave over England. This was enough to make people talk of flying to America. Attempts were also made to walk on the water. The word impossible was not allowed. Speaking animals, flying birds, and feeding ducks were constructed. Finally, Mesmer bewildered everyone with his marvelous tubs, and it was generally believed that the times of Paris the deacon were come again, and that magnetism was a miracle which would cure all ills. Truly, writes Segur, when I think of that period of elusive visions and learned madness, I compare the state we were in to a person on the top of a tower who is made giddy by the sight of an immense horizon and in a few minutes will have a terrible fall. In the meantime, daring increased with freedom. If those in power made a mistake, they were recalled to their senses by unusually forcible reminders. This time the blow fell on Calonne, the most baneful minister of the reign, and threw him on the queen. After the conclusion of the peace, the office of controller of finance had become of the first importance. Jolie de Fleury failed to retain the post. 
Ormesson, who succeeded him, was a young councillor of state without any great ability. He only remained in office for seven months, from April 1st to November 2nd, 1783. He was the seventh financial administrator since 1774. The minister on whom at that moment the stability of the government depended should have been chosen with the greatest care. But the king allowed himself to be seduced by the intrigues of Madame de Polignac. The queen, who according to Augeard was very recalcitrant, was won over first. Marie Antoinette, since the fall of Jolie de Fleury, had desired the recall of Necker but she allowed herself to be persuaded by madame de polignac and baron de breteuil minister of the king's household who after much argument persuaded their majesties to make an appointment which was one day to result in the total destruction of their kingdom and their own end on the scaffold these are the exact words of augeard one of the queen's two private secretaries spoken in all sincerity he gave his sovereigns many proofs of devotion at the beginning of the revolution. The history of Calonne's ministry shows how right this faithful servant was, although his expression was perhaps exaggerated. Calonne was as unscrupulous as he was attractive. In his first interview with Louis, he played the saint. He confessed that his debts amounted to 220,000 livres, that a controller general could always find means of paying them off, but that he preferred to owe everything to the king's kindness. Louis took out the sum from a desk and gave it to Calonne. The new minister had been intendant of Flanders and Artois, and had distinguished himself there by his love of display. No one, writes the Duc de Lévis, understands better than he how a room should be decorated or how a fete should be organized. He was very skillful in deceiving the public, his speech to the magistrates of the chamber of accounts before whom custom obliged him to take his oath was considered a model of well-chosen and manly eloquence breathing patriotism and revealing the statesman like necker he had recourse to loans in the form of lotteries he borrowed one hundred million livres to begin and he could have obtained a still larger sum since every one was ready to subscribe he used part of this money to begin some important constructive works in Paris and the large towns. He established a sinking fund by means of which in twenty-five years the debt was to be paid off. This last was only a snare, for the scheme was never put into operation. But boundless confidence was felt in a man who developed his plans with such conviction, and who seemed to have reorganized the whole financial system. Louis called his minister his dear controller general, and when it was known what use Calonne made of the state's money, people were not wanting who said that the controller general was indeed dear to France. For three years he cleverly concealed his methods, and his credit seemed inexhaustible. He gave and gave unceasingly, and assumed the role of public benefactor without any scruple. Morpa had once said of Calonne, who had long coveted the post of controller, why, he is a fool, a spendthrift. If you put the finances into his hands, the royal treasury would soon be as empty as his purse. This prophecy was fulfilled. In 1785 the loans amounted to 487 million livres, the debt was 101 million, and the deficit 100 million livres, but the secret had been well kept. Every one took advantage of this mad prodigality. No minister had ever so completely satisfied the increasing rapacity of the privileged. One noble said, When I saw every one holding out their hands, I held out my hat. At this time, Rambouillet was bought for the king and Saint Cloud for the queen. The Prince de Guéminet sold Lorient to the crown for eleven million livres. The debts of Monsieur and the Comte d'Artois were paid, but Calonne's personal expenses surpassed all. The public funds were squandered in the most extravagant fashion. The controller's answer to a request for money was, If it is possible, it is done. If it is not possible, it will be done. The pactolus flowed on and no one inquired how. Calonne's principles were, 
a man who wants to borrow must appear to be rich but to appear rich he must dazzle people with his expenditure this sophism had succeeded in his private life and now the new controller applied it to his public career pamphlets fell thick upon calonne but nothing was more influential than necker's book on the administration des finances it was a new compte rendu in which definite figures proved the existing financial disorders twelve thousand copies of this book were sold in one month calonne defended himself and showed a bold front it took more to shake his courage he appealed to the clergy who made him a free-will offering of eighteen million livres in return for the suppression of the edition of voltaire's works published under the auspices of beaumarchais the repeated loans tired the speculators calonne resorted to the expedient of reminting the gold coins a disguised fraud which brought in more than fifty million livres murmurs grew louder and were addressed particularly to the queen who was held responsible for the controller's prodigality marie antoinette realized this to the full in may of seventeen eighty five when she went in great pomp to notre dame de paris to thank god for the birth of the duc de normandie which took place on march twenty seventh seventeen eighty five footnote the duc de normandie the future martyr of the temple the so-called louis the seventeenth she was received in icy silence and said tearfully what have i done to them times had changed and the minds of men seemed to revolt owing to skilful calumnies and odious insinuations the popular hatred had been turned against a woman full of youth and innocence whose fault had been to inspire those around her her brothers-in-law and aunts with a fierce jealousy which found expression in libels not only in versailles but among the people gradually the pin-prick became a bludgeon blow destined to culminate in the knife of the guillotine marie antoinette was to undergo her first calvary this year for some time past the occult sciences had attracted great attention both mesner and cagliostro found eager dupes the latter pretending to cure all maladies as he did not take money said the baron d'auberkirch and on the contrary gave away much to the poor he always attracted a large crowd notwithstanding the failure of his panacea he only cured those who were well or at least those whose imagination was strong enough to assist the remedy cagliostro unveiled the past and revealed the future among his celebrated clients was the cardinal de rouen who was entirely captivated and proclaimed everywhere the miracles of the magician showing a great solitaire on which were engraved the arms of the house of rouen he said he cagliostro did it do you understand he made it out of nothing i saw it i was there with my eyes fixed on the crucible i watched the whole operation that was not all he made gold there in the roof of the palace he made about five thousand or six thousand livres worth before me he will make me the richest prince in europe these are not dreams madame they are proofs his prophecies are realized and the cures he has effected are wonderful i tell you he is the most extraordinary and the most sublime man and his wisdom is only equalled by his goodness what alms he gives what good he does it passes all imagination his clever interlocutrix the baron d'auberkirch answered ah monseigneur this man must expect to secure some very dangerous sacrifices from you if he has bought such boundless confidence in your place i should take care he will lead you far but cagliostro alone could not have played enough upon de rouen's credibility or led his eminence sufficiently far the magician was introduced by his admirer to jean de valois comtesse de la motte a clever adventuress well able to turn the situation to account she made use of cagliostro's ascendancy over the cardinal and saw where to strike the cardinal de rohan before becoming grand almoner of france had been ambassador at vienna when marie antoinette was the dauphine his mad expenditure his inexperience his tactlessness his foolishness 
and even his conduct, which scarcely conformed to his ecclesiastical status, had greatly displeased Maria Theresa, who with some difficulty managed to get rid of this strange representative of the court of Versailles. Marie Antoinette shared her mother's antipathy, and in spite of numerous attempts, the cardinal never gained access to her. Rohan was chagrined at this, and his friends knew how ardently he desired to regain her favor. The Comtesse de la Motte knew this better than anyone, and saying that she was an intimate friend of Marie Antoinette, she offered to obtain an interview for him which should bring about a reconciliation. The adventuress had infinite resources, she took in hand the threads of the intrigue, and surrounded herself with the necessary confederates. She was a wonderful stage manager. She wanted someone who resembled Marie Antoinette, and she found her. This was Marie Nicole Leguet, the so called Baron d'Oliva. The Comtesse was aware that Boehmer, the jeweller, had put all his capital into a single piece of jewelry worth one million six hundred thousand livres. It was a necklace of incomparable diamonds which could only be bought by a princess. She knew also, like everyone else, that Marie Antoinette could not resist the attraction of jewellery, and that her jewel-case was never numerous enough for her. Such were the seemingly incongruous elements with which Madame de la Motte, relying on the credulity of Rouen and the prestige of Cagliostro, formed the scaffolding of a romance never equaled by Anne Radcliffe, Walter Scott, or Alexandre Dumas. She it was who conceived the scene in the grove. One evening the cardinal was conducted to the park of Versailles. Suddenly in the twilight a woman appeared who had the form and bearing of the queen. It was Doliva the streetwalker, whom the Comte de la Motte had met in the gardens of the Palais Royal. Oliva murmured some unintelligible words and let fall a rose as she passed. Rouen thought he heard, you may hope that the past will be forgotten. He was convinced that the queen had pardoned him. Then Madame de la Motte told him that Marie Antoinette wanted to buy Burmer's necklace and that she had chosen him to negotiate the affair secretly. The Comtesse next forged instructions for the purchase using the queen's name. No one can think of everything and she signed the orders Marie Antoinette de France, though the queen never signed documents or letters in that way. A more intelligent man would have seen through the trick, but Rohan was an easy prey. Advised by Cagliostro, he bought the necklace on credit, and gave it to an accomplice whom he thought to be a domestic of the palace, on February 1st, 1785. The Comtesse kept the necklace, sold the separate stones, and squandered the proceeds amounting to hundreds of thousands of livres. The jeweller, who was paid nothing, sent in a claim to the queen. Marie Antoinette was convinced that Rouen had made use of her name to obtain the necklace by fraud, and induced the king to order the cardinal's arrest on August 15, 1785. The queen was naturally annoyed, and in her desire for revenge she did not stop to reason. She thought the cardinal was to blame and must be punished. Her letters to her brother Joseph show how unguarded was her anger. All had been agreed to between the king and myself. The ministers knew nothing. The king had the cardinal summoned and questioned him in the presence of the keeper of the seals, Miromenil, and the baron de Breteuil. I hope that this affair will soon be ended, but I do not know if it will be sent to the parliament or if the culprit and his family will trust themselves to the king's clemency. This was written on August 22nd, 1785. Then on September 19th, 1785, she wrote, the cardinal used my name like a vile and maladroit coiner. It is possible that, pressed by want of money, he thought he could pay the jewellers by the date he had agreed on without anything being discovered. And on December 27, 1785, the charlatan Cagliostro, La Motte, his wife, and a certain Oliva, a streetwalker, are accused with him, Rouen. He must be confronted by them and answer their reproaches. What associates for a grand almoner and a Rouen cardinal? There was a solemn festival at Versailles on August 15th, the day of the Assumption, when France commemorated the vow of Louis XIII and the Queen's fete. 
The Cardinal de Rohan was there, ready to say mass in a cassock of watered scarlet silk and a rochet of English point lace, when he was brought before the king. Cousin, said Louis, what about this purchase of a diamond necklace that you are said to have made for the queen? Sire, I see I have been deceived, but I have not deceived. The prelate was given time to write his defense, but it was impossible to unwind the tangled skein of this intrigue in a few lines. Rohan's statement satisfied no one, and the proud and angry queen least of all. There was a crowd in the apartments, from the Oeil de Boeuf to the cabinet of the clock, an anxious crowd which did not understand why mass was not being said. The door of the inner room where this tragic scene was being enacted then opened. Rohan, very pale, advanced, followed by Breteuil, who cried to the Duc de Villois, captain of the bodyguard, Arrest Monsieur le Cardinal. The next day the Grand Almoner was in the Bastille. This hasty decision was an irreparable mistake, but it was impossible to check the nervous tenacity of the Queen, encouraged by the hatred that Breteuil bore toward Rohan. One man, Vergen, might have saved the situation, but he was not at the council when the question was decided. The Queen was the first victim of this impulsive action. The trial took place before the Parliament, the Cardinal was acquitted, and it was judged that he had been the dupe of the Comtesse de la Motte, who alone was condemned on May 31, 1786. The Rouen triumphed and declared themselves avenged for the failure of the Prince de Gominet, but they complained loudly when they heard that the Cardinal was exiled to his abbey at La Chaise-Dieu, and that he had been forced to resign the office of Grand Almoner. The public joined them in their indignation at this treatment of a man whom justice had acquitted. De Rouen, to whom were allied the Soubise, Marsan, Brion, and the Prince de Condé, who had married a Rouen, in their turn put Marie Antoinette on trial. The poor queen, who was already unpopular, heard all round her murmurs of blind hatred. The mass of the people thought her guilty, seeing that the cardinal was innocent, and thus the reprisals of ninety-three began. When Madame de la Motte underwent the degrading punishment of being branded in the Cour de May before the Palais de Justice, public sympathy was on her side and against the Queen. The crown of France had already begun to roll in the revolutionary gutter. As Goethe says, Marie Antoinette then lost in the minds of the people that moral support which made her person inviolable. In 1777, Maria Theresa wrote to Merci, I confess that my fears are redoubled at the thought of how much harm a man of this kind, Rohan, would be capable of doing if ever he secured an established position at court. And the Empress had said to Marie Antoinette, The post that Rohan is to occupy alarms me. He is a bad man to have as an enemy, both on your account and on account of his principles which are quite perverted. Under an affable, easy, and prepossessing exterior, he has done much harm here. Yet I am to see him at the king's side and at yours. He will scarcely do honor to his office as bishop. We are forcibly reminded of these predictions by the story of the necklace. Maria Theresa was clear-sighted, but she could hardly have imagined all the harm to be wrought by Rohan's stupid credulity and her daughter's regrettable blindness. The queen wept and watched the approach of dark days. Joy and repose for her were things of the past. Meanwhile, complications started by her brother, the emperor nearly provoked another continental war. Urged by Joseph and his minister, Chancellor von Kaunitz, Marie Antoinette championed the Austrian cause, personally conducted her case with the king and his ministers, dictated dispatches, kept back couriers, informed her brother of all resolutions, and thus allowed him to act with a strong hand. Too faithful to her mother's principles, she forgot, or rather did not understand, that the alliance of the Bourbon with her family was not the beginning and end of French policy. In 1784, Joseph, in spite of his treaties with Holland, demanded the opening of the Scheldt and the possession of Maastricht. The emperor was rather energetic than clever, and he had a mania for territorial aggrandizement. Poland had so easily become part of the Habsburg patrimony that anything seemed permissible, 
and now Flemish succeeded to Bavarian dreams. To the first overtures of her brother, Marie Antoinette replied by a confession which she said was not very flattering to her self-esteem. I do not deceive myself, wrote Marie Antoinette on September 22, 1784, as to my power, especially in politics. I have not a great ascendancy over the king's mind. Would it be prudent for me to have quarrels with his ministers on subjects on which I am nearly certain the king would not support me? Without ostentation or falsehood, I allow the public to believe that I have more influence than I really have, because if I were not believed to have some, I should have less still. This essentially feminine way of thinking shows considerable insight. Joseph, in his reply, thought it useless to lecture one who showed such candor and dexterity. You should avoid scenes with any of the king's ministers, was all he said. To tell a pretty woman who combines tact with wit and ability as you do, how she ought to act when she knows all the people concerned and is anxious to succeed in her purpose, would be a waste of time and might make you laugh. Consistency, perseverance, grasp of detail, patience, complacence, and a little constraint are the sex's true weapons, and its most powerful and infallible method of influencing our wills. But these means must be prepared beforehand, for one does not always win the game just at one's own time. This is a great change from the Joseph who reprimanded his sister so brutally that Maria Theresa intercepted his letter, but when the emperor had need of the Queen of France he knew how to flatter her successfully. In his heart he did not believe that Marie Antoinette was capable of helping him, as his correspondence with Merci proves. His judgment of her in his confidential letters to the ambassador is always severe. Joseph wished to secure the king's support. The opening of the Scheldt was only to be the prelude to the cession of Dutch Flanders to Austria in exchange for a rectification of frontiers advantageous to the Republic. It was also possibly a step toward the annexation of Bavaria, if Holland would agree to this. It was all to the interest of France to favor these negotiations, since they would give her two safe ports instead of one in the Austrian Netherlands. She was reminded of the considerable services which the port of Ostend had rendered her commerce in the last war. This was the theme of Merci's propositions to Vergen. The French minister replied, that he would refer the question to the Dutch ambassadors, that he desired to be on good terms with the Republic, and it was not his business to dictate laws to them. The negotiations were interminable. Vergen was firm. He kept the king equally so, and pursued the wise policy which had enabled him to re-establish France, at least in her external relations. Marie Antoinette's influence remained negative, in spite of her unceasing efforts to pilot her brother's ship as she wished, and to secure the dismissal of Vergen. The king would not sacrifice him to his conjugal affection. Victory remained with the minister. He again calmed the emperor's exuberance, and on November 8, 1785, he prepared the Treaty of Fontainebleau between Joseph and the Batavian Republic, thus enabling France to intervene in the honorable role of mediator. The emperor demanded payment of ten million livres from the States General of Holland because his standard had been insulted, but the Dutch obstinately refused to give more than half. Vergen agreed to five million livres and signed a private treaty with the United Provinces, which were thus relieved of the English influence, and gave France great advantages in return. It was a small price to pay for the peace of Europe for these few millions saved the expenses of a war. But the public did not understand Vergen's political skill. It was everywhere proclaimed that French money was being expended for the benefit of the Queen's brother. The idea still haunted the Republicans, who, on the audit of the accounts by the Constituent Assembly, were astonished to find no trace of the fabulous sums believed to have been squandered for the Austrian cause, these same men, when they entered the Trianon, expected to find there the room studded with diamonds and the twisted columns ornamented with sapphires and rubies invented by malignant imagination. Vergen made one mistake in allowing himself to be deceived by Calonne and in believing with Louis the Sixteenth 
that the Controller General would find a solution for the financial difficulties. Their blindness had lasted too long, but the veil was at length to be torn aside. End of section 29. Section 30 of the 18th Century by Kashimir Strienska, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22. The Dawn of the Revolution, 1786 to 1789, Part 1. A few days after the termination of the necklace incident, Louis, perhaps calling to mind the advice of Joseph II, undertook a journey. He went to Cherbourg, June 20th to 29th, 1786, his object being to view the works then carried on in the harbour and the roadstead, which had been commenced after the signing of the peace in 1783. Royal journeys beyond the annual visits to Compiègne and Fontainebleau were rare. It was remembered that Louis XIV had only spent one day at Dunkirk, and Louis XV only three at Havre. The navy had been one of Louis XVI's chief concerns, and people were pleased to see the monarch interested in so glorious a work. Two things were particularly noticeable. We read in Bachemont, one, that the king is perfectly well informed in all which concerns the navy, and shows himself ignorant neither of the construction, the equipment, nor the handling of ships. The other, that the king questioned each officer who was presented to him, mentioning to him the actions in which he had been engaged during the war, and singularly flattering these gentlemen by the excellence of his memory. To repeat Louis's own words, the day of his coronation and that of his arrival at Cherbourg were the two happiest days of his life. His reception was enthusiastic. To the cries of long live the king, Louis replied with long live my people. At Caen, he ordered his carriage to proceed at a walking pace, and allowed every one to approach him. He delighted in saying repeatedly, They are my children. The rejoicings were sincere on both sides. On his return to Versailles, a second daughter was born to Louis on July 9th, but this princess lived scarcely a year. Then he was swept away into the whirlwind of state affairs, and again he had to bear the burden of government, which seemed so heavy to him. His people, whom he loved and whom he wished to see happy, fell a prey to ministerial intrigues, and Louis had not sufficient penetration to reject the bad counsels that were to ruin him. Following Verschen's advice, he signed a commercial treaty with England on September 26, 1786, which was advantageous from an economic point of view, but he fell once more under the influence of Cullen's artifices, subterfuges, and lies. At the end of his resources and at enmity with the Parliament, Cullen was obliged to reveal the situation. In spite of loans to the extent of 487 million livres, the debt was 101 million, and the deficit 100 million livres. But he threw the blame on his predecessors, and, as he feared to alarm Louis, once more deceived him. He showed him a plan as a last resource which he asserted would ensure unlimited prosperity. He asked and received a promise of secrecy from the king. An assembly of notables was to be summoned, and proposals for the reform of abuses were to be placed before it. This idea, reminiscent of Henry IV, caught Louis's fancy. There were a hundred and forty-four notables, among them princes of the blood royal, archbishops, bishops, dukes and peers, councillors of state, deputies from the provinces, four from the clergy, six from the nobility, and only two from the third estate, and municipal officials. The majority were naturally upholders of the abuses which were to be remedied. Calonne, from motives of vanity, affected to choose among these notables some of the most prominent of his enemies, such as the Archbishop of Toulouse, Lomeni de Brienne, a candidate for the ministry, who is said to be an able administrator. Calonne did not wish his victory to be unattended by risk. Brienne duly took care to discover difficulties and to create opposition. On December 29, 1786, the king announced to the Conseil des Dépêches, 
footnote, the Council of Internal Affairs, that on the 29th of the following month he was summoning an assembly composed of persons of various classes who were the best qualified in his kingdom, and that he would communicate to them his plans for the relief of his people, the restoration of order in finance, and the reformation of many abuses. Louis was still under his controller's influence, and he wrote to him the next day, I did not sleep all night, but it was from pleasure. The public was much excited. At court fears were expressed as to the result of this new authority. A young noble, the Vicomte de Ségur, cried, The king is resigning. In the town there was little confidence in a minister like Calonne, and a section of the population rejoiced in the certainty that the assembly would fail. Nothing was known as to the subjects which were to be discussed in the assembly, but satirists were not far wrong when they distributed pamphlets announcing the spectacle in these terms. You are informed that Monsieur le Contrôleur Général has formed a new company of actors, who will begin to play before the court on Monday, the 29th of this month. Their principal production will be false confidence, and their second one, forced consent. These will be followed by an allegorical ballet pantomime composed by M. de Calonne, entitled The Cask of the Danaides. At this time, Theodore was playing in the presence of the Queen at Versailles. The principal character in the piece is a king who goes on a journey. At a certain place, the king's equerry says to his master that there is no more money. They are both troubled and ask each other what is to be done. At this moment, a voice cried from the pit, Assemble the notables. The first sitting which had been fixed for January 29th was postponed owing to the illness of Calonne and the death of Vergennes on February 13th, 1787. The latter's influence over the king would have been very valuable at this time. At length, however, the assembly opened on February 22nd at the Hôtel des Menus. On his way there, the monarch received neither cheers nor applause. But the controller was full of hope. He had divided the assembly into seven boards, with the princes as presidents and the councillors of state as reporters. There were not one of these princes that Calonne had not obliged with several millions. The reforms proposed by the controller were inspired by those of Turgot and Necker. They were drawn up in vague terms and in a pompous style which made the worst impression on the notables and on the public, among whom his speech at the opening was widely distributed. Calonne had said that his plans, which were known and approved by the king, had become his majesty's own plans. An altercation followed this, and Dillon, archbishop of Narbonne, said in angry tones, do you take us for sheep and imbeciles, that you call us together simply to obtain our sanction to plans which are already settled? The members of the assembly all demanded to know the exact amount of the deficit before voting the land taxation, which was disapproved by the privileged classes. They insisted on knowing the state of the finances. Calonne refused, saying that it was their duty to decide on the form of the tax and not on its basis. The notables held firm, and some even spoke of a convocation of the States General. The controller thought that audacity would once more save him, and he distributed in Paris and instructed all the curé to read as a sermon an appeal to the people, representing the notables as upholding opinions which were opposed to the monarch's purpose and to the happiness of his subjects. In the assembly this caused a tempest of accusations and complaints against this shameless minister. He was confronted with his embezzlements and thefts. Lafayette, the hero of America, demanded a rigorous examination of the minister's expenses, saying that the fruit of the sweat, tears, and perhaps blood of the people should not be abandoned to cupidity. Calonne was lost. He had prepared thirty-three lettres de cachet with which to strike his adversaries. He secured the dismissal of Eudes de Miromenil, keeper of the seals, and replaced him by Lamoignon, president of the parliament. He tried to overthrow Breteuil, the queen's protégé, but it was himself that was doomed. He was exiled to Lorraine, but he did not feel safe there, as the people of Metz had hanged his effigy, so he was allowed to retire to Flanders and thence to England in April 1787. There was some talk of reinstating Necker, 
but Louis refused to listen to the supporters of the Genevan banker, and a court intrigue brought a prelate into power. This was Lomeny de Brienne, Archbishop of Toulouse, who had been since youth a great friend of the Queen's reader, the Abbe de Vermont. He had given proofs of ability, the construction of the Brienne Canal was due to him, and he had won the approval of Turgot and Malzerbe. Joseph II had met him during his visit in 1777, and since then had not ceased to praise him. It seemed a propitious moment to have recourse to the intelligence of a man who was so highly esteemed. He had secured public opinion in his favor as a victorious adversary of Calonne, whose fall he had helped to encompass by his brilliancy in the assembly of notables. Marie Antoinette was, like many others, dazzled by this so-called savior, and secured his appointment as head of the financial council, with a young master of requests, Laurent de Villedeuil, intendant of Rouen, as controller general in subordination to him. The queen was supported by the keeper of the seals, La Moignon, Vergennes' successor, the Comte de Montmorin, and the Baron de Breteuil. Brienne had tried to satisfy his ambition on various occasions. It was common knowledge that he had solicited the succession to Christophe de Beaumont in 1781, when Louis XVI had said, We must at least have an Archbishop of Paris who believes in God. He was known to be unscrupulous in the means he used to attain his ends. He had secretly favored the philosophers, but had never compromised himself. He laughed at miracles and relics, even though he sent an elbow bone of St. Thomas Aquinas to the Duke of Parma, first cousin to Louis and brother-in-law of Marie Antoinette. He was adroit, clever, competent to play a part, and could easily assume the absorbed appearance of a man who was busy with great affairs. He offended no one and flattered everyone's particular vanity, and this was all that was necessary to secure him a place beyond his deserts in the public estimation. Louis XVI had been deluded by Calonne's brilliant ease. Marie Antoinette, in her turn, was deceived by Brienne's simulated intelligence. The archbishop minister consented to disclose the state of finances to the notables, thus with some skill granting what Calonne had refused, and thereby gaining the favor of the assembly. It was discovered that the deficit had reached 140 million livres, Brienne proposed to the Parliament a loan of sixty million livres, promising to economize in the king's household to the extent of forty million livres, instead of the twenty million livres promised by his predecessor. The edict was registered on May 10, 1787. The notables, however, did not wish to vote the necessary taxation, a tax to be levied on all lands and a stamp tax. On this point they trusted to the wisdom of his majesty. They formulated their wishes, which were that preventive measures should be devised to meet the financial disorders, and that a report should be published annually, which should be audited by capable men who did not form part of the government, and that the civil and criminal laws should be revised. This program seemed to be a preface to the demands which were said to be imminent. Lafayette suggested that a national assembly should be convened for 1792. What, monsieur? cried the Comte d'Artois. You desire the convocation of the States General? Yes, Monseigneur, and even more than that. The notables were dissolved on May 25th. As might have been expected, said Bailly, in the case of men who had only the right to advise and no authority, they left things almost exactly as they found them. But the popular excitement was increasing. Everyone had been interested in the discussions of the delegates. Lafayette told Jay, an American friend of his, the French have acquired the habit of thinking about public affairs. The struggle had begun, and at this juncture, the Parliament entered the lists to strike a fresh blow against the royal Acropolis, already trembling from the first shock. End of Section 30《Section 31 of the 18th Century》by Kashimir Strienska, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 31 of the 18th Century by Kashimir Strienska, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 22, The Dawn of the Revolution, Part 2. 
Some administrative edicts which were proposed by Brienne were passed without opposition. The provincial assemblies which had been founded during Necker's term of office in Berry and Haute-Guienne were definitely established. These assemblies were a successful and liberal step toward decentralization. They were composed of 48 members, 12 from the clergy, 12 from the nobility, and 24 from the third estate, of whom twelve were deputies from the towns and twelve from the country proprietors. Their duties were to assess and collect the taxes and to supervise public works. Next, the corvée was suppressed. But when the stamp tax was proposed, the parliamentaires were unusually violent in their opposition and attacked the extravagance of Calon and the court. They demanded statements of receipts and expenditure to assist them in their decision. Brienne refused, since he had shown them to the notables. The king supported his minister. The only reply of the parliament was to draw up a remonstrance, in which it petitioned the king to withdraw the stamp edict, and expressed the desire to see the nation assembled before there was any fresh taxation. The remonstrance was at once printed. The public saw in it the trial of the government, and realized that all confidence had been lost. The Parliament was considered justified and recovered its former popularity. The agitation spread to the provinces, and all the provincial parliaments rallied round that of Paris. Brienne had resort to a lit de justice, but this instrument of despotism was ridiculed, and victory still lay with the magistrates. On August 14, 1787, Mercy gave a graphic description of the situation in a dispatch to Joseph II. The turn which internal affairs are taking, he said, places the king, queen, and ministers in the most embarrassing position. The obstinate resistance of the parliament to the designs of the court has influenced men's minds. By degrees, all classes of society are joining in the struggle." It is difficult to imagine the audacity with which people, even in public places, spoke of the royal family, and especially the queen, against whom violent insults were directed. Marie Antoinette became Madame Deficit, and the lieutenant general warned her not to let herself be seen in Paris. The idea of summoning the states general found universal support, for it was said the country no longer had a guide. The police were powerless to repress the movement. Even if they had put the people in prison by thousands, it would have had no effect. Insurrection would have broken out. The king's prestige was deeply shaken. If the court of Versailles at this time had had the misfortune to be dragged into a war, and the negotiations between Holland, Prussia, and Great Britain were full of menace to France, any measures which might have been taken for safety would have been useless and a general bankruptcy would have been unavoidable. The country henceforward took the place of the Parliament and itself made war on royalty. Meanwhile, the Queen went to Trianon to seek a short rest. In the shade of the park, Besenval, one of her confidants, gave her advice, and in his own way revealed the dangers of this critical time. He advocated boldness and wanted the King to show himself master and not to fear to use his authority. Otherwise, he said, his majesty will have to put down his crown, never again perhaps to replace it on his head. Ah, cried the queen, what harm Monsieur de Calonne has done the country with his notables. This was the cry of the ardent royalists. But were there many of them left? During the night between August 14th and 15th, the ministers decided to banish the parliament to Troyes an antiquated stratagem of another age, and now only a display of impotence which increased the popularity of the magistrates. In exile they received the support and encouragement of the various courts of Paris, and even of the university. Reprimands, which almost amounted to orders, were sent from the provinces to Versailles. The king was irresolute, and Brienne profited thereby to get himself appointed prime minister. His excuse was that he wished to concentrate the executive power, and his vanity made him think he could pacify the disorders. Lamoignon wished to imitate Mopu, and dreamed of suppressing all the refractory parliaments, 
which were fixed in their desire for the convocation of the states general such was the expression which was echoed from one end of france to the other it was heard at rennes rouen bordeaux dijon besancon grenoble toulouse and pau the convocation was indeed to be but the parliament had no suspicion that when it came it would mean the extinction of itself as well as of the monarchy brienne yielded and pardoned the parliament and by a declaration dated september twentieth brought the exiles back to paris four days later another declaration was published revoking the stamp duties and the territorial subvention it was a complete retraction but the return of the parliament and these concessions had no calming effect as before insulting notices disgraced the walls of paris Calonne was burnt in effigy in the Place Dauphine, an effigy of the Polignac was burnt also, and the Queen came near to suffering the same indignity, according to Bachemont and Hardy. But the unhappy Marie Antoinette found her severest critics in her own family. On October 6, 1787, Joseph had no compunction in writing to Merci, I am extremely curious to learn how the disorder which reigns in France will end, I am sorry for the vexation which it causes the Queen. I speak of it in the accompanying letter to her, and I touch in passing on the subject of her intimates, whose cupidity brings all this unpleasantness upon her. But I am aware that it will have no effect, for when one has no resources in oneself, the fear of ennui prevails over every other consideration. What a tone at such a moment! He was utterly heartless and it was only to further his own and the Austrian interest that he recommended the Archbishop of Toulouse to the unfortunate Queen. The financial measures had so far been illusory, so Brienne formed the plan of issuing a loan of 420 million livres, redeemable in five years, and of promising the States General for 1792. On November 19th, the edict was read in the Parliament in the King's presence. After a sitting of nine hours, Louis failed to obtain the support he needed, but he none the less caused the registration of the edict to be pronounced, following the formula used at the Lit de Justice. This decision was received with many murmurs. The Duc d'Orléans declared that this form of registration was illegal, that the assembly was not a Lit de Justice, but an ordinary royal session with right of free discussion. Two councillors, Fretto and the Abbe Sabatier uttered words which were indecent. They were taken to prison, while the Duc d'Orléans was exiled to his chateau of villers cotterets This prince had at one time been popular at the court, but he became one of the bitterest enemies of the king and queen. He even voted for Louis's death. He himself was to perish on the scaffold. Fretto, Sabatier, and Orléans were championed by the Parliament, which demanded their liberation. A quarrel ensued, and Louis persisted in his refusal. The loan failed, the taxes were not voted, and the situation became more and more complicated. Brienne had no governing idea, no initiative, and none of the talents with which he had been credited. His attitude displayed nothing but feebleness and uncertainty. He conceived the idea of summoning the Queen to the committees and of giving her a preponderating voice in their decisions. Neither by her education nor by her tastes was Marie Antoinette fitted to give useful counsel. The Archbishop admonished her. Though he may have thus increased his prestige, observes Besenval, such conduct could only have the effect of compromising the Princess and of making her the object of ridicule. Brienne did not neglect his own interests. On one occasion he thought he would be obliged to resign his ministry, owing to a severe illness. Even while in bed he coveted the archbishopric of Sens, rendered vacant by the death of the Cardinal de Luynes, and the Abbey of Corby, and he secured both. Added to this, said Besenval, was a right to cut down trees to the value of 900,000 francs, which was sufficient to pay his debts. It was forgotten, said the same writer, 
that they were adding fuel to the popular hatred by thus showering money on one who extracted it from everybody and enriched himself whilst he preached economy. Brienne already possessed an income of 700,000 livres from his ecclesiastical benefices alone, but he was insatiable and wished in addition to his wealth to have the honor of the cardinal's purple. The archbishop's youngest brother, the Comte de Brienne, replaced de Ségur as minister of war. He was said to be honest, but he was shallow and very ignorant. He had the best intentions, but his efforts ended in his allowing himself to be led without having any clear idea where he was going. He attempted some reforms, wishing to make a complete reconstruction of the army and its discipline, but his attempts soon degenerated into mere personal questions and came to nothing. In April 1788, the fever spread over the whole country. Governors of provinces were directed to return to their posts, and the army was ordered to support them. The king said aloud that he was tired of being under the tutelage of citizens and that he wished to free himself from them. A coup d'etat in the shape of a dissolution of the parliament was suggested. On May 3rd, the Parliament made a violent protest against the proposed measure and declared that if force reduced it to powerlessness, it would maintain the constitutional principles of the monarchy and would resign the sacred trust to the king, the states general, and to each of the united or separate orders which formed the nation. A comedy had been witnessed when the notables were assembled but people began now to fear that it had been the first act of a tragedy. The promoters of this protest of May 3rd were Aspremenil and Goislard de Montsabert. On the following night, an attempt was made to arrest them, but they took refuge at the Palais. They were followed there by the Swiss and French guard. The captain of the latter did not know the two councillors and asked where they were. We are all d'Aspremenil and Goislard was the answer of the entire assembly. The captain retired and returned with a fresh order. The two offenders gave themselves up and followed the officer. The meeting had lasted thirty hours, and the magistrates separated with violent protests against the arrest of two of their members who had been violently torn from the sanctuary of law. Louis continued his policy, and by the six edicts of May 8th reduced the Parliament to nullity, instituted new courts of justice under the name of Grand Bailliage, created the plenary court which alone was authorized to verify and register laws, and reserved for himself the power of raising loans at will. The chief president bitterly opposed this despotic authority, which royalty claimed, but which the French nation would never adopt. In the provinces there were the same protests and a like refusal to submit to the new edicts. Everywhere agitation was at its height. A palace for sale, ministers to be hanged, and a crown to be given away, was to be read on the walls of the Parliament which had been turned into barracks. Pamphlets were dedicated to the sovereigns who are so pleased to see their kingdom become a republic. In the theatre, allusions of all sorts were made. The court used the same weapons and published libels and pamphlets against its adversaries. The promoters of sedition were arrested, and the police were active everywhere. An explosion was expected. Brienne then said these celebrated words, I foresaw everything, even civil war. He tried to struggle against the clergy who deserted him and only granted 180,000 livres out of the 8 million he had expected, against the army who disobeyed him, and against the parliaments and all the supreme courts. On August 8th, the king convened the States General for May 1st, 1789, thus condemning the archbishop's policy. The prelate declared the nation bankrupt. He hoped to secure Necker as his savior and colleague, but the honest Genevan did not wish to work with an unscrupulous minister who had even had recourse to charity and hospital funds, and who with his colleague La Moignon, was now about to overdraw on the treasury, by means of treasury bills, as a final impropriety, leaving there only 200,000 francs. At last, on August 25th, 
Brienne sent in his resignation, or rather he was forced to resign. I think that this was necessary, said Marie Antoinette to Merci on the same day. I have just written three lines to Monsieur Necker to ask him to come here to me at ten o'clock tomorrow. There is no time for hesitation. If he can begin to work tomorrow, so much the better. I tremble. Excuse my weakness that it is I who am recalling him. I am fated to bring misfortune, and if infernal machinations make him fail again, or if he lessens the king's authority, I shall be still more detested. For the future, the queen never ceased to tremble. The news of Brienne's departure, quickly followed by that of La Moignon, caused immense joy to the Parisians and all France, and the crowd wished to set fire to the houses of the two ministers. Besenval says that the Place Dauphine was like a field of battle. Petards were thrown about. Carriages were stopped in the Pont Neuf, and men were obliged to kneel down in front of the statue of Henry the Fourth and cry, Vive Henri IV, to the devil with Brienne and La Moignon. Necker returned to power and immediately restored confidence. He undid all that Brienne had done, repealed the edicts, liberated the exiles, reconstituted the parliament, and revoked the edict of bankruptcy, promising his own fortune as a pledge for loans made to the state. In a declaration on September 23rd, the king fixed the meeting of the states general for an earlier date, January 1st, 1789. But Necker thought it would be wise to call the notables together again to discuss questions relative to the three orders, and thus months passed away. The new era began on May 5, 1789, with the assembly of the representatives of the country. The revolution was born and was already lusty when the procession of deputies, the funeral procession of the monarchy, passed through the streets of Versailles. It is with the person of king, said Rivarol, as with the statues of gods. The first blows strike the god himself, the last fall only on the disfigured marble. End of section 31section thirty two of the eighteenth century by kashimir stryensky translated by henry neville dickinson this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami fifth part the artistic and literary movement chapter twenty three number one the arts number two the sciences number three literature number four the salon part one the arts Two great painters dominate the 18th century, Watteau and Latour. Watteau was a true creative genius and owed everything to his own talent. Where among those who went before him can we find his easy grace, his delicate charm, or his delicious tones and design? He had no doubt studied Rubens and admired the Venetians in the Cosa Gallery, and perhaps he owed to them something of his life, but not his color, for a sense of color is innate. He had seen Terreburgs and Teniers and Vanostads, and from them he may have borrowed the smallness of his canvases, but he owed nothing else to anyone. The poetry which flutters through his Seine Galant, the essentially French air, which appears in the expressions on his faces, the landscapes which harmonize so well with the character of the actors, all these reveal an exquisite imagination and a finished art. All these are unique. His influence, on the contrary, was great. All through the century we see painter after painter, more or less directly inspired by Watteau's work. Lancre, his friend who was more sober, more deliberate, and who lacked his light fancy and picturesque feeling. Pater, who came from Valenciennes, as did the poet of the embarkation, and was for a time his pupil, Van Loo, whose halt of sportsmen is in the Louvre, and Jean-François de Troyes, whose oyster feast is at Chantilly, Natoir, who painted the decorations in the Hôtel de Soubise, Archive Nationale, which are still so fresh, and a whole series of panels now in the Museum of Troyes, but originally executed for the castle of Prince Xavier of Saxony. 
Boucher, who had time in his long life sometimes to be a true artist, as for instance in the ceiling of the council chamber at Fontainebleau, but has left behind him too many insipid canvases without any real beauty. Langrenet and Le Prince, who were only second-rate painters, and above all, Fragonard, the last to come, who was born at Grasse beneath the sun of Provence, and brought to life again the brilliance, the warmth of color, and the consummate art of the poet of the Regency. From one end of the century to the other, Watteau and Fragonard join hands, and enclose the host of imitators who serve to emphasize their consummate mastery. Both celebrated and transmitted the fête galante of the 18th century. They revived that time of splendid carelessness, whose children smiled and frolicked and inhaled the perfume of roses, without thinking of the catastrophes which were to dispel their charming dreams, fugitive and illusory like all things human. Others also followed this school. Olivier, for instance, the Prince de Conti's painter in ordinary. His pictures are rare, but his thé à l'anglaise in the Louvre is sufficient to show the delicacy of his brush. Eisen, Porté, Cochin, Gravelin, Baudouin, Saint-Aubin, and Moreau have shown in engraving sketches and vignettes their persistent anxiety to imitate Watteau. In the 18th century, before Latour, there were portrait painters who were not to be disregarded. Tournier, an excellent physiognomist. Bell, to whom we owe the charming portrait at Versailles of the Infanta, betrothed to Louis XV. Rigaud and La Guerre, and an artist inferior to them, Vivian. Natier, who was popular with ladies, the beautiful as well as the ugly flocked to him, knowing that they would be well treated. Troquet, who painted the delicate portrait of Marie, wife of Louis the Fifteenth, in the Louvre. But the pastelist of saint Quentin is incontestably the most marvellous representative of the art of portrait painting in France. Not that he knew how to compose, but he had a better gift, for he could give to a face something intangible, expressive life, brilliance, and truth. We must go to his native town and study his sketches, simple heads drawn from models, to see how beautifully a face may be reproduced, not only in its physical, but in its moral aspects. Latour said himself, My models think that I catch only the features of their faces, but I search into the depths of their hearts without their knowing it, and I take the whole of them away with me. These sketches, most of them anonymous, which are kept in the silent provincial sanctuary, were used by the artist to enable him to repaint at leisure an elaborate portrait, which was not always equal to the first eager record set down in an hour or two. At Dijon there is to be seen a head of the artist painted by himself, in which perhaps all the qualities of his talent are displayed and a very beautiful sketch of Joseph Vernet. To obtain an insight into the art of the pastelist, these sketches should first be studied. It is then easier to appreciate the finished works which are to be seen in the Louvre and some of the museums of the large towns of France. Although the portrait of Madame de Pompadour is not worthy of all the praise that has been bestowed on it, the same cannot be said of the portraits of Marie Lichtenska and Marie-Joseph of Saxony, the Dauphiness, in the same room at the Louvre, which so admirably suggests the resignation of the former and the goodness of the latter, and give us at the same time a complete idea of Latour's versatility and the perfection of his art. The means by which the painter achieved his results are forgotten in the impression of life that they produce— the princesses seem to smile at us as though they were about to entrust us with a secret. Latour's character was as individual as his art. He was frank like his pastels. He sent a message to the Marquise de Pompadour when she asked him to come to Versailles, saying, Tell Madame that I do not paint in a town. However, he consented to go to her on condition that no one should interrupt him. This he was promised. When he arrived, he unfastened his shoes, his garters, and his collar, 
took off his wig and hung it on a girandole, put a silk skull cap on his head, and in this picturesque déshabillé began the portrait. At the end of a quarter of an hour, Louis the Fifteenth came in. You promised, madame, said the painter, that your door should be closed. The king laughed heartily and told the artist to continue. It is impossible for me to obey your majesty, answered this original. I will return when madame is alone. He got up, took his wig and garters, and went grumbling into another room. He was heard to say several times, I don't like to be interrupted. Louis took a very witty revenge. Latour, who was a politician and a philosopher at times, took the liberty of saying to the king, Sire, we have no ships. You forget those of Vernet, replied the monarch. There is no worse trial for a painter than to be discontented with the model he is forced to paint. This was the case when Latour undertook the portrait of the celebrated financier, de la Reynière, who missed his appointment one day and sent his servant to tell Latour that he had not time to come. My friend, said the painter to the domestic, your master is an imbecile, whom I ought never to have painted. Your face pleases me. Sit down. Your features are intelligent. I am going to paint your portrait. I tell you again, your master is an idiot. But, sir, but think you, if I don't go back to the house, I shall lose my place. Never mind. I will find a place for you. Let us begin. Latour sat down to the easel. Monsieur de la Reynière dismissed his valet the same evening. The servant's portrait was exhibited in the salon, and the anecdote was told everywhere. Everyone wished to know the hero of the affair, and soon there was rivalry as to who should obtain him for a servant. Amongst the portrait painters contemporary with Latour was his friend Perrineau, whose color is conventional but whose drawing is attractive. He is cold, and his coldness gives him a style and dignity which are respectable. There was also Ovid and Duplessis, the latter of whom is brilliantly represented in the museum at Avignon and the museum at Carpentras, his native town. There are portraits of Louis the Sixteenth and his brothers by him at Versailles, but they give less pleasure than his portrait of his compatriot, the sculptor Peru, in the Calvé Museum. Here Duplessis surpasses himself and is the precursor of the Romantic painters. Madame Viget Lebrun, who has left several portraits of Marie Antoinette, and the charming picture in the Louvre in which she represents herself holding her daughter in her arms, ought not to be forgotten, though her art is not perhaps very original. She possesses charm but not sufficient fidelity, for her portraits are not very like their originals, and this fault is not redeemed by her method which is uninteresting, nor by her colouring, which is more a process than a reproduction of nature. Another woman, Madame Guillard, had a virile and realistic talent, and many of the qualities which Madame Viget Lebrun lacked, but her chief excellence was a robust technique. Side by side with the genre painters, the creators of a land of poetry and the portrait painters, we find historical painters, the successors of Lebrun and Le Sueur. The king encouraged them from habit and a sense of veneration. State commissions still went to such painters as Juvinet, Coipel, Soublera, Pierre, Doyen, and Villon. How futile were the efforts made under the vigilant eyes of an official Mycenas, the Duc d'Anton, Tournem, Marigny, or the Comte d'Angivillier. Louis the Fourteenth or Louis the Fifteenth could not have dispensed with an official painter. Mariette, in his Abecedario, records a significant remark of Gersin, Watteau's master, who said, It is to be regretted that Watteau's first studies were not historical paintings. It is to be presumed that he would have become one of the greatest painters of France. To think that Watteau might not have been Watteau is to imagine that a rosebud might develop into a thistle. People were blinded by the prestige gained by the daubers of enormous canvases. They did not think that one day Gersin's regrets would contribute to his pupil's apotheosis. In this century of frills and furbelows, of the pompadour, of laughter and grace, 
of the return to nature, historical pictures were an anachronism. The heroes of Athens and Rome were too remote. Their cold appearance in the 17th century had created nothing. The arid soil could produce no more. It needed a redeemer. David came in the epic time at the end of the century, and in the midst of the triumphs of Napoleon, threw off the leading strings of his classical education and constituted himself a bold and victorious innovator. But it is not within the scope of the present work to recount that period of France's glory. We must be content to record the birth of a new genre cleverly grafted on traditional convention. We must further note particularly the fathers of modern landscape painting, and after them the painters of popular scenes, before completing this brief study of our debt to the eighteenth century. A tendency to show the time of day in the open air, in a park, or at the outskirts of a forest is already to be seen in the hunting scenes of Desportes and Oudry, though they are timid attempts in which people and animals are still the most important points. Joseph Vernet was the first to strike the right note. He seemed to prepare the way for Corot with his little views of Rome, the Ponte Rotto enveloped in the morning mist, and the castle of St. Angelo with its delicate greys and its golden tints, the treasures of one of the rooms of the French school at the Louvre. When looking at these pictures we recall the naive criticism of Mariette, it is by studying from nature and by working with the greatest application that he, Vernet, has acquired so beautiful a touch and has learned to render so truthfully the light and shade and the effects produced on the air by the vapors which rise from the earth or the water drawn upwards by the sun. It is in studying from nature. This was the great innovation of this period in some ways so artificial. The series of the Portes de France which Vernet painted by command of Louis the Fifteenth, are still in the Louvre, in detail they are very delicate, but as a whole they have an air of official monotony. Italy brought luck to Vernet, and it was there also in the shade of the Colosseum that Hubert Robert found his vocation. He brought back from Rome, from the studio of Panini, a taste for ruins and a talent for painting them. Robert knew how to compose with intelligence and art. He put sun, a real sun, on his ancient stones, he lightened his palate, gave depth to the sky and poetry to the silence of ruined temples. France has her canaletto in Pierre-Antoine de Machy. He was less brilliant and spontaneous than the Venetian master, but his views of Paris, of which there are a great number in the Carnavale Museum, have a certain interest, although they are perhaps cold. Comparing Hubert Robert and Machy, Diderot, in his Salon of 1761, made this very just remark. I watch Machy, ruler in hand, drawing the grooves of his columns. Robert has thrown all such instruments out of the window and has only kept his brushes. This was a good exposition of the verve and warmth of the true painter and the dry precision of the architect. The cottage also had its exponents. A shepherd, Simon Maturin La Dara, displayed his powers in some very interesting works, landscapes of the neighborhood of Béziers, Blois, and even Trieste, which, save that they lacked the perspective of fine palaces and the outlines of large ships, might compete with those of Claude Lorraine. With these happy creations, moonlight, setting sun, and mist effects, may be classed the pictures of Lazare, Broadet, Louis Gabriel Moreau's Fresh Landscapes Round Paris, and Jean Louis de Marne's Beautiful Perspectives. They have a historical significance. The origin of the French school of 1830, the school of Rousseau, Troyon, and Jules Dupre, must be sought among these early landscape painters, as well as in the famous Constable in the Louvre. Two artists remain to be mentioned not equally appreciated, but both very popular, one beloved of the connoisseurs and the other the favorite of the Sunday public at the Louvre. Chardon and Greuze have still their ardent admirers. Chardon has brought before us with a splendid power the poorer classes, their surroundings and atmosphere. Without him, 
we should know but little of the modest existences he has so lovingly reproduced in pictures now hanging in places of honour in the various museums if we were to judge the eighteenth century solely from the point of view of its painters we might get a very incomplete idea of it without chardon it is a pleasure to see his picture of the good mother setting her children down to table and asking a blessing on the food her clothing is graceful but displays nothing fanciful no false elegance she is a true bourgeoise this composition is exquisitely simple it is drawn with a broad and able brush without any harsh notes its sober harmony is perfect how much is due to chardon for having painted with such feeling and delicacy what he saw every day instead of wandering in some operatic olympus some dream country instead of bedizening his figures in the finery of past generations he was a true child of his century he gives us a clear impression of the familiar people who lived around him and as he had no imagination he had sufficient wit not to force his talent it was incontestably wise of chardin who was naturally an unpoetical painter to be content with prose besides his interiors he has left pictures of still life which are a feast for the eyes in them the light caresses the objects and puts them into high relief beautifully shaped fragile porcelain flowers fruit and articles of food form so many pretexts for giving us a lesson on art for showing us that the most commonplace object is capable of expressing correctness of drawing and the magic of colour when chardon had grown old and rich in experience he began to paint pastel portraits amongst others his own and that of his second wife marguerite puget now in the louvre they hang near the collection of la tours and bear this proximity bravely it must be admitted when looking at the works of this faithful master that the eighteenth century was not entirely the beribboned reign of affected pompaduraries diderot has given an excellent definition of his art one stops before a chardon he says almost instinctively as a traveller who is tired with a long journey sits down practically without realising it in a spot where there is a green bank silence water shade and freshness chardon was content with scanty remuneration he was accustomed to live on very little one day he was painting a hare when his friend le bas the engraver came in upon him le bas admired the hare and wanted to buy it it can be arranged said the painter you have a jacket which pleases me very much le bas took off his coat and carried away the picture diderot tells of a conversation of chardon's in which he appeals for indulgence and this is what he said gentlemen gentlemen be merciful find the worst among all these pictures here and know that two thousand miserable painters have broken their brushes between their teeth in despair of doing even as much he who has not felt the difficulty of art can do nothing of value and be assured that the majority of the high places in society would be empty if their occupants were submitted to an examination as severe as that we undergo good-bye gentlemen be indulgent these are the moving words of an old man with a heart full of love and kindness how delightful an artist and good a man was chardon greuze was the opposite of chardon a sentimental painter he has left us too many affected pictures for us to take his melodramatic scenes seriously although they are much praised by diderot who saw in them his own ideas on canvas greuze was certainly made by the famous critic as plutarch was made by montaigne and shakespeare his moral and moralizing art pleased diderot who wished painting like his own plays to be a school of fine principles and thought that he had found in greuze the apostle of his dreams chardon taught honesty naturally almost involuntarily he did not know how to teach anything else greuze's peasant girls are artificial these pretty flower sellers know nothing of the country but the flowers which are brought to paris and sold by them to the passer-by they know that they are pretty they have been told so by many and this is apparent in their enticing little faces 
yet Greus thought he was following the path of virtue. He set sail for Athens, intending to offer a sacrifice to Minerva, but he missed his way and put into another port. Diderot was not blind to Greus's faults. He has noted discreetly, it is true, his principal deficiencies. He saw that his figures lacked variety and that ten ears was very superior to him in color. We must not be more severe than Diderot. The Accorde de Village, village bride, which was exhibited in the Salon of 1761, had a great success and even now gets much praise from the general public. But the bride does not look as if she had come from a village, and it is difficult to understand the part played by the twelve comic opera actors who are artificially posed as if to produce some effect at the finale of an act. The sculptors were faithful to the French traditions, combining style with grace and suppleness. The exigencies of their art were not the same as in the time of Louis the Fourteenth. The standard of architecture had lowered several degrees, as had the royal prestige itself, and artists were no longer required to decorate the vast perspectives of Versailles or the large halls of the palace. People of this age loved privacy. They invented little apartments and in their gardens affected pavilions and tiny temples shut in by thickets. The school of Coiseau was continued by his nephews Nicole and Guillaume Coustou, the last of whom was the sculptor of the Chevaux de Marly, now at the entrance to the Champs-Élysées, a superb group in which Atalanta and Hippomenes are seen curbing the fire of their rearing steeds. The design is noble and the contours ingenious. In these we are still very near to the great century, and the same may be said of the unparalleled daring of Robert Le Lorrain bas-relief, the chevaux du soleil conduit à l'abreuvoir, watering the horses of the sun, which adorns the stables of the Hôtel de Rouen in the Marais and Primerie Nationale. Bouchardon, Pigal, Caffieri, Le Moine, Falconet, Houdon, and Clodion are most distinctly of the Louis the Fifteenth and Louis the Sixteenth period. Bouchardon combined the talents of architect and sculptor. He executed unaided the fountain in the Rue de Grenelle, ordered by the provost of merchants in 1739, for the convenience of the inhabitants and the adornment of the town. Pigal won fame by the somewhat complicated tomb of Maurice de Saxe in the Protestant church of Saint Thomas at Strasbourg. Le Moine and Philippe Caffieri brought the art of carving portraits to perfection. Their busts of Rotrou, the two Cornet and Clairon are preserved in the Comédie Française. Here again, Houdon is preeminent with his aesthetic statue of Voltaire. Falconet with his Three Graces, which was exhibited in Paris in 1900 and excited general admiration, produced the entirely new genre of the artistic trifle. He was rivaled by Clodion, who was despised in his own times, but is now in high favor. The factory of Sèvres, founded in opposition to the Dresden China factories, helped to stimulate the art of miniature figures. The architecture of the 18th century has suffered much from devastation. The beautiful chateau round Paris, so well adapted to private life and small gatherings, such as choisy le roi Bellevue, Lucienne, and Bagnolet, were an easy prey to the revolutionary hordes, but prints still show us what they were. The Petit Trianon, a triumph of graceful proportions and elegant simplicity of line, still remains. It was built 1762 to 1768 by Gabriel, the best architect of his time, and the one who had the most respect for French taste, Brimborion above Sèvres and Bagatelle in the midst of the Bois de Boulogne, are two other retreats which awaken memories of gentle souls who loved the country and of great ladies who played at being shepherdesses. Under Louis the Fifteenth, Saint-Sulpice was built by the Chevalier Servandoni, an Italian settled in France, more skilled in arranging the decorations of royal fetes or of the opera, than in constructing a really religious church. St. Genevieve, later to become the Pantheon, was also built during this reign. 
Here Soufflo combined ancient and Renaissance architecture and sacrificed to the fashionable sham Greek and Roman style of the day, which menaced the splendid Gothic cathedrals, for there were those who would have liked to have reconstructed them and adorned them with colonnades and pediments. Among the civil buildings must be mentioned the École Militaire and the Garde Meuble, now the Ministry of Marine, both by Gabriel, and the Place Louis XV, now the Place de la Concorde, the design of which was by the same architect, the descendant of a line of artists already celebrated under Louis XIV. Though Louis XV built, he also demolished. We shall never cease to regret the disappearance of the Galerie du Lys at Fontainebleau, which extended on the right of the Cour du Cheval Blanc and was replaced by an insignificant building of brick and stones in the Louis XIII style. Under Louis the Sixteenth, Paris was enriched by the building of the Beaujon Hospital, the École de Médecine, the École des Ponts et Chaussées, the Hospice des Jeunes Aveugles, the Théâtre Français, and the opera Salle Pelletier. Luxury was abandoned for utility. To this period also belong many of the houses in the Faubourg Saint Honoré. The interior decoration changed and became less rich gildings in high relief and immense chimney pieces now made way for well-lighted rooms with slightly carved panellings furnished with light seats and with door heads in framing pastoral pictures or portraits but no other pictures and none of those thousand and one objects which encumber our drawing-rooms and turn them into museums or bric-a-brac shops according to the means of the owner the place where these aristocratic surroundings can be best studied is the palace of versailles which from this point of view is the finest museum in the world here we may see the evolution which took place gradually from louis the fourteenth through the regency of louis the fifteenth and his grandson there is a great difference between the galerie des glaces and the rooms constructed for marie antoinette nothing was sumptuous enough for the great king nothing sufficiently intimate, one might almost say homely, for the Châtelain of the Trianon. This sketch of the artistic movement would be incomplete if we said nothing of music. Rameau, who was known for his Hippolyte at Arecy, Les Angalantes and Dardanus, continued Cambert's traditions and enriched orchestration. But after Rameau, who died in 1764, the French school was poor and all the composers we need mention are Philidor, Mondonville, Monsigny, and Dallerac, who originated the comedy with Ariettas, and with them two Belgians, who are also very French, Gossec and Gratry. The real triumphs went to a foreigner, the divine chevalier Gluck, Marie Antoinette's protégé. Her patronage was not necessary to make him exercise an influence on French opera, his genius was sufficient. The reception which the revivals of Orphée, Alceste, and Armide have received of late years prove Gluck's glory better than the most splendid eulogy. From Mozart to Berlioz and Wagner, all composers have recognized Gluck as a master who taught them the art of lyric declamation and subordinated song and rhythm to dramatic expression. The Italians, on the other hand, had for some time laid stress on the melody, the bel canto, without always troubling to produce any sympathy between the music and the words. Heated quarrels divided the two schools. They began in 1752 with the Guerre de Buffon, so called because the Italians were represented by an opera buffa company lately arrived in Paris. Then La Serva Pedrona of Pergolesi competed with Mandonville's Titon, a mediocre opera which owed a short-lived success to the choral. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was writing the Divin du Village, next entered the lists and published his Lettre sur la musique française, to which we have already referred. The hostilities began again with renewed vigor fifteen years later between Gluck and Piccini. The two rivals this time were worthy of each other. They each composed an Iphigenie en Tauride, which they produced simultaneously in Paris. The German composer gained the victory. 
but there was a continued strife between Glukists and Picinists. They hurled insults at each other even in the theatre. Bachemont says that during a performance of Alceste, at the end of the second act, Mademoiselle Levasseur was interrupted when she was singing Il me déchire et m'arrache le coeur, footnote, it tortures me and tears my heart out. Someone cried out, Ah, oh, mademoiselle, you are tearing out my ears. Ah, monsieur, said a neighbor, what a good thing if that could give you new ones. Beneath the notices of the operas of the two rivals, jests were written. The Glukis said of Piccini's Roland, the author of the poem lives in the Rue des Mauvaises Paroles, bad words, and the composer of the music in the Rue des Petits Chants, little songs. The Piccinists answered, Monsieur le Chevalier Gluck, the composer of Iphigenie, Orphée, Alceste, and Armide, lives in the Rue du Grand Heuleur, great howler. Snobs entered the lists. It is a consolation to know that they have always existed. People who had no idea of the art of music took sides blindly. Among them was the Chevalier de Chatelou, who said that Gluck was a barbarian. One day, says Madame de Genlis, he tried to dispute with the Marquis de Clermont, a capable musician. My friend, said Clermont, I am going to sing an air to you, and if you can beat the time of it, I will argue as much as you like on Gluck and Piccini. The Chevalier departed. He distrusted his ear. That ear which was so delicate that it could not stand the uncouth music of Iphigenie. Finally, we may mention some airs which have remained popular and which exhale the delicate perfume and all the charm of the 18th century. Gratrice, tandis que tu sommeil, from the Amont Jaloux. Exardes, Menuet, a unique work like Anvers Sonnet, and Martini's Plaisir d'Amour. The last-named musician was a German called Schwarzendorf, who, in spite of his Italian pseudonym, wrote exquisite French music. End of section 32. Section 33 of the 18th Century by Kashimir Stryensky, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 23, Part 2, The Sciences. It is difficult to define with any accuracy the influence of Frenchmen in the sphere of science, for its scope is essentially universal. Its various discoveries are connected with one another and affect the entire world, forming a continuous whole which may be compared to the nebulae of the Milky Way. For instance, in mathematics, Euler and the Bernoullis of Basel, Lagrange of Turin and Newton, lead us up to Clairaut and d'Alembert. Clairaut, who published his Théorie de la Figure de la Terre in 1743, after his return from his expedition to Lapland, on which he had been accompanied by de Maupertuis, Le Monnier, and Camus, and d'Alembert, who at twenty-six published his Traité Dynamique. It is noticeable that the French endeavored to go beyond pure theory and attempted to give it a general application. Thus Lalande and the Abbé Lacaille determined the distance between our planet and the moon, and the result of their calculations was definitely accepted. Lacaille spent four years, from 1751 to 1755, at the Cape of Good Hope at the expense of the state. His whole mission, including the cost of his instruments, cost 9,144 livres, five sous. When he went for payment to the treasury agents, these functionaries were greatly surprised, not being accustomed to deal with accounts which revealed such honesty. Money mattered nothing to the savant who thought himself sufficiently rewarded by the success of his lofty researches. The study of astronomy advanced in England more especially. Bradley and Herschel made important discoveries for the general benefit, such as the circular movement of the earth and the insertion of Uranus and the satellites of Saturn in the chart of the heavens. Again, it was foreigners who established the great physical laws, but de Réaumur in 1730 applied them to the thermometer 
and the brothers Montgolfier to aerostatics in 1783. Modern chemistry is indebted to Lavoisier, who was born in 1743 and died on the scaffold in 1794, and to Berthollet. The former discovered oxygen, and the latter expounded the laws of chemical affinities. Their progress necessitated a methodical nomenclature, which was proposed by Guiton de Morveau in 1782 and adopted by Lavoisier, Berthollet, and Fourcroy in 1786. This introduced light into chaos and caused a rapid advancement in practical utility and numerous industrial applications. The best known among the men of science was Buffon. In his masterly Histoire Naturelle he founded anthropology and ethnography, and in his Époque de la Nature he anticipated Cuvier's system in many respects. The Jussieu, La Cepet, and Do Bonton were his collaborators. Buffon is an admirable writer, and he even had time to give the secret of his talent. His Discours sur le style is a classic and a literary achievement of the highest merit. Before him, Fontenelle had already expounded science to the ignorant, but not quite so ably. Medicine was still backward and decidedly empirical with its eternal bleedings, ridiculed by Beaumarchais no less sharply than by Moliere. An Englishman, Jenner, introduced vaccination, and a Genevan, Tronchin, decided to become a hygienist rather than a dispenser of remedies. Once, when summoned to the Dauphiness, Marie-Joseph of Saxony, he had breakfast with the princess and found that she ate too fast. La Breuil, her physician in ordinary, intervened, and said that the meal usually took seven minutes. It must be fifteen, replied Tronchon. The Dauphine declared that she was accustomed to eat fast and could not do otherwise. You must learn, madame, for good digestion depends on it. Society was not accustomed to such authoritative statements or to such simple precepts, which seemed to show so little learning. Consequently, Trochon had to defend himself against his confrère in Paris. He caused a revolution and excited much jealousy. The apothecaries were forced to lay down their arms. The Genevan met with great success, and everyone wanted to consult him. The esculaps of the period laughed when Trochon placed the Duc de Gramont on a diet of cold meat and ordered Monsieur de Puisiol to rub himself with pomade, explaining that his internal condition was sound, but that his skin, which he termed the pie crust, was too dry, and that this dryness prevented perspiration. They laughed again when the foreign doctor recommended exercise for women were it only to sweep out their own rooms but the sick were all the better for following his wise prescriptions, and the mockers were made to look foolish. A new science, political economy, was created in the 18th century. It was based on material phenomena and the social interests dependent on them. It studied the productive forces of nature and reckoned with the needs and aspirations of man. Madame de Pompadour's doctor, Quenet, was the real pioneer of political economy, and his aims were summed up in Turgot's motto, freedom of labor and barter. D'Alembert and Diderot conceived the idea of combining scientific ideas and all that was known of the various branches of knowledge in a historical work. Such was the origin of the Encyclopédie or Dictionnaire raisonné des sciences, des arts et des métiers the great palladium of the century. The first volume appeared in 1751 and the 17th in 1765. Those who are wrongly termed philosophers and should be called the secret enemies of metaphysics made use of this vast store of knowledge to deny everything that was not founded on reason alone, forgetting that though certain facts may be inexplicable, they are nonetheless worthy to be considered and discussed. A leader of modern thought has made the excellent criticism that the encyclopedists knew everything except the indescribable something. Their science distinguishes things as snow distinguishes objects. It isolates and freezes them. Supernatural belief and at the same time traditions were overthrown, 
and skepticism became the fashion. The light which these new men diffused for the future enlightened a merely rationalistic world. The benefits of their physical discoveries compensated humanity to a certain extent, but they forgot that the soul as well as the mind needs comfort and support. Their work was not completely successful. It was lacking in the immortal flame of aspiration towards a future life. To deny a thing does not destroy it. Neither a nation nor a morality can be killed, in spite of the faults and errors of their representatives. D'Alembert and Diderot attracted a pleiad of famous collaborators, Montesquieu, Rousseau, Buffon, Turgot, and Condillac, each in his own department dealt with purely scientific questions from an uncontroversial standpoint. We may cite Montesquieu's article on taste, Rousseau's dissertation on music, or Turgot's essays on social and administrative economy. After them, Voltaire and Olbach were more aggressive, for they took the bull by the horns without always raising their masks. Here the encyclopédie becomes an arena wherein the champions, apparently ashamed of the blows they struck, used the weapon of anonymity. In this they were only half French, for they had no courage. Voltaire was the cleverest advertiser of his times. No one knew better than he did how to secure the success of a work, especially if it were his own. There is a very witty passage of his in which he praises the usefulness of the encyclopédie, pointing out carefully all the good points and cleverly glassing over the bad ones. Under Louis the Fifteenth, at a little supper, a discussion arose on ignorance. It is funny, said the Duc de Nivernais, that we amuse ourselves daily killing partridges in the park of Versailles, and sometimes killing men or being killed on the frontier, without knowing exactly what it is that kills. Alas, it is the same with everything in the world, answered Madame de Pompadour, I do not know what the rouge which I put on my cheeks is composed of, and I should be much embarrassed if someone asked me how the silk stockings which I am wearing are made. It is a pity, said the Duc de la Valliere, that Our Majesty has confiscated our Dictionnaire Encyclopédique, which costs us each a hundred pistoles. We should soon have found in it the key to everything." The king sent for the seventeen volumes, and they learnt from them all they had wished to know. Ah, what a splendid book, cried the marquise. Sire, did you confiscate this depository of all useful things, so as to be its sole possessor and the only savant in your kingdom? Really, answered Louis the Fifteenth, I do not know why I was told so much against this book. Well, do you not see, sire, answered the Duc de Nivernais, it is because it is excellent. People never object to the mediocre and dull in anything. If women try to make a newcomer look ridiculous, it is because she is prettier than they. Sire went on the Comte de Coigny. You are very happy that men have been found in your reign who know all the arts and can transmit them to posterity. Everything is here from how a pin is made to how to cast and point a cannon from the smallest to the greatest things. Thank God that your kingdom is the birthplace of those who have served the entire universe. The other nations must buy the encyclopédie or imitate it. Take everything I have, but give me back my encyclopédie. All the same, said the king, they say that there are many faults in this necessary and admirable work. Sire, said the Comte de Coigny, there are two badly made ragouts at your supper. We did not eat them, and yet we have had plenty. Would you have liked the whole supper to have been thrown out of the window because of those two ragouts? This scene gives a sparkling summary of a royal conversation. As for the comparison at the end, it was too generous. Except for about fifty articles, the famous Dictionnaire Raisonné is of very little interest. Besides the articles which are out of date, there are many more than two badly made articles in the seventeen volumes. For the rest, Voltaire was quite correct when he said that the encyclopédie was a harlequin's coat, with a great many pieces of good material, but also a great quantity of rags. End of section 33
Section 34 of the 18th Century by Kashimir Stryensky, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 23, Part 3, Literature, Part 1. The literature of the 18th century is the mirror of this positive, seditious period, in which ideas were everything in their expression, very little. The traditions of beautiful style remained, but the heritage was not always respected. Such philosophical times do not breed poets, and the springs of Hippocrene were dry. The age had the poets that it deserved. Voltaire, whose name immediately suggests itself when any manifestation of brilliance is under discussion, has left epistles, stanzas, and short poems, and even an epic poem, and a shameful burlesque. But practically his one poetic talent lay in correct rhyming and scansion. His malice and ingenuity appear in some of his verses and give them a certain attraction. He knew how to write a madrigal, but he flattered everyone and knocked at all doors at the same time, with the result that his able rhetoric is quite lacking in sincerity. He flattered in turn the regent, the young king, Frederick the Second, the queen, the dauphines, the favorites from Madame de Prie to Madame du Barry, a strange medley of contradictory eulogies and of substantial benefits. Voltaire wrote to the king of Prussia, O oh, philosophe roi, que ma carrière est belle. J'irai de sans souci par des chemins de fleurs, aux champs Elysiens parler à ma corelle, du plus grand de ses successeurs. À Saluste, jaloux, je lirai votre histoire, à Lycurgue, vos lois, à Virgile, vos vers. Je surprendrai les morts, ils ne pourront me croire. Nul deux n'a rassemblé tant de talents divers. O oh, philosopher king, how fair is my prospect! I shall go from Sans Souci by a flowery path to the Elysian fields to speak to Marcus Aurelius of the greatest of his successors. To jealous Sallust I shall read your history, to Lycurgus your laws, and to Virgil your verses. I shall surprise the dead, they will not be able to believe me. None of them have combined so many different talents. He sent the same exaggerated compliments to Louis the Fifteenth, George the First, Maria Theresa, Catherine the Second, and Gustavus the Third. But poetry was not Voltaire's fort. Prose was necessary to his lucid mind. The other poets of the period are forgotten. No one reads La Motte Tudard, Thomas, Berny, Saint Lambert. Rouchet, Le Bon, Malfilatre, or Le Franc de Pompignon now. Some, like Jean-Baptiste Rousseau, Gilbert, Grisset, and Delisle, still have a place in anthologies, but their verses are like dried flowers in a collection. Others, such as Parny, Gentil Bernard, Dora, and Piron, are excluded altogether. Their licentious verses have been relegated to the back of the bookshelf, safe from youthful curiosity. One true poet only, André Chénier, was living at the end of the century. He was born at Constantinople. His mother was Greek and his father French, and he seemed predestined to say, Sur des pensées nouveaux faites des vers antiques, antique verses on new thoughts. He defended the French language, which had been stigmatized by versifiers, who thought to excuse themselves by complaining of the instrument they did not know how to use. Il n'est so traducteur de sa richesse enflée, so tauteur d'un poème ou d'un discours sifflé, qui ne vous avertise en sa fière préface, que si son style épais vous fatigue d'abord, si son vers est gêné, sans feu, sans harmonie, il n'en est point coupable, il n'est pas sans génie, il a tous les talents qui font les grands succès, Mais enfin, malgré lui, ce langage français, si faible en ses couleurs, si froid et si timide, la constrait d'être lourde, gauche, plat, insipide. Every foolish translator puffed up with his wealth, every author of a poem or of a discourse which has been hissed, tells you in his pompous preface, 
that if his heavy style tires you at first, if his verses are awkward, without fire and without harmony, he is not to blame. He is not without genius. He has all the talents necessary for a great success. But in spite of himself, this French language, so weak in color, so cold and so timid, has forced him to be ponderous, clumsy, dull, and insipid. Chenier had that unpremeditated expression which has its birth with the inspiration and is inseparable from it. He could always find the rhythm, the imagery, and the form which suited his ideas. All these came to him at once, and thus he was a true poet. The secret had been lost for a hundred years, and Chenier rediscovered it. He makes the gentle kingfishers weep over Myrto, the young Tarentine, and over the young captive whom he endows with an emotion long unknown. Harmony had been forgotten, when all at once sounds like these were heard. Je ne suis qu'au panton, je veux voir la moisson, et comme le soleil de saison en saison, je veux achever mon année, brillante sur ma tige et de l'honneur du jardin. Je n'ai vu louir encore que les feux du matin, Je veux achever ma journée. I have only seen the spring, and I wish to behold the harvest. Like the sun from season to season, I wish to finish my year. Shining on my stalk, the honor of the garden, I have seen as yet only the morning fires. I wish to finish my day. He made the blind poet, the divine Homer, live again in an atmosphere of beauty, he repeopled the poetic desert with his visions of Greece and his noble enthusiasm. He reawakened the soul of France with the magic of his melodious words. He had faults, it is true. His verses were sometimes violent and rhetorical, and he perhaps relied too much on myths. But though he sometimes indulged too freely in paraphrase, he made prosody more flexible and freed it from restraint. André Chenier died on the scaffold on the 7th of Thermidor at 30 years of age, when Fouquier Tinville had ceased to keep count of his innocent victims. The poet Rouchet was on the same cart with him, and the two friends exchanged this conversation. You, said Chenier, the most irreproachable of our citizens, a father, an adored husband, they are sacrificing you. You, answered Rouchet, you virtuous young man, they are leading you to death glowing with genius and hope. I have done nothing for posterity, answered Chenier, and then he struck his forehead and was heard to add, all the same I had something there. They both talked of poetry until the last moment and recited a scene of Andromaque, borrowing the words of Orestes and Pilates as if to take courage under the protection of Racine. We. Oui puisque je retrouve un ami si fidèle. Yes, as I find again so faithful a friend. The dramatists endeavored to maintain the prestige of tragedy and poured forth their Alexandrines, but their dramas, though often well designed, had more regard for the tastes of the public for whom they had been composed than for art, however they enriched their authors and the booksellers and gave excellent opportunities to excellent actors. With the exception of Voltaire's Zaire, an imitation of Shakespeare, which was the masterpiece of the Louis XV style, and his Merope, nothing of this vast repertory has survived. Who would think of reviving Crébillon's tragedies with their improbable scenes founded on incognitos, or those of Lemierre, La Harpe, Bellois, who wrote Le Siège de Calais, or Sauron? Ducey, with his feeble adaptations of Shakespeare, was well-intentioned, but artless and ridiculous. Comedy in verse was more honorably upheld. Not that any pleasure can be derived from glancing at the works of de Touche. It is better to go back to the source from which he draws his material, La Bouillère. Having borrowed his character, such as the ungrateful, the irresolute, the calumniator, or the boaster from the latter, he dramatized it as well as he could with a setting of supernumeraries and puppets. Let us give de Touche the credit due to him for the following line which is so often attributed to Boileau. La critique est aisée et l'art est difficile. Criticism is easy and art is difficult. 
Destouches had the further distinction of being preferred to Moliere by Lessing in his Hamburgische Dramaturgie. Satirical comedies such as Piron's Metromenie and Grasset's Méchant raised the standard of the theatre. Piron drew the character of a poet who could see nothing but poetry in everything very wittily. His metromaniac pursued the passers-by with his verses and was always dreaming abstractedly. He did not live in the same planet as mankind. The plot of this comedy is very complex, but it shows its superiority in its natural and expressive style. The famous quotation, J'ai ri et me voilà des armées, I laughed and so was disarmed, is from Metromenie. Grasset, the author of Ver Ver, tried his hand at comedy and had some success. His méchant says, Les sots sont ici bas pour nos menus plaisir. Fools are here below for our distraction. And the whole play is merely a development of this clever line. Cléon takes a malicious pleasure not only in laughing at exhibitions of foolishness but in provoking them. A young coxcomb thinks it fine to follow his example, and there is an extremely funny dialogue between the méchant and his pupil. The five acts are filled with familiar and much-quoted verses. L'esprit qu'on veut avoir, gat celui qu'on a. The wit one wishes to have spoils that which one has. L'aigle d'une maison ne conso dans une autre. The eagle of one house is but a fool in another. Elle a dans ses beaux yeux pour des yeux de Provence. Her eyes are fairly beautiful for provincial eyes. There were no real successors to Molière and Regnard. Piron and Grasset, however, were able to amuse their contemporaries, and they created some types which amuse us also. But two dramatists, Marivaux and Beaumarchais, struck an entirely new note, and seemed to sum up all the wit of the eighteenth century as perfectly as Watteau and Latour. There were some attempts at sentimental comedies and popular dramas, La Chaussée and Diderot were in this respect the somewhat tedious and solemn ancestors of melodrama. They outlined a genre which was to develop later with a liberal admixture of laughter and tears. But Marivaux and Beaumarchais left a definitive work with strongly marked individuality. They seem to have had no masters and to have formed no pupils. It is difficult to imitate the charming subtlety of Marivaux, and the audacious impertinence of Beaumarchais. The mark of the creative writer is that he cannot be imitated. The author of Fausse Confidence was so original that a word had to be coined to describe his talent and wit. This word is marivaudage, and by it his comedies may be recognized as all his actors marivaud. That is to say, speak with an ease, grace, and irony that can scarcely be met elsewhere. They are all akin, the Lucilles and Dorant, as well as the Lisette and Lubin, the countesses and coxcombs, as well as the maids and valets. This may be a fault from the standpoint of dramatic truth, but he takes his reader into a romantic dream, into a rose and blue world, and we must become familiar with the exceptional beings who people this realm of poetry. A great critic, Paul de Saint-Victoire has so well expressed the enchantment produced by Marivaux's plays that we cannot refrain from quoting him. He tells a pretty story about them. A fairy entered at midnight the great hall of an old castle hung with high warp tapestries. The shepherds of the Astre and the nymphs of the Amant were playing their flutes or drawing their bows, enthroned on clouds or conversing in green arbors all along walls transformed into idyllic gardens. But the autumn of centuries had passed over this spring of color. The sky was getting yellow, and the figures themselves had begun to fade. All these frail people were falling away stitch by stitch, showing the inner void. A few days more, and their fictitious existence would be over. The fairy touched this phantasmagoria with her wand, and suddenly a magic life animated it. That is the miracle which occurs at each revival of Marivaux's comedies, which are now as faded as ancient tapestry. 
this society of which he has recorded the fleeting brilliance in a silver and silken style is a thing of the past the characters are as strange to us as the inhabitants of the planet venus yet whenever this el dorado is staged the charm works and the enchantment is complete we once more fall in love with this exquisite world these delicate metaphysics and the gentle maids whose subtle loves makes one think of the marriage of flowers and the interchange of their perfumes one of the dialogues will give a better idea of marivaudage than any commentary the following takes place between lepine the marquis's valet and lisette the countess's maid who exchange gallant remarks lisette i am busy and shall leave you lepine gently mademoiselle wait a minute i think it time to tell you of a little accident that is happening to me lisette well lepine as a man of honour i had not realised your charms i was not acquainted with your appearance lisette what does that matter i can say the same about you i have only just got to know yours lepine the lady thought that we loved each other lisette well she thought wrong lepine wait this is the accident her words made my eyes rest on you more attentively than usual it is certain that my master has very tender feelings for your mistress this very day he told me that he contemplated telling you of his sentiments lisette just as he likes the answer that i shall have the honour of communicating to him will be short lepine let us note by the way that the countess likes the society of my master and that it delights her to see him you will say that our people are strange creatures and i agree with you the marquis who is a simple man and not at all daring in his speech will never venture to make a declaration and the countess is terrified of declarations in this conjuncture i consider we had better encourage these two what will happen they will love each other honestly and simply and they will marry in the same way what will follow that when you see me your comrade you will make me your husband from the sweet habit of seeing me well then speak are you willing if the countess and lisette had said yes immediately the comedy would have been finished too soon and there would have been no marivaudage but our author has to follow a labyrinth before arriving at a foregone conclusion and that is the secret of his subtle art and his sentimentality his conversations in which there is never a raising of voices never anything dull are a pleasure to readers even more perhaps than to spectators a pleasure similar to that which we feel when looking at a scene by watteau he revives the age of elegance and refinement End of section thirty four section thirty five of the eighteenth century by kashimir striensky translated by henry neville dickinson this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter twenty three part three literature part two beaumarchais's comedies are so intimately connected with the social movement of the century that it has already been necessary to refer to them in connection with the mariage de figaro which created such a sensation in seventeen eighty four it announced the new era in clarion notes beaumarchais had given evidence of his talent before this brilliant satire on february twenty third seventeen seventy five the barbier de seville was produced in which figaro created to utter caustic aphorisms prepared the public for the audacities to come he begins with such dicta as the great do us sufficient good when they do us no harm and considering the virtues required of a domestic does your excellency know many masters who are fit to be servants as he began so he continued in the mariage he puts away all restraint and openly pleaded the cause of the oppressed because you are a great noble you believe yourself to be a great genius nobility fortune rank place all these things make men proud what have you done for all these fine things you have done nothing but give yourself the trouble of being born in other respects you are quite an ordinary individual 
while I, who am lost in the crowd of the obscure, have had to display more science and more calculation merely to exist than have been expended for the last hundred years in the government of all the Spains. Figaro's description of his existence in the famous monologue in the fifth act ends with an extremely pessimistic confession. Now master, now servant, as it pleases fortune, made ambitious by vanity and laborious by necessity, but delighting in idleness. I have seen everything, done everything, worn out everything. Then my illusions were shattered, and I am disabused, disabused. We can see what this full journée means, how its comic humor and reckless wit will speedily lead to the abandonment of principles. These two comedies, though one is scarcely more than a timid preface to the other, are the whole of Beaumarchais. The rest of his plays are unimportant. Neither his first two productions, Eugenie, published in 1767, and Les Deux Amis, published in 1770, nor his last comedy, La Mère Coupable, a sequel to The Mariage de Figaro, can be compared with the masterpieces which still charm us, though we have forgotten the moment at which they were written and the influence they had on the already doomed reign of the unhappy Louis the Sixteenth. Beaumarchais broadened the theatrical horizon. He made a rostrum of the stage. The prose writers, moralists, philosophers, or historians who are next to be dealt with show where the dramatist found his inspiration. He was the brilliant mouthpiece of the ideas of Montesquieu, Voltaire, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, to quote only the great leaders. Charles Seconda, Baron de la Brede et de Montesquieu, published his Lettres Persanes in 1729 in the middle of the Regency. This nobleman, who was president of the Bordeaux Parliament, made his first appearance with a book which was apparently light, but which nevertheless foreshadowed the author of the Esprit des Lois. His Persian, who was so anxious to know Paris, was a shrewd observer, a witty satirist, and had read La Bouillère. He made jokes, but he touched on grave social, political, and religious questions. In his Considération sur la grandeur et la décadence des Romains, and the Esprit des Lois which followed it, serious though these works are, we are sometimes astonished to find reminiscences of Usbeck's vein of humor. Madame du Défon called the Esprit des Lois witticisms on the laws, de l'esprit sur les lois, and Voltaire asked if it were seemly to make jokes in a work on jurisprudence. But these echoes of the style of the Lettres Persanes in no way detract from the value of these books and Montesquieu's exposition of the philosophy of modern history. It is not fortune which governs the world, he says. There are general causes, either moral or physical, which raise, maintain, or overthrow each monarchy. All the incidents are in subjection to these causes. If the loss of a battle, that is to say a particular cause, has destroyed a state, there must have been a general cause which made it possible for this state to perish as the result of a single battle. In short, the general tendencies bring about all the particular incidents. Montesquieu upset Bossuet's divine theory and explained how laws are formed under the influence of government, climate, religion, and custom. His style gave jurisprudence a place in literature, just as the brilliant writer Buffon gave natural history a claim to rank as such. Voltaire at the age of twenty-five and seventeen nineteen, had his Edip produced, and until his death in 1778 he wrote indefatigably for the public and his friends. His letters in many volumes form nearly a third of his works and are attractive reading. In these he faithfully portrays himself with his enthusiasms, weaknesses, love of his neighbor and himself, his temperament and his infirmities, they all have intense vitality, the language is marvellous, limpid, and clear, the tone by turns tender, violent, or witty. 
they are the psychological index of the most active existence the world has ever seen voltaire the man did not sufficiently resemble voltaire the writer his character was mediocre under the cloak of an apostle of noble and generous ideas the dress of the courtier is always to be seen across that face of a superb classic ugliness immortalized by Houdon, flits a disconcerting ironical smile it is indeed the face of a man who has scoffed at holy things and yet voltaire was a king at the end of his life he reigned supreme over men's minds and all the intellectuals felt this influence which was prolonged through so many generations a quarrel may be said to have decided voltaire's vocation he was beaten by the chevalier de rohan's servants put in the bastille and only released after a fortnight on condition that he would go to england may second seventeen twenty six whence he brought back his lettres philosophiques which were published in seventeen thirty four these letters created a great stir they popularized english ideas and caused more to be known about bacon locke and newton the religious sects and the english constitution they also revealed shakespeare to the french voltaire's sarcastic temperament could not resist comparisons between the liberties of one country and the privileges of the other he said a man because he is noble or a priest is not exempt here from paying certain taxes every one pays every one gives not according to his rank which is absurd but according to his income the english nation is the only one in the world which has succeeded in regulating the power of kings by resisting them if there were only one religion in england its despotism would be a menace if there were two they would cut each other's throats but there are thirty and they live happily and in peace men denounced the horrible consequences of maxims predestined to arm subjects and foment revolts the abbe molinier thus defines his adversaries the philosopher's profession of faith it is a new sort of monster in society which acknowledges none of the claims of custom propriety politics or religion anything may be expected from these gentlemen voltaire began the campaign which was to last through the whole century by a decree june tenth seventeen thirty four the parliament ordered his lettre to be publicly burned this made him nervous and he took refuge at cire sur blaise with the marquise de chatelet the celebrated mathematician once there as it was near the frontier he could cross into lorraine at the first sign of danger at circe the young philosopher began his siècle de louis xiv thus continuing his historical work which had so successful a beginning in his charles the twelfth he regained favor at court was made gentleman in ordinary and royal historian and finally was elected to the academy francaise in seventeen forty six when madame du chatelet died he decided to accept the king of prussia's repeated offers and went to potsdam to him whom he had called the solomon of the north he was delighted with his host and his court a hundred and fifty thousand victorious soldiers he wrote no public prosecutor opera comedy philosophy poetry a philosophical and poetic hero grandeur and grace grenadiers and muses trumpets and violins platonic repose society and liberty who would believe it all this is true this dream was to last three years at first voltaire said i give an hour each day to the king of prussia to polish up his prose and poetical works i am his grammarian not his chamberlain then when a quarrel arose about maupertuis the geometrician president of the berlin academy he remarked that his duty was to wash the king's dirty linen whilst frederick declared cynically one squeezes the orange and throws away the skin voltaire went in search of liberty to the territory of the genevan republic and took an estate at st jean which he called les delices it still exists near the gates of the town but here he came into collision with the narrowness of certain calvinistic ideas le quai came to les delices 
and gave some performances which aroused the susceptibilities of the consistory, the enemy of innovation so contrary to religion and morals. Then began in 1755 Voltaire's quarrel with Rousseau about the poems sur le désastre de Lisbonne. Jean-Jacques wrote a defense of Providence, which Voltaire answered with his candide. This finished the discussion. But Les Delices had lost its charm, and Voltaire went to live at Ferney in the district of Gex, and there for twenty years he combined the roles of nobleman, somewhat unscrupulous speculator, and literary man. He still held the Tournay estate which had been presented to him by the President des Brosses, and he used to say, I am of every nation. He certainly possessed a large tract of land stretching into Switzerland, Geneva, France, and the Duchy of Savoy. He wrote to his friend Thierro, It brings in altogether about 10,000 livres of annual income, and it saves me more than 20,000, for these three estates practically pay all the expenses of a household in which I have more than 30 people and more than 12 horses to feed. Fernay is now a pilgrimage for all travelers who stop at Geneva. There is the chateau in the Doric style of architecture, on the frieze of which Voltaire Fekit was inscribed. The rooms are spacious, filled with souvenirs, and the park is especially stately. Voltaire could say with justice, Fernay has become one of the pleasantest spots on earth. I have made gardens which are like the tragedy which is forming in my head. They are like nothing else. Vines and festoons stretch away into the distance, four rustic gardens at the four cardinal points, the house in the middle, practically no regularity. Today the trees have grown, the hedges are thick and well kept, the walks are shady, and the great green arbors have all the poetry of beautiful old things. In such a spot it is easy to conjure up visions of the life of a man supremely happy, in that he was conscious of his good fortune. From Ferney, Voltaire sent forth many works, the Dictionnaire philosophique, and in 1764, Histoire de la Russie sous Pierre le Grand, and philanthropic pamphlets, such as the Commentaire des Délits et des Peines, Le Cri du Sang Innocent, and others connected with his celebrated vindications of Callas, Sirvin, and Lali Tolendal. In February 1778, the Patriarch went to Paris, where an enthusiastic reception awaited him. The people crowded into the streets to see him pass. The horses were taken out of his carriage, which was then drawn by his admirers. Visitors flocked to him, among them deputations from the Comédie Française and the Académie, Gluck, Madame Necker, Madame de Polignac, representing the Queen, Madame du Barry, and ambassadors such as Franklin, whose grandson he blessed, saying, God and Liberty. On March 30th, after the sixth performance of Irene, the actors crowned the bust of the dramatist before a crowd of enthusiastic spectators. You wish then to kill me with glory, said the poet. He did not know how truly he was speaking. He died on May 30th at the house of his friend, the Marquis de Villette, at the corner of the Rue de Bonne and the Quai Voltaire, formerly the Quai des Théatins. He passed away terrified at the thought of the great mystery. He received priests, but only made a lay confession. I die adoring God, loving my friends and not hating my enemies, and loathing persecution. His name has been a political watchword under different regime, but in this respect times have changed, and it has now lost its prestige. A master of modern criticism, M. G. Lançon, has said with justice, It seems to me incontestable that if Voltaire continues to exercise any influence on our France, it must be a purely literary and intellectual influence. Since the downfall of naturalism and the symbolistic crisis, the evolution of prose must be toward brilliant light, that is to say, the 18th century and Voltaire. If the patriarch of Ferney was happy, Jean-Jacques Rousseau was the most unhappy man of his times. He was sickly from a child. All through his life he suffered both in body and mind. He was strange, brusque, surly, and full of pride, and yet he was timid, sympathetic, and kind, and he inspires a profound pity. 
and the consideration which one feels for the irresponsible and the unbalanced. Rousseau, in spite of everything, forces us to admire his literary powers. It is impossible to deny his genius as a writer, the novelty of his harmonious diction and the emotions, slightly morbid, which he felt in contemplating nature. He rendered prose poetical and, putting green on his palate, unfolded the beauties of the country. He was the forerunner of a generation of stylists, numbering among them Bernardin de Saint-Pierre and Chateaubriand. Madame de Sévigné had introduced La Feuille qui chante, the singing leaf, but that was a mere solo. Jean-Jacques gave the whole symphony. He was born at Geneva in 1712. His education was neglected, he had no fortune, and had consequently to think of making his own livelihood. He tried everything. He was scribe, engraver, teacher, practically a domestic servant, secretary and copyist of music. His existence was a paradox, like his thoughts in his work. He began to write when he was nearly thirty, and his first success was the Discours sur les sciences et les arts, which was crowned by the Dijon Academy in 1750. In this he set himself against society and civilization. Next he wrote the Nouvelle Eloise and Émile, that strange contradictory treatise written for other people's children by a man who repudiated his own. Emile was rewarded by a decree of arrest. He left Paris by favor of the Maréchal de Luxembourg and took refuge first in Switzerland and then in England. Afterwards he returned to France and accepted the hospitality of the Marquis de Girardin as he accepted the hospitality of so many nobles whose kindness he abused. He died at M. Mononville in 1778, some weeks after his cruel enemy Voltaire. Rousseau was the most personal of the philosophers. The general idea of all his works is that man was good and that society made him wicked, that he was free and that society made him a slave, that he was happy and that society made him miserable. He preached for the good of all, but in reality he was defending his own cause. His defense was all the more sincere. He sought remedies for the existing state of things and set them forth in the Nouvelle Eloise, but unfortunately did not find them for himself. From the point of view of politics, he explained in the Contrat Social what society should be, and his book formed the gospel of the Constituent Assembly. In it they found the principles of equality, liberty, and fraternity, and adopting the profession de foi du vicaire Savoyard, they maintained the omnipotence of God, the source of moral energy. Thus an entire creed was evolved from this troubled life and excited brain. Its details are somewhat contradictory, but as a whole it shows complete unity. To Rousseau's credit, it must be said that he never disowned his books, and never, like Voltaire, wrote anonymously. From a social point of view, some people hold the 18th century to be the great century. This sketch of the writers of the period shows the new elements they introduced into literature and the conceptions they gave to the world. In this respect, they are great. Voltaire, Montesquieu, Rousseau, and Beaumarchais spoke with infinite brilliance and eloquence, each in his own way upheld the complaints of the people against the privileged classes. But they saw their work accomplished, and their works are retrospective witnesses thereto. Under Louis the Fourteenth, the masterpieces of Bossuet, Racine, Moliere, Corneille, Pascal, and La Bruyere soar above their times and will be always a source of pure artistic delight. The beauty and eternal interest of the Horizon Funèbre, Andromaque, Le Misanthrope, Le Cid, Les Pensées et Les Caractères have no true parallels in the 18th century. End of section 35。Section 36 of the 18th century by Kaishi Mirstriensky, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 23, Part 4, The Salon. 
the society which devoured the works of the philosophers and rushed in crowds to the theatre when beaumarchais was played claims a place in this last chapter the salon where authors expounded their ideas before having them printed give an insight into literary manners and complete the picture these gatherings date really from the death of louis the fourteenth until then courtiers were contented with one circle and the homage went to one person alone madame du maine marks the transition from the seventeenth to the eighteenth century so was still a court it was there that the grandes nuits were instituted meetings devoted to gaming and literary diversions whose subject was always praise of the mistress of this semi-royal household one evening a deputation from greenland made a surprise visit renown said the chief has told us of the virtues charms and inclinations of your most serene highness we have seen that she abhors the sun and they offered the crown of greenland to the princess another time the diversion was astronomic savants had discovered a new star and that star was madame du maine her intimates who were responsible for these flatteries were numerous first of all malzieux ex-tutor to the duc de maine who combined the roles of secretary and savant his decision said the brilliant madame de stal delaunay attendant on madame du maine were as infallible as were those of pythagoras amongst his disciples the hottest disputes ended the moment that any one asserted he said so then there was the cardinal de polignac titular professor of philosophy to the little court he was the author of the anti lucrece a latin poem written in defence of morals and theology another was the president de mem who unbent so far as to perform comedies for the duchess's diversion there were others among them who were genuine men of letters such as the abbe de chaulieu the poet fontenelle and voltaire on one occasion some one asked fontenelle in the duchess's presence what is the difference between a clock and madame du maine one tells the hours the other makes one forget them replied fontenelle voltaire to redeem a forfeit made the following well-known enigma cinq voyelles une consonne en francais compose mon homme et je porte sur ma personne de quoi l'écrire sans crayon five vowels and one consonant compose my name in french and i carry on my person that with which to write it out without a pencil every one was in ecstasies when the duchesse guessed oiseau a bird it is strange that the Selimar conspiracy should have originated in this atmosphere but this opera goddess naturally aspired to play a part in a tragic comedy we may pass over the regent's court at the palais royal celebrated for its suppers and orgies the next salon of importance was that of the prince de conti who received a select society at the temple in olivier's little picture in the louvre we are shown the princesse de beauvau the comtesse de boufflet and the comtesse d'egmont the marechal de luxembourg the marechal de mirepoix the president Hainaut, the bailli de chabrian pont de Vail, Truden, and others the child mozart is at the harpsichord and beside him is Géliot singing and accompanying himself on the guitar this picture is a most precious document it shows the atmosphere of sober elegance which reigned at the meetings of all these great ladies clever men and artists the prince de conti was that louis francois de bourbon who was for a long time candidate for the throne of poland and was concerned in the secret diplomacy of louis the fifteenth his versailles was the chateau de l'île adam according to a contemporary he was very well made and in that respect he was unlike the rest of the contis who had an hereditary hump his bearing was noble and majestic his features handsome and regular his face agreeable and intellectual and his looks proud or gentle as occasion demanded he expressed himself on every subject with considerable warmth and power 
he had conducted many brilliant campaigns, particularly in Italy in 1744. He was even compared to his ancestor, the hero of Lens and Roqua. He was one of the protectors of Rousseau, Beaumarchais, and the Chevalier de Florian. The Prince de Conti will always be the type of a witty and intelligent patrician. But it was private individuals and even ladies of the middle classes who gave the tone to society. With them there was more conscious freedom and less feeling of restraint. In their houses there was a sort of republic on Athenian lines, composed of men of the world and men of letters. We will enter some of their doors, and the Marquise de Lambert, Madame de Tonsin, and Madame de Geoffrin shall in turn disclose the histories of their little kingdoms. The Marquise de Lambert was a woman of considerable attainments. This fact is proved by her avis à sa fille, her avis à son fils, and her traité de la vieillesse. Her ideas were shrewd and her style good, if a trifle labored, and she was a judge of character. Some of her maxims, which date from the end of Louis the Fourteenth's reign, anticipate Vauvenard and Rousseau. For instance, accustom yourselves to show kindness and consideration to your servants. An ancient writer once said that they should be regarded as unfortunate friends. By the word conscience, I mean that inward sense in an honorable man, which tells him whether he has anything with which to reprove himself. I exhort you, my son, to improve your heart far more than to perfect your mind. Man's true greatness is in his heart. She lived in a part of the old Palais Mazarin which she rented from the Duc de Nevers. There, on Tuesday and Wednesday in each week from 1710 to 1733, a chosen circle of aristocratic and literary guests met together. Members of the Academy were welcomed, and they readily listened to Madame de Lambert's suggestions. People were scarcely admitted under the cupola unless they had been presented at her house and by her. Thus said Argenson, and he knew better than anyone. He frequented her salon most assiduously and has left some lines on the death of the Marquise, giving his impressions in the form of a funeral oration. I have just sustained a great loss in the death of Madame la Marquise de Lambert at the age of eighty-six. It was an honor to be admitted to her house. I went there to dinner regularly on Wednesdays, which was one of her days. In the evening she held her reception where the guests conversed, and there was no more question of cards than at the famous Hôtel de Rambouillet, so much praised by Voiture and Balzac. She was rich and made good use of her wealth by generosity to her friends and particularly to the unfortunate. This compensates for Marais' mockery and Lesage's banter of the Marquise de Chave in a chapter of Gilles Blas. Under the Regency, Madame de Lambert maintained the traditions of politeness and good taste. These were not always predominant in Madame de Toncin's salon, for there intrigue prevailed and the hum of conversation became an uproar. She was, says Marmontel, a woman of profound sense, but her good-natured and simple exterior made her look more like the housekeeper than the mistress of the house. Marivaux owed much to this lady. In his Vie de Marianne, he sketched some of the features of his benefactress's society. Marivaux, said Marmontel, often embarrassed his hearers by sophisms which were sufficiently subtle to appear simple, and Madame de Toncin was always embarrassing Marivaux by observations which hid wisdom under extreme simplicity. One day some ludicrous verses by Collet were read in Fontenelle's presence. Fontenelle did not quite understand, and asked that the couplet should be read again. "'Why, you great imbecile!' cried Madame de Toncin. Do you not see that it is only nonsense? It so resembles, replied Fontenelle, all the verses I hear read and sung here. It is not astonishing that I made a mistake. Madame de Toncin died in 1749. She knew Madame Geoffrin and left her this advice. Do not discourage people. Even though nine people out of ten will not take an atom of trouble for you, the tenth may become a useful friend. Suar says that she knew how to use a fool as well as a wise man. She foresaw that Madame Geoffrin would one day take her place, 
and she said to her friends in her middle-class way, Do you know what the Geoffrin comes here for? She comes to see what she can pick up out of my inventory. Madame Geoffrin's salon was the most characteristic of the 18th century. The mingling of the classes began there more than anywhere else. Her house, said the Mémoire Secret, is the rendezvous of savants, artists, and famous men of all sorts. Foreigners especially considered they had seen nothing in France if they had not been presented to this celebrity. At Madame Geoffrin's everything was done with as much regularity as in a public office. There were two dinners a week, the one on Monday for artists, such as Van Loo, Vernet, Boucher, Vien, Soufflot, and Le Moine, and the other on Wednesday for men of letters like D'Alembert, Marivaux, Marmontel, Morellet, Saint-Lambert, and Dolbach. Madame Geoffrin kept the conversation well under her control. If it strayed on to vexed questions such as religious belief, although she approved of the encyclopedists, Madame Geoffrin stopped the discussion with, that is all right, and it was useless to say more as this was known to be her last word, and they were obliged to go and make their Sabbath elsewhere. She herself talked little, though when she did she spoke sensibly, and either introduced a maxim or some well-told anecdote. She once said to the Chevalier de Coigny, who was telling an interminable story, Would you be so good as to carve this capon? And as the young man took a very little knife out of his pocket, she added, To succeed in this country one must have large knives and little stories. Her wit was particularly used against boars whom she could not endure, and importunate visitors who stayed too long. One day, when she saw the good Abbe de Saint-Pierre settle himself down in her drawing-room for a long winter's evening, she was for the moment appalled, and then she rose to the occasion and drew him out to such an extent that she made him amusing. He was astonished, and when she complimented him on his conversation, he answered as he took leave, Madame, I am only an instrument on which you have played well. Chatterers made her turn pale and feel like death, and yet she managed to put up with them if, as she said, they were simply chatterers, and only wished to speak without expecting any answer. My friend Fontenelle, who pardoned them as I did, said that they gave his lungs a rest. They confer another benefit on me. Their insignificant buzzing is to me like the noise of bells, which does not prevent one from thinking and often stimulates thought. She was good and charitable, but a little crabbed. There was a certain egotism about her generosity, as the following reflection of hers shows. Those who rarely do things for others have no need of maxims, but those who are continually doing things for others should do them in the way which is most agreeable to themselves, because one must do comfortably anything that has to be done every day. Her motto should, however, be remembered. It was give and lose. There were other well-known hostesses, such as the Marquise du Deffon, Julie de l'Espinasse, the Maréchale de Luxembourg, Madame d'Epinay, Madame Necker, Madame Helvetius, and many other celebrated women. But the most interesting galleries are those in which the pictures are not too crowded. Madame de Lambert and Madame Geoffrin, one about 1730 and the other about 1760, are the best representatives of the wit of their times, and with them we may fitly conclude a study of the 18th century. End of section 36, read by Pamela Nagami, M.D., in Encino, California, June 2022. End of the 18th century, National History of France, by Kashimir Striensky, translated by Henry Neville Dickinson.